Den of Wolves, The Shift of Prophecy, Book Two. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by Candace Joyce. Chapter One. Many people think death is when your heart stops beating. They're wrong. Death isn't the shiver of cold skin, the closing of eyes, or the stillness of breath. It's mindlessly existing among the living. The full moon casts my shadow against the hollowed stone, while the straps of my pack cut deeply into my shoulders as I climb. I hiss, trying to shift the weight, while simultaneously attempting to pull myself up a mountaintop crevice, I was hoping to get to higher ground so I could scope out the area, but that's proven to be a foolish idea. The sloping cliff is too difficult even for a skilled survivalist like me to climb. My hand grabs a rock, but the granite gives loose. I slip, my hips slamming against the side of the mountain. Something cracks in my pocket with the impact. I give a yell of pain. I haul myself up the cliffside with one hand out of sheer willpower, rolling onto the ledge and giving a ragged gasp. I stagger to my feet, wavering a little. My head spins for a minute or two. I slip the bag off my shoulders and lean against the mountain to gather my bearings. Slowly, I recover. My eyes turn towards the endless span of the emerald forest around me. I straighten up and look around, realizing I have no idea where I am. Great job, Lysandra, I think. You've gotten yourself lost. I pull out my compass to figure out my location, but my stomach plummets as I witness the cracked glass. So that's what broke. Clutching it in my hand, I look from left to right, trying to scout the area. There's nothing out here but trees and rocks. All I've seen for weeks. A scream of frustration wells up inside of me. I let it loose, bunching up my fist and crying out as loudly as I can. A flock of birds is scared out of the brush as I yell, and I throw the compass as far as I can into the woods, completely frustrated. When that doesn't help, I kick the mountain and only end up with a stubbed toe for it. I sink to the ground, fiddling with my hands. If Lysar were here, he'd probably make some stupid joke about how Romania isn't that big, and I'll hit the edge of it eventually. When I think of Lysar, my eyes well with tears, but I angrily wipe them away. What good will crying do? I've cried nearly every night since I started this journey, and it hasn't helped. Nothing left to do but to get back up and keep moving on. I swing my bag back onto my aching shoulders and try to think of the positives. On the bright side, I guess living in the wilderness by myself is loads better than being at the castle with Tsar Dragomir breathing down my neck. I grit my fangs, which have become exposed during my rage. I haven't trekked around in these woods for weeks, surviving off the blood of squirrels and small animals to give up now. Damn it, Lysa, I know you're out here, I think venomously. Where are you hiding? I've been following wolf prints for the past few weeks, relying on my nose to track the beasts when I can't find any visual signals there around. I must be getting closer to finding their den, because I'm always finding more clues. But for the past three days, I've been hitting dead ends. I have nowhere else to go. Trying to think, I scale around the side of the mountain and jump down, wincing as the pack tugs on me. I begin the hike down a narrow path, one which is covered in wolf prints. I have to give it to these wolves— when they hid the den, they hid it well. They didn't want anyone to find it. Not even a friend. As I hike, a forest mouse scuttles by my foot. I attempt to lunge for it and miss. Would you look at that? Outsmarted by a rodent. I should have been able to snap it up without thinking twice. My stomach rumbles. 
I haven't had time to hunt properly, as all my time is spent keeping up with the wolves, and they move fast. It doesn't help that they're able to travel during daytime, and I can't. I'm always having to make up time. Unless something runs across my path, I don't eat. I look up at the sky. Dawn isn't far off, and I'm trying to save the sun lotion I have that protects my skin for emergencies. I'm going to have to take shelter soon. There's a cave nearby, but I don't want to keep using it and leaving my scent there. No need to reveal myself to the wolves until I find them first. I stop my hike for a moment when I notice a cleared-out area tucked within a thorny patch. When I stoop to investigate, I find large man-like footprints clustered around a small pile of ashes and a flattened bed of leaves. The tangy smell of blood lingers in the area, though there's none nearby. Someone's made camp recently, and it isn't a wolf. Well, whoever it was, they're not coming back. Exhaustion plagues me. Despite my determination to find Lysar, my eyes are drooping. I need to stop to rest, just for a little bit. I throw my pack down and sit upon it, bending my head between my knees to stop the vertigo. A lone wind whistles by, and I moan. Vampires are naturally cold, and we can survive arctic temperatures in little more than a t-shirt and jeans. But it's the blood that keeps us warm. If we don't feed and the temperature drops low enough, we'll freeze. I haven't eaten enough to sustain my natural temperature. I have to build a fire. I have it roaring in minutes, but as I'm warming my hands, I start to get anxious. A fire attracts attention. I might as well have a neon sign pointing to my location, but I have to get warm. It'll be easier to handle once the sun comes up and starts to warm the earth, even though I'll have to be in the shade. I stare into the glow of the fire listlessly, wondering if there's even a point to my journey, or if I'm traveling around aimlessly. This is the hardest part, when I have nothing left to do but muse on what happened. I am painstakingly lonely, not because I've been on my own for the better part of a month, but because Lysar isn't here. It's incredible to admit that I missed Lysar before I even knew him. There was always a vacancy in my heart in the shape of Lysar's soul. I was only waiting for him to come and satisfy it. Since he left, I've become painfully aware of the hole that I never knew was there before, and it hurts. It's agonizing to exist without him, Possible to go on, true, but not a life I want to lead. What am I going to do if I can't find him? Or worse, if I do find him and something terrible has happened? I push that thought out of my head, because it's too painful to think about. For the first time, I feel upset at Lysar. He never told me the location of the den, didn't even give me a hint as to where it was. He really couldn't, in the situation we were in. But didn't he ever think to leave me directions, just in case something like this happened? Of course he didn't. Lysar always thought we'd be together forever. A lone howl pierces through the woods. I listen, hopeful, but it dies off quickly. I wonder if it's really there, or if I'm hearing things. I stare back into the fire, eyes flickering back to the humanoid footprints on the ground. The only one I miss besides Lysar is Siege, but after Castel de Singe broke into chaos the night I left, I doubt he survived. If Dragomir had fallen, there wouldn't be vampires trailing me, and the signs are all there that I'm being followed. This isn't the first camp I've found. A smirk crosses my lips. I'm hunting wolves, 
and someone's hunting me. Delightful. The best thing I can hope for is that my grandfather's in hiding. But I don't know anywhere in the world he could go that's outside my father's grasp. An unfamiliar noise draws my attention elsewhere. I hear a crack in the bush and cease all movement. Perhaps it was another animal. I try to remain completely still. Despite my statuesque form, I still hear the bushes rustle unnaturally. There's someone out there. Quickly, I extinguish the fire and grab my bag. Time to go. I start off slow in order to creep away, but when the rustling gets louder, I pick up the pace. I manoeuvre as quietly as possible through the trees, but when the noises get closer instead of farther away, my veins fill with ice. A familiar smell hits the air, and I panic. I increase my strides, but the footsteps only step up behind me, along with the sound of ragged breathing. I have to outwit them. I dodge through a particularly hairy patch of woods and cross a river, but it's still no good. I can't lose them. Feeling out of control of my actions, I start to jog, wincing as the stuff in my bag shakes. My backpack makes too much noise in the brush and slows me down. I can't move effectively in this. If I want to escape, I have to abandon what little supplies I have left. I make a decision and dump the bag, leaving it behind without looking back. The smell is so overpowering, it burns my nose. No use being stealthy now. I have to run. I abandon caution and break into a sprint. The footsteps follow me, becoming faster and faster. They're getting closer. It feels like a noose is being drawn around my neck as the enemy draws near. I forget to watch where I'm going and slam into a tree. Temporarily dazed, I keep running in no particular direction. Unable to fathom where I am, a root catches my foot and I go flying head first down a hill. The hill is nearly vertical. My body slides against jagged stones on the way down, tearing my clothes and drawing fresh wounds. I bump my head on quite a few rocks, fingers clawing to get a hold but never able to grasp onto anything to make it stop. I think I'm going to fling off the side of a mountain the moment I come to a stop. Dizzily, I look up, spitting clay out of my mouth, strands of greasy hair falling in front of my face. Embedded within my scuffed hands are small rocks, piercing like tiny shards of glass. From within the fog of the mountain, a nightmare emerges. At first, I only think there's one— but then my throat tightens as more draw out from the fog, slinking within the shadows. They bare their fangs, snapping their jowls near my face and lashing out clawed paws. As a black male mottled with grey emerges from behind a tree, the rest back off, circling me as if waiting for the right moment to deliver the final blow to their prey. I'm surrounded by seven wolves, and none of them look willing to hear my story before they tear me apart. Chapter Two I can't fight them. Maybe I could if I was at my full strength, but not now. I grapple for my knife, only to realize that I left it back in my pack. I grab my pistol, which I keep holstered to me at all times, and hold it out in front of me. The mottled grey wolf laughs, and the others join in. You really think that'll make a difference, sweetheart? You'll shoot one of us, but by the time you pull the trigger, the rest will already be on top of you. I know he's right. Gotta talk my way out of this. I'm not here to hurt you, I offer slowly. I'm looking for Lysar Lupuscu, Prince Lysar, a she-wolf rasps, a threat in her voice. What do you want with him? Looking to skin him alive? Wear his pelt as a coat around your pompous shoulders? 
he's still alive. A bout of daring hope rises in my chest. No. I slowly crouch down and, placing the pistol on the ground, rise back upward with my hands up. I just want to see him. Please take me to him, and he'll explain everything. You're not going anywhere but in the ground, bloodsucker, the she-wolf snarls. Guys, maybe we should hold off on this one. A small wolf, quite young, speaks up. What if she's telling the truth? Lysar will be furious if we kill her now. Most likely, she just wants to get close to him, the she-wolf adds. But what if she's really on our side? The small one insists. Enough talking. The only good vampire is a dead vampire, the gray says. He crouches downward, springing through the air with his jaws outstretched to take me down. I throw up an arm to defend myself, ready for it to be over. Another blur tackles the mottled gray out of thin air, smashing him onto the ground. I fall backwards as two wolves battle in front of me, tumbling over each other and snarling. The gray is trapped underneath a larger wolf, his coat a mix of brown and red tones. He looks vaguely familiar. Stand down, the red wolf growls. He pushes his paw against the gray's neck and the wolf sputters. This isn't your fight. Stay out of this, the gray chokes. I'll let you up if you promise not to attack. The red wolf's eyes narrow. The gray's body goes slack, and the red backs off, letting the gray get to his feet. That goes for all of you, the red wolf yells. Make a move on the vampire and you'll deal with me after Lysar tears your ass apart. The group mutters. Since when are you so concerned with the life of a leech? The gray asks spitefully. The red wolf changes into a man. He's dressed lightly for the cold, only in jeans and a long-sleeved shirt. But I notice dark brands peeking out from the edges of his collar, on his neck and hands. At the sight of the brands along his skin, I remember who he is. It's Kipcha, the wolf I saved from my father's dungeons, and Lysar's best friend. I owe her a debt, he says. This is Grand Duchess Lysandra Romanova Dracula. When Tsar Dragomir took me as a prisoner, she helped me escape. This is the vampire that set you free? The she-wolf cackles. A scrawny thing like her? She's lost weight since last we met. Kipcha takes my side. And Lysar won't be happy if we get rid of her now, I promise you that. Ah, oh, yes, Lysar's little side dish, the gray grumbles. I still say we kill her now and rid him of the trouble. He's been moping around the compound for too long. My heart stutters. Lysar misses me. This vampire saved Lysar's life and mine. It'd be a pretty crappy way to return the favor by ending her own. The gray wolf grunts, and the she-wolf at her side nudges him. So what do we do? The little wolf asks. We don't do anything. Kipcha shakes his head. This is something for the Alpha to decide. We can't take her into the den, the she-wolf protests. She'll know our location. Kipcha pauses. We can if she's blindfolded. Is that a fair compromise? The wolves mutter indecisively. Kipcha makes the decision for them, pulling out a thick strip of fabric from his belt. Sorry about this, he murmurs, lifting the blindfold over my head. But you're gonna have to trust me. I still owe you one. Get me out of this and consider yourself free and clear, I whisper back. The black velvet envelops my eyes, and I feel Kipcha's large hand wrap completely around my arm. Let's go, Kipcha says, before anyone else notices we're out here. Kipcha starts marching me through the brush. It's really difficult hiking through rough terrain without being able to see, and I nearly trip several times, but Kipcha always catches me. The other wolves growl when he does this. 
I shiver as I feel their fur brushing against my legs and hands, closing in. After a while, we stop. I listen closely and can hear the trickle of a waterfall, along with the rushing of a fast river. The rough terrain becomes curiously flat, soft grass underfoot instead of rocky granite. The minute my foot touches the grass, I'm immediately hit with a gust of wolf smell. If I had to guess, there are hundreds of them inside the immediate vicinity. Whispers and cries of shock mingle through my ears, coupled with more than a few threatening growls. I really hope the Alpha likes me, because it's obvious all the members of his pack are more than willing to turn me into dog food. For the first time, I'm glad I'm blindfolded. If I wasn't, I'm pretty sure I'd be freaking out, and panicking is the last thing I need to do in this situation. After a minute of hiking, the grass stops, to be replaced with some sort of floor underfoot. There's the opening of a door, and I'm dragged inside, where I find the blindfold lifts. Sorry we have to do this, Kipcha says, tucking the blindfold away. Protocol, you know. I look around. I'm in a small room, with nothing more than a few armchairs and a bookcase. The room is empty besides this. The walls are made of cobbled stone. I get it. But what happens now? I ask. We have to wait for the Alpha to arrive, Kipcha says. He'll decide your fate. I'm barely distracted by the prospect of execution. Somewhere, Lysa is nearby. He could be on the other side of this wall. Thinking about it makes me want to tear the concrete down to get to him. But I stay steady. It's going to be a while, Kipcha says when he opens the door. As he steps out, he peeks his head in and says, You'll be locked inside for your own protection as much as ours. But someone's been sent to guard you before you meet the Alpha. The door creaks open a little farther, and the figure steps into the room before it locks shut. My heart brightens in relief at the sight of a very familiar face. Chapter 3 Bryn! Her name escapes my mouth as she enters. Her long brown hair is tied back in a ponytail, which trails onto a long velvet dress. Now that she's out of her combat gear and all the mud has been cleaned off of her, she's even prettier than I realized. Liz! The girl runs towards me, encasing me in a wolfish, bone-crushing hug. Careful! I wince as she squeezes even tighter than I thought possible. You'll get dirt on your dress. I'm disgusting. I don't give a damn about the dress. She pulls away, holding my arms. How did you find us? The pack found me, I say. I was wandering around looking for you. You still got really close. She puts her hands on her hips, looking me up and down. Lissy, we all thought you were dead. Well, surprise, I'm not, I laugh. You've got to understand, there was no trace of you after the siege. Not for weeks. Lysar was devastated. She smiles. I can't wait to see his face when he finds out you're still alive. I hesitate to ask a burning question, circling the room before I sit on the couch. It's been so long since I've used furniture, my body practically melts. I want to sink into the cushions and sleep, but I force myself to straighten up instead. Bryn, what happened back at Castel de Singe? I fold my hands in my lap. Please tell me. Her grin falls. She crosses the room to take a seat beside me. The plan went wrong. We were supposed to get you out, then take the two of you with us, Bryn explains. But our orders changed last minute. My father stated that only Lysar was to be rescued, with you left behind. So he already hates me. This doesn't bode well for my current situation. 
Did Lysar know about the plan? No, he didn't. We were supposed to get him out that morning, but the situation with Ivan Grigore messed everything up. Bryn shakes her head. I was going in to get you anyway, but by that time, Lysar had already been rescued and the castle was in chaos. I couldn't find you, so I left. I'm sorry, Bryn. I know you tried. I sigh. I left during the siege to come look for Lysar, but I only ended up going in circles. It doesn't matter now. Bryn stands up. The most important thing is that you're here. I suppose. I fiddle with my fingers. He's somewhere around here. I looked for my brother when I got the news you arrived, but I couldn't find him anywhere. She peers into the fireplace. He tends to do that when you're around. Just disappear. Yeah, well, it's like guys to sleep with you and run, right? I laugh, trying to make a lame joke to lighten the situation. Or at least force a laugh out of me. I need some humor right now. Bryn's eyes widen to the point where they're nearly popping out of her head. What? Her voice is awfully flat. I crack a tiny smile. It's a joke, Bryn. I know it was dumb, but come on, I need some cheering up here. No, like, are you serious? She puts her hands on my shoulders, deadly grave. Did you and Lysar have sex? My eyes dart to the side. Uh, this is awkward, but if you really want to know, yes, I say. We were together the night before we got separated, so what? So what? Bryn jumps to her feet and enters into total meltdown mode. Oh my god, no, Lysar, I can't believe you did this. You know the law. Why in the world did you- Bryn, what exactly are you muttering to yourself about? I ask. You and Lysar were together, together. That's the issue, Bryn quips sourly. Okay, why is it such a big deal? I ask, perplexed. You don't get it. This makes things way more complicated than they already are. Bryn starts pacing around the room. Look, I know you and Lysar had a fight about the whole bonding thing, but we can't help that. It just happens, I say. Speaking of the strange, unexplainable, magical connection Lysar and I forged the moment our eyes first connected. He said it himself. When wolves bond with someone, they have no choice over who it is. This isn't a bonding matter. It's something else entirely. The bond was bad enough, but this... Oh, this is much different. Bryn's hands slap the sides of her cheeks and drag downward. Would you like me to push the couch next to you? I gesture to it sarcastically. In case you faint? Liz, this is serious, Bryn screeches. By technicality, when Lysar slept with you, he made you his mate, his true mate. It's equal to a wedding as far as shifter law goes. In the eyes of the pack, you're as good as married now. My stomach and mouth both fall at once. What? You've got to be kidding me. We didn't say any vows. Didn't have any type of contract or ceremony. Do you think that matters? Wolves mate for life, Bryn tears at her hair. None of us wolves ever sleep with anyone until we're ready to make a lifelong commitment. To do otherwise goes against our culture and years of tradition. Not to mention it's breaking the law to sleep with someone outside of the pack. I'm guessing there are other consequences. Yes, Lysar's the son of the Alpha, which means he's set to take over after Dad dies. If you're married to him, that would make you the Alpha female, and... Oh! Bryn's face goes completely pale. Her words have a shocking effect. Me? The next Alpha female? It's comical. A vampire lording over a bunch of wolves. I can't help but snicker. Why are you smiling? Have you gone crazy? Bryn hisses. I don't know if Dad has to spare your life or if he can execute you on grounds of sodomy or something. I don't think you're using sodomy right, I point out. By all counts, you're his daughter-in-law. Dad just doesn't know it yet. 
Bryn mumbles, ignoring me. Oh, Liz, why did you do that? She whirls on me. We don't have these kinds of laws in my world, I shout. Vampires can be with whomever they like, and there's no weird secret marriage contracts nobody tells you about. We don't care how you do things in vampire world. This is wolf world, and you just crossed a big line, a huge line, one of the most important laws we have. Bryn's rubbing her face like a dog trying to get something off its muzzle. I don't know why you're yelling at me. If anybody should be getting a lecture, it should be Lysar. I cross my arms. He knew about the laws after all. I didn't. I pause. Does that mean Lysar was a virgin? Oh, yes, Liz. Like that matters. She rolls her eyes. Okay, well, I was a virgin too, I add in a wimpy attempt to defend myself. Bryn harumphs, and I turn away. I was too absorbed in my let's kill wolves for a living training that I didn't really have time to date, or even mess around with the guys at the training compounds. Not to mention I was engaged to Tomlin since birth. Me sleeping around any time in the past few years wasn't exactly an option. But to think that Lysar, as dreamy and handsome as he is, never had any intimate encounters, is mind-blowing. As son of the Alpha, he had to have girls climbing all over him. Are we married now? I took our first time very seriously, but maybe for Lysar, the implications of it were more major than I previously believed. Does Lysar consider me his true mate now? Someone equal to his wife? Or, since I'm not a wolf, was I just someone to fool around with? An outlier in which the specifics don't count? Either way, why didn't he tell me about all this? Was he lost in the heat of the moment? Or was he purposely hiding the truth? Even without all the shady shifter laws, this does complicate things. Whatever the case, Lysar saved his first time to be with me. That's a thought that makes my whole body tingle. Liz, wake up! Bryn snaps her fingers and I jolt. Quit thinking about getting freaky with my brother and focus. I shake my head. Yeah, right then. I bite my lip, worryingly. Oh, this is a messy situation. You think? She takes a deep breath. Okay, calm down. Calm down. She pinches her nose. We just won't tell him. She slaps her hands in triumph. We'll get you in the free and clear, then Dad can find out the bad news later, if ever. Right. I start gnawing at my fingernail. Bryn, how do I convince your father to let me live? What's he like? Bryn's face darkens into a concerned gaze. Nikolai A. Lupuscu can't be convinced of anything. My father puts the good of the pack over everyone and everything. The only hope you have is if he deems it beneficial to keep you here somehow. What could he gain by sparing my life? I muse aloud. Is there something I could offer he doesn't have? I don't know, Liz. Bryn frowns. But I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you stay alive. The door creaks open once more, and Kipcha peers in. It's time, he says. The Alpha has summoned you. I stiffen. Bryn draws near to me. Don't worry. I'll be by your side the whole way. Kipcha leads. I exit the small room and force myself not to gasp aloud at the sight before me. The inside of the Alpha's mansion is a grand cabin, built entirely out of wood and furnished with elaborate wooden carvings and luxurious furniture. The ceilings are high, the roof made out of a thick glass so you can see the fir branches overlapping above, crystal chandeliers dangling above bearskin rugs. Castel de Singe was grand, but somehow Nicolae's mansion seems cozier, more intimate somehow. It seems like the home of a close-knit family, rather than a hall of monarchs and those indebted to them. There are wolves here, 
but instead of booing and hissing as they did when I came in, they simply look on with a reserved, quiet judgment. A hearth fire, larger than the one in the judgment room in Castel de Singe, burns brightly next to granite stones that form a lopsided staircase. At the head of the room are two large thrones, with backs that rise high into the air. The man sitting upon the tallest throne wears a black fur coat and carries a gnarled wooden staff. He's got pale blue eyes. A cragged tooth sticks out of one lip, hiding behind a massive beard that hangs past his middle. He's big and burly, such a large werewolf I've never seen. The shifter's got muscles upon muscles. When he moves, the whole pack watches him, their eyes never leaving their leader. Opposite him sits a kindly woman, with grey hair and soft wrinkles around her eyes. Her face betrays kindness, though I can sense the she-wolf within. She must be Lysar's mother and Nikolai's mate. When she notices me, her lips form a welcoming smile. I suppress a twinge of shock. Their reactions couldn't have been more different. Bryn tilts her head downward as we approach the thrones. Father, I have brought you Grand Duchess Lysandra Romanova Dracula, daughter of Tsar Dragomir, princess of vampires, and heiress to the throne. She is here to... I know the story, and know why she is here. Nikolai waves his hand, and Bryn falls silent. Step closer, vampire, so I may take a good look at you. Even his voice growls. My knees are shaking as I take the granite steps upward. Nikolai shoves his large face in mine and sniffs. His nose twisting into a snarl, he asks the room at large, How'd you come upon this one? Nikita and a few others found her in the woods. She came voluntarily. Kipcha subs in. She's the one who set you free from Dragomir's dungeons, correct? Nikolai asks. Yes, and the one who saved Lysar and nursed him back to health. Kipcha tucks his hands behind his back. Hmm. <laughs> Nikolai tilts his head. And why would a vampire take it upon herself to care for a wolf? Nikolai looks at me. When I don't answer, he pounds his staff on the floor. Come now, speak. I jump when he commands me to open my mouth. Yes, well, uh... The eyes of the pack are upon me, and they look hungry. I'd better get talking. Lysar was in very poor shape when I found him, I explain. I took him back to my room and nursed him there, until he was able to escape on his own. It wasn't easy. His cut became infected, and the magical treatment he needed to heal was risky to obtain. But I did what I had to, to keep him alive. Is this true? Nikolai asks his daughter. You were on the front lines. Prove witness. Yes, father, I was there, and I witnessed the whole thing. Lysandra is telling the truth. Lysar wouldn't be here today if she hadn't intervened to save his life several times. Do you believe the pack is in her debt for saving the son of the Alpha? He asks. Bryn dances on her feet and her eyes shift. It would seem so. Then you would be wrong. Nikolai pounds his staff on the floor hard and it sends many wolves scattering. He points it at me. Lysar wouldn't have returned if we hadn't forced him to come back. Nikolai grits his teeth, and somehow Bryn manages to be brave enough to intercede. It was Lysar's decision to stay, father. The vampire did not force him to, nor did she convince her head witch to cast a compelling spell. It was of his own free will he stayed. Yes, him and his silly dreams. Nikolai snorts and rolls his eyes. He's made me well aware of his ridiculous intentions to make a treaty. So Nikolai isn't convinced that the war between the vampires and the werewolves can come to an end without bloodshed. He's not the only one. 
I, too, had tried to convince my father, my friends, and my people that there could be a peace, only for my entire monarchy to collapse because of it. Perhaps Nikolai is afraid of a similar situation here at the den. Lysar refused to leave his room for weeks after you were parted. Tell me, girl. Nikolai sits back in his seat and sniffs, even more loudly than before. Why did you spare my son's life? I fell in love with him, I respond honestly. It's the best answer I can give. Whispers rattle the room. Nikolai remains motionless, while his mate's smile grows. Quiet, Nikolai barks, and the whispers cease. Nikolai leans forward and growls again. Did you mean what you said? I'm shaking. Stay still. Yes, every bit of it. And Lysar, did he claim to have the same feelings you hold for him? Nikolai asks. I open my mouth to say something, and my words wheeze away. Nikolai raises an eyebrow, and I stutter. I believe so. At least that is what he told me. The room breaks out into chaos. Nikolai rises to his feet, throws back his shoulders, and cries, Silence! The woman is perched on the edge of her throne. As Nikolai's eyes burn red, I see the clear distinctions between him and my father. He's not like Dragomir. Nikolai actually cares about what happens to his people. But I trust Bryn when she says he's willing to sacrifice whatever it takes in order to keep the pack safe. And right now, I'm enemy number one. The youth of today is wicked, filthy, foolish, and selfish. They seek their own desires over the good of all, Nikolai preaches. Such dangerous thought cannot be held in among us. What do we say? A wolf is nothing without the pack. The pack is nothing without the wolf. United, we sacrifice so we may live. Divided, we wander until we die. Each member of the pack, even Bryn, recites the mantra perfectly. I turn in place as they speak it, amazed by the solidarity of the group. Vampire or not, we will not let such sin twist among our ranks and divide the pack, Nikolai cries. Instant execution, to be carried out immediately. At his words, the shifters begin to transform. They surround me, crouching down and snarling, preparing to attack. They're going to tear me limb from limb. Bryn stands by helplessly held back by Kipcha. I'm sorry, he mouths, but I shake my head to tell him it's all right. I consider it a blessing that I'll die the same way as my mother did, mauled by wolves. At least I went out fighting and didn't starve to death in the wilderness. I accomplished my mission. I found the den of wolves. I just wish I could have seen Lysar one last time. There's a loud, crashing sound, like wooden beams being broken in two. The pack halts in place, and a crystal chandelier swings wildly, spewing glass onto the floor. It was knocked aside by one of the doors being slammed into the stone wall. Through the room, a clear, strong voice rings out. You'll leave her alone, or I'll tear all of you apart. Chapter 4 After not seeing him for such a long time, my soul collapses when Lysar walks into the room. His expression is furious, hands gnarled into fists as he kicks the broken door out of his way. Jeans sag loosely on his exposed hip bones, the only clothes he currently wears. A medallion in the shape of a wolf's head lies on his bare, muscular chest tied around his neck with a thin leather strand. My heart hitches when our gazes connect. 
His blue eyes shine deliberately, as if they've been dark for days, and only now someone has arrived to turn on the light. For a moment, Lysar appears the same way I do, lost, longing, afraid. Then a fire starts up in them, and he glares at his father. Lysar strides to the center of the room, shoving wolves aside and grabbing my wrist, dragging me protectively behind him. At his touch, a warmth spreads throughout my body, and my first thought is, I'm home. Son, what is the meaning of this? You dare to challenge the authority of the Alpha? Nikolai roars. I'm not challenging you, only upholding our own laws. Lysar growls back. His shoulders ripple, and for a moment I think he's going to change. The penalty for attacking the mate of an Alpha is death. I have the right to declare treason on all of you. Questions rumble throughout the pack. Kipcha steps forward and says, That isn't true. Lysandra isn't your mate. Yes, she is. Lysar takes a steadying breath. Lysandra and I have made a sacred bond. We have consummated our union and are mated for life. There it is. Bryn covers her face with her hands, and I try to remain expressionless as the pack loses their minds. Shouts and accusations come flying at us from all directions. I'm terrified we're on the edge of starting a riot. You mean to tell me you've been fornicating with that... that... thing? Nikolai roars. That would mean the next alpha female would be a stinking vampire, a she-wolf cries. This is an abomination, a disgrace. Kill her now, kill her now. Lysar presses closer to me. I lean against him, looping my arms around his waist as the pack closes in. Nikolai erupts off his throne and says, Such a perversion of our laws has never happened in the history of this pack. Son, I am ashamed. Be ashamed, then. Lysar's whole body is burning. I'm not changing my mind. This is preposterous, Nikolai babbles. The vampire must be eliminated at once. If she goes, I go, Lysar states. You want to get rid of her, you're going to have to kill me, and the pack will be left without an alpha to lead after you have joined the ranks of our ancestors. Lysar raises his chin. The shouting gets louder. Nikolai grits his teeth, moving towards his son. Bryn dances between us, unsure of who to side with, while I get ready to fight. The woman slowly rises from her throne. As she puts a hand on Nikolai's arm, the voices die down, and the room is replaced with anticipatory silence. Nikolai halts. She steps down to our level, stopping before Lysar and looking him in the eye. Son, is this true? She asks. Do you truly love this girl? Do you share a bond? Lysar nods. Yes, mother, absolutely. My stomach does backflips. The woman smiles. She starts circling the room forming a protective barrier between us and the pack. Very well. Your intentions are true. She folds her hands. The war has continued on for centuries, and nothing has changed. Maybe it's time to try a new way. Sylvia, we cannot let the vampire go, nor can we trust her. Nikolai groans. Then let there be a compromise, Sylvia says. One day, Lysar will lead the pack. He is obviously set on abandoning the family if we do not accept his decision to be with the vampire princess. So you wish to spoil him? Give him what he wants? Nikolai snarls. No. Sylvia shakes her head. Isn't it better if he experiments with his ideals now rather than later, when the existence of the entire pack is on his shoulders? He will take this path someday, Alpha. 
it is up to you whether he walks it today and tests his values under your watchful eye, or if he does it tomorrow and his possible mistake leads to the end of us all. Nikolai's shoulders roll. Yes, I suppose you are right. He strokes his beard. Very well. Lysar will have the opportunity to put his beliefs into practice. Let the vampire live among us. If she is who she claims to be, and proves herself part of the pack, perhaps there is a chance vampires and shifters can exist peacefully. My heart jumps while the rest of the pack blurts out cries of protest. Lysar sighs in relief, and Sylvia's eyes twinkle. No more questions. The Alpha has spoken, Nikolai cries. You. Nikolai points his staff at me once again. Do not disappoint me, he growls. My mate has managed to convince me to give you a chance, but it is not enough to intermingle among our ranks. You must become one of us in order to survive. If not, be sure that death will come when you least expect it. Nikolai glances at Kipcha. Escort the vampire to the prince's room, he barks. She is to stay there until things settle. Yes, Alpha. Kipcha nods, then gestures to the both of us. He mumbles something under his breath and starts prodding the both of us. Lysar loops his hand through mine, and we walk through the crowd, all eyes upon us. We maneuver up a long staircase and through a few twisted hallways before Kipcha stops before a large doorway. I'll give you guys some time alone, he says. Guards will be stationed at the door to make sure no one bothers you. Thanks, Kip. Lysar grabs his arm firmly. Are you sure they won't try to kill me? I stutter. The Alpha has spoken, Kipcha says, as if the thought of going against Nikolai's order is an impossibility. No one will harm you unless he says so, and he has given his word to protect you for the time being. Come on, Lucy. Lysar puts his arm around my shoulders. No one will dare hurt you with me here. He guides me inside, and Kipcha shuts the door behind us. Lysar's room in the mansion is even bigger than mine was at the castle. A large fire, they seem to be a trademark of every room in the mansion, roars beside a sliding glass window, which is slightly open and leads to a marble balcony. A four-poster bed sits upon a floor of fur rugs, a wooden armoire standing next to a whirlpool that's off an elaborate bathroom. A widescreen TV hangs on the wall across from the bed, the coffee table below it stacked with five seasons worth of Lysar's favorite show and the newest video game console. I smile. How do you get power out here? I ask. We have our own generators, Lysar explains. The community is pretty self-sufficient. I nod in approval. The only thing off about the room is a discarded backpack lying in the corner of the room. My pack, I say. I left it behind in the forest. Nikita was carrying it around. I made sure he brought it here, Lysa says. When I caught your scent, I went crazy. I thought you'd died when the wolves attacked Castel de Senje. His voice becomes gruff. Bryn told me. I swallow. I spent weeks hiking through the woods trying to find you. And somehow you did. His hand moves to my cheekbone to part the section of hair clumped to my skin. You're a special girl. No other vampire has even come close to finding the den. I do all sorts of impossible things to get back to you. I promise. That's when it happens. Lysar dives forward to kiss me, and I meet the gesture eagerly, moving my lips frantically over his and opening my mouth to let him in. He wraps his arm around my hips and pulls me tightly against him, stroking my cheekbone with his thumb. My arms embrace him tenderly as we kiss, matching his breaths, wondering if this is all a dream. 
I haven't touched Lysar in so long. In the moment, it doesn't seem real, and I bring him closer so he won't slip away again. But when Lysar moves my shirt back to kiss my shoulder, he gasps. Lissy, what is this? He asks, running his fingers over the thick red bands that span around to my back. It was my bag. I've had blisters for a while, I say. Now that the immediate threat of danger is gone, the adrenaline runs out. I sway back and forth, dead on my feet. I'm incredibly weak. You okay? Lysar asks, raising an eyebrow. Yeah. I swallow and grab his arm for balance. Just help me out of these filthy clothes, all right? I feel gross. Be glad to. He grins mischievously. Usually I'd bite back some snarky comment, but I don't reply. He notices this, and that's when his smile drops. Lissy, you sure you're fine? I don't answer. Lysar starts peeling off my clothes for me. The fabric, coated in a month's worth of mud and grime, practically has to be pried from my skin. When the clothes fall off, Lysar witnesses my frail body, skin stretched against bone, bruises coating me from head to toe. His face is a mottled expression of terror and concern. I know, I need a bath. My attempt to smile is terrible. Despite the roaring fire, I shiver at the chill in the room, imaginary or not. Lysar grabs one of his robes and drapes it over me. You need blood first. Lysar immediately thrusts out his arm. Drink, he says, offering it before me. My stomach churns at what he's suggesting. The thought of taking his life force to sustain my own is hideous to me. Lysar, drink, he commands. Now. I'm far too hungry to fight him on this. I surge forward and grab his wrist, sinking my fangs into the main vein. Lysar hitches a breath when I bite down, but he doesn't move. Other vampires have told me werewolf blood is filthy and tastes awful. We consider it beneath us to consume it. But Lysar's blood isn't disgusting. It's amazing, tingling with magic and wildly delicious, luscious and full of life. I drink only enough blood to spare my life before I pull away, wiping spare droplets from my mouth. A surge of energy fires through me, and my hunger pangs are eliminated temporarily, but I'm still famished. Better, he asks, raising an eyebrow. Yes, I respond weakly. Now I just gotta... Hey, Lysar says, lunging out to catch me as I collapse. My eyes loll backwards, and he asks, When was the last time you ate? I don't know. My tongue is thick and dry. Might have been last week. Damn it, Lissy, he curses, holding me close. Why didn't you eat? Finding you is more important. Yeah, well, nobody likes a martyr. They're annoying. He picks me up and carries me to the bed. Despite my sickness, I feel like a goddess in his arms. You are way too light, Lysar says worryingly as he puts me down. He casts a glance over his shoulder and cries, Bryn! His sister comes right away. Has she been outside the door this whole time? She looks down at me and asks, Yeah? Don't yell me. She needs to eat, he exclaims. Hurry up and find something. Whatever, Sir Bossy Pants, Bryn snaps. But I can tell by her gaze she's worried too. Lysar clutches my hand and my eyes flicker to the puncture holes in his wrist. You'd better cover that up, I whisper. The other wolves will freak if they know I used you to feed. Don't worry about me right now. Lysar reaches for a leather cuff on the bedside table and slips it over the bite mark. Just focus on getting better. While waiting for Bryn, Lysar starts a hot bath in the whirlpool. 
When Rin comes back, she's carrying a large silver tray, which she sets on the bed beside me. We don't have bottled blood like you do at the castle, Rin explains. So this will have to do. She lifts the lid of the tray to show a bloody dripping prime steak, uncooked, and a chicken rice pilaf. My mouth immediately begins to water. After draining the carcass, I consume the meal Bryn has brought for me, leaving not even a grain on the plate. Once I'm done eating, I feel miraculously better, though not 100%. Don't do that again, Lysar snaps when I finally put my fork down. What, hike through the forest looking for you while starving myself? I ask. Yeah, I won't, if you don't randomly disappear. While Lysar rolls his eyes, Bryn snickers and picks the tray back up. Okay, now she's feeling better, she says. I know my work here is done. Don't worry about me, Bryn. I'll be back to kicking ass in no time, you'll see, I say as she goes out the door. Lysar locks it behind her, then helps me to hobble to the tub. I slip the robe off and sink into the soapy water letting the bubbles rise up past my nose. You have no idea how good this feels, I say, totally relaxed. I guess after roughing it outdoors for a month, this is paradise. Lysar picks up a loofah and fills it with soap, kneeling at the side of the tub and washing my shoulders in small circles. I don't need help, I say. You did it for me when I was sick, he reminds me. Just returning the favor. You can jump in if you like, I joke, wrinkling my nose as I pull a clump of clay out of my blonde hair. Yeah, maybe later. He looks down at the water. It's practically black. I'll probably take a shower after this, rinse the grime off. He doesn't say anything. I play with the bubbles a little and ask. Lysar, the night we were together. We spent a lot of nights together he says with a cocky grin. You know what I mean. My eyes lock onto his. He sighs dramatically. Yes, I know what you mean. The night we made love. He makes it sound so cheesy, on purpose. His smile gets bigger, though there's a flash of wariness in his eyes. Yes? Why didn't you tell me it was basically a marriage contract? He pauses, sloshing the water for a minute before speaking. I don't know, Lizzie. There was so much that went into it. He scrubs my arms. If you weren't a vampire, it'd be different. I thought about it for a long time, don't doubt that. It ended up being a spur-of-the-moment decision. I thought we wouldn't get another chance. But you knew that the consequences would be that we'd be mated for life in the eyes of the pack. I really don't consider that a consequence. His eyes flash up to mine, and my stomach wiggles. I didn't think we'd come back here after we ran away. But I hoped somehow we would, and that the pack would accept us. You went into it thinking I'd agreed to be your mate, I say. I didn't even know what that meant. I wasn't quite sure what it meant for you either, he confesses. I didn't think the rules applied to either one of us. We're a vampire and a werewolf in a relationship. Nothing like this has ever happened before. I just wanted us to show that we loved each other, without having to consider the possibilities of what that meant. Okay, I say slowly. So. What are we? Lysar cups my chin. I don't care what we're called. You're somebody I'm in love with, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. If you feel the same, I don't see why it matters. I do, Lysar, I say quietly. I only wish the world didn't have to make this so complicated. He gives me a sad half-smile. After he helps me out of the tub, I take a long, slow shower, pondering the events of the past day. When I exit the bathroom, I find that Kipcha is there, and he's talking to Lysar. Kipcha? I pull the towel tighter around my body. 
What's going on? Sorry for bothering you, but there are vampires outside the den entrance, Kipcha says grimly. My throat seizes up. Vampires? Are they cursed ones? Have the few followers left of Ivan Grigore heard about my arrival and come to seek vengeance? No, Kipcha shakes his head. The symbol is clear. They're Dragomir's soldiers. I'm sorry, Lysandra. Nikolai thinks you led them to the den. He's calling for your head. Chapter 5 We've got to get you out of here before they come for you, Lysa says. Kipcha shakes his head. No, it looks better if you head down there first. Defend yourself against these accusations instead of trying to run. If you try to escape now, you'll never make it past pack boundaries alive. Lysa appears worried, but I nod. Very well, I'll make my stand. Wear this, Lysa says, slipping a leather cuff identical to his own over my wrist. It shows the pack your status as my mate. I turn my arm. The leather cuff is fitted with a metal emblem of two wolves rising on their back legs to paw at the moon. Must be the symbol of Lysar's house. I don't have anything to wear, I start, realizing mid-sentence how ridiculous I sound. Here! Bryn comes flying in the room, carrying an emerald dress. She flings it at me. We have to go! As I head into the bathroom to change, I leave the door open a crack. Through it, I hear their scattered voices. Don't try anything stupid, I hear Bryn warn. Lysar's paw steps are padding quietly around the room. He's changed. I have to do what I have to do, Bryn, Lysar growls. His nails click on the wood. I know I can do this. I can take him. Lysar, you can't. You're not ready, Kipcha protests. I don't have any choice, he insists. I'm not going to lose her again. I emerge from the bathroom. Lysar and Kipcha are both in wolf form, and they're glaring at each other, hackles raised. Bryn stands nervously between them. Once the boys notice me standing there, their eyes flicker and they change back. Bryn quickly dries my hair, fashioning it into a quick chignon. We don't have time to put on makeup. Once I'm ready, Lysar takes my side and we head downstairs. Lysar, what was that about? I ask. It's nothing, Lissy. He shakes his head. Just a backup plan if things don't go well. Do things ever go well? Whatever Lysar's planning to do, it can't be good. When we enter the throne room, Nikolai and Sylvia are already there sitting upon the granite dais. The room is crowded with wary and threatened wolves who have circled a group of twelve vampires in the middle of the room. By their armour, I can tell they're Dragomir's soldiers. That doesn't matter when I recognise someone familiar and beloved among them. Lysar reaches out his arm. Lissy, don't. Grandfather! Lysar's finger grazes my wrist as I wrench away and run full speed towards Sirge, pushing wolves out of the way to get to him. Lysandra. Sirge embraces me tightly. He still smells like peppermint despite the filth coating his armor, and his gray whiskers tickle my cheek as I hold him close. This alone proves her guilt, Nikolai cries, gesturing to us. She knows these vampires. She led them to our home. Dad, please, Lysa says through clenched teeth. Give them a chance to explain. Sige pulls away, putting a hand upon my shoulder and gazing at the Alpha. I apologize for the intrusion. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Sige. And with me are a small collection of those who previously served under my command. Sergei Borislav? The war general? Nikolai asks. The very same. Sergei nods. 
Your history in battle is impressive, General, Nikolai says, almost with respect. You've cost me more wolves than most of your vampires combined. But I'm afraid we've outwitted you this time. We caught your brigade before the Grand Duchess could lead you into our city. Your plan has utterly failed. Lissandra had no idea of this. We've been tracking her for weeks without her knowledge, Sege responds. There was no plan. We stumbled upon your den by accident. It is a very funny coincidence that a den that has laid undiscovered for hundreds of years has just been stumbled upon by Dragomir's forces twice in one day. Nikolai growls. I believe you are mistaken. No longer do we serve Dragomir, Sege says. We follow the leadership of the Grand Duchess. Mumbles break throughout the room while my jaw falls open. I look at Sege and ask, Grandfather, is this true? Half the castle no longer wished to follow Dragomir after the siege. I gathered those I could, and we headed after you, he explains. There were more on your side, but Dragomir's guards managed to kill most of those who tried to escape. We are all that's left. Are you telling me that you're willing to set aside your differences to pursue an asinine peace imagined by two teenagers merely to defy Dragomir? Nikolai asks, aghast. I serve the monarchy, sir. I'm indebted to make sure that it survives at whatever cost, Sege says. Since her father seems so willing to destroy it, Lysandra is the only hope we vampires have for our future, even if the price includes making peace with the wolves. Do you believe a peace is possible? Sylvia asks, tilting her head. Sege straightens. I believe Lysandra can do anything. If she thinks this war can end without an extermination of either of our races, I'm willing to follow her lead. My heart swells. Sylvia looks at her mate and says, We cannot make a decision based on hearsay. No, you're right. Nikolai leans back in his chair, takes a deep breath, and screams, Shioni! There's a loud clomping as a young witch in her mid-twenties hurries down the stairs. She's rather pretty and looks quite stressed. Yes, Alpha? Check these vampires. See whether they're lying. Nikolai's eyes narrow. Of course, Alpha. The witch walks before us. She pauses before Sige and I, waving her hands. A faint blue glow hovers over us before she makes a confused expression. Well, Nikolai demands. They aren't protected with a charm, nor are they under a compulsion spell, Shioni says. As far as I can tell, what they say is the truth. This changes nothing. Nikolai pounds his staff against the floor. We can't take any more risks. It would be wise to eliminate them while we have the opportunity. You said you'd give me a chance, Lysa says, butting in. With one vampire's son, not an entire group, Nikolai barks back. Then let them be my responsibility, Lysa fumes. Wait! Shioni breaks into the conversation, holding up a hand, and the room goes quiet. There's something else. She quickly steps in front of me. A hazy look appears in her eyes, and her jaw slacks open before her hand cups my cheek. There's also a prophecy about the Grand Duchess. She only swallows and chants. The one who shall end the shifter line comes, born on winter's first breath, fair of hair. Blue of eye, descended from the Romanov dynasty. That damn prophecy. It haunts me everywhere I go. 
It's become the worst curse on my life. She only knows of it because every witch who crosses my path can hear the words that Valentina, Dragomir's own head witch, prophesied about me long ago. The room develops an eerie chill, and Lysar gives me a reluctant side glance. I wince. We still haven't discussed the prophecy privately, nor what it means for both of us. So she is the one to send our race to extinction? Nikolai questions. Shioni's eyes flash. The prophecy could mean anything. The magic's unclear. I can't tell one way or another which way her path will take. Shioni turns back to Nikolai. One thing is sure, Alpha. She truly does love your son. For the first time, the Alpha's eyes and mine meet. His black orbs are cold, full of suspicion. He knows I love Lysar, but I'm not convinced that love matters to him. Very well, Nikolai says. He flicks his fingers. Keep the vampires in the stockades and supply them with meat and blood. We shall keep them for the time being, until after the Grand Duchess proves herself. Please don't put them in the stocks, I beg, and Nikolai glares cruelly at me. Let them have rooms, at least. I'll take full responsibility for their actions. Calm yourself, Lysandra. I endured the worst conditions during the war. Sege says, to be under a roof with food is all I can ask for as a prisoner. Sege bows to the Alpha. A few of Nikolai's guards close in, in wolf form. They begin escorting the vampires to the cells, and I follow. Lysar takes my side immediately as we head outside the mansion, where the last of twilight is creeping over the earth. The den cells are better than the ones at Castel de Singe. They're made of thick wood and bars and are located near the den's barracks. They appear more like a horse stable than a jail. When the cell door closes, I reach through the bars and grab Siege's hands. Grandfather, are you sure you'll be all right out here? I ask. We'll be more than comfortable, I promise you. Lysandra. Sergei's eyes flicker suspiciously towards Lysar. Are you sure about this boy? I nod. Yes, Grandfather. I'm sure. Good. He grips my hands tightly before letting them go. If this is what your heart wants, I trust you. But be careful. These are wolves we're talking about. Just because you feel you can trust one doesn't mean you can trust them all. Sege whirls on Lysar. And you? Lysar blinks. Yes, I'm watching you. Don't think I can't get out of here if you do something to hurt my granddaughter. He glares. We'll change your mind about us. I promise. Lysar grabs my hand. Sege gives an irritated harumph. I certainly hope so. I hate to leave him there, but the quickest way to get him out of prison is to follow Nikolai's orders, so I stay strong as Lysar and I take the stony path back to the mansion, feeling rather melancholy. The moon is almost full. It creates a clear light on this chilly evening. Sorry about your grandpa. Lysar says sheepishly. Dad's a little hard to convince. I'm surprised we pulled that off. Our footsteps crunch on the gravel. I wonder if I... What was that? I jerk to a halt as a large black blur darts out of the corner of my eye and hides behind a tree. I creep a little closer, watching as the dark shape whirls through the shadows. Compelled, I follow it, the dark blur crushes itself behind a pair of pines, afraid to come into the light of the moon. Lissy, what are you doing? Lysar asks, coming after me. There's something over there, I say, pointing. I just saw it. It's some sort of animal. 
Are you sure it's not just exhaustion? He asks skeptically. I'm not seeing things, I respond. I head closer to the blur, pushing some bushes aside before it disappears. I pause, wondering where it went. Lysar moves warily beside me. Maybe you're right, but that doesn't mean I want to be out here when whatever it is comes sneaking around. Come on, let's go. He tugs on my arm, and reluctantly I follow. When I glance behind, the black mass is moving again, molding itself further into the shadows. By the time we're back inside and the glow of the fire safely surrounds us, it seems like the monster hiding in the dark is a mere fantasy. Did you smell anything unusual? I didn't, I ask Lysar. I didn't either. He shakes his head. But our sense of smell isn't foolproof. If someone's put an enchantment on themselves or used a powerful herb to mask their scent, like we used white sage back at Castel de Singe, we won't be able to detect them with our nose. Maybe that's what it was. A monster using herbs to disguise their scent. I look out the window but see nothing but the vacant yard of the mansion. Empty. Come on, Lizzie. You're dead on your feet, Lysar says. There's nothing out there. You need to stop worrying. Sleep's what you need right now. Lysar picks me up, cradling me close to his bare chest. I lay my head on his shoulder, and he carries me up the stairs, nestling kisses in my hair as we enter his room. I can feel his heartbeat pounding through his skin, but though a primal desire burns at the sound, my mind is elsewhere. Despite Lysar's reassurances, I know what I saw. There's something out there, lurking within the perimeter of the den, and it's on the hunt. Chapter 6 When I wake up, Lysar is standing on the balcony. There's light streaming in through the window, circling him in a warm halo of sunset sky. Lysar, I shake my head of sleep, clearing my bleary eyes. How long was I out? You slept through most of the night and all day, he says. Are you well enough to walk around? I guess so. I stretch, giving a big yawn. Can we take a tour of the den? If that's what you want, he says. I guess it's best for the wolves to get to know you anyway. We have to start somewhere on the road to peace. I get up from the bed and trail over to the wardrobe. When I open it, I find it's outfitted with brand new clothes just for me. Don't wear anything nice, Lysa says. You won't need it out there, and wolves aren't impressed by clothing. So what do they value? I ask, casting a glance over my shoulder. Lysa raises himself up. Dignity. Family. So helpful. I choose a thin tank top and a pair of cargo pants to resemble what Lysar's wearing. He takes my hand and leads me downstairs, where his mother, and, to my displeasure, Nikolai, is waiting by the door. My scouts are everywhere, Nikolai warns me as we pass. If you do anything, I'll know immediately. Dad, cool off, Lysar grumbles. Have fun, both of you. Sylvia says the words encouragingly, then opens the door. The glimmering starlight reflects down upon the cool green grass, and I take a step out onto it, breathing in the fresh night air. The pack looks our way when the large doors close behind us. They give me suspicious looks, then resume their business, making sure to keep a watchful eye on both of us as we walk through the village. Don't mind them. Lysar says, giving a doggish smile. Give it two weeks and they'll love you. Just like my family loved you, right? I give a nervous laugh. My family's much cooler than yours. Lysar gives my hand a gentle squeeze. You're in my house now, baby. I just know you're gonna love it here. 
I feel like Lysa's being overly optimistic about the whole thing. He's desperate for me to fit in, but not as desperate as I am. If they kick me out, that is, if they don't choose to kill me first, I have nowhere else to go, and I have no intention whatsoever of being separated from Lysa again. The den is large. Small wooden houses with sculpted designs of wolves on their balconies are scattered around the massive mansion. The entire area is surrounded by thick pines and spruces. There's quite a lot of space. In the distance, a thick stone wall surrounds the den, pressed against the side of a mountain. I suspect the wall is the boundary where the land ends and leads to a drop-off. No wonder the den hasn't been found until now. It's impossible to witness from the ground. Unless you were flying overhead the mountain and close to it, you'd never see it. We take the cobblestone path. Outside their homes, women are spinning wool. They wear white blouses with striped woven panels, which cover black skirts and black slippers. White headscarves cover their hair, while children play cheerfully around their ankles. I try to seem friendly, but the look within their eyes isn't that of kindly old spinsters, but she-wolves on the hunt. Some wolves raise their lips and growl as I pass, but I ignore them. At least our relationship is out in the open. Lysar and I don't have to hide anymore. Lysar and I pass a spectacular wooden church dated from the 17th century. The church has high steeples and a gabled roof, each with a different pattern, beautiful stained glass windows dancing within the moonlight. Near the church, the shops begin. Carved wooden columns lead the way along the path, their sides filled with colourful folk art. Through the windows of the shops, I see the wares of the pack. Blown glass shimmers off of eggs painted with intricate spellbinding patterns, which sit upon weaved textiles. They're positioned across from ceramic pottery, which are decorated with geometric shapes and lovely florals. We pass a warm café where the smells of pastries carry out the window. I inhale deeply, and Lysar notices. Want to go in? he asks. Sure, I say. I'm pretty hungry. Lysar opens the door for me. Almost immediately, the waitress brings us two bowls of borscht and a full plate of food. Once I've eaten the cabbage soup, I turn to the meaty tea, digging into the grilled sausage eagerly. I've never seen you eat like that. You definitely need to take better care of yourself, Lysa says, stroking his thumb over my hand. His eyes catch mine, and a squiggle squirms through my stomach. That gaze so sultry and demanding. How does he do it? Cast a spell over me like this. I finish my meal and put my fork down. Food has suddenly become the last thing on my mind. We haven't been together since that night back at the castle, and we're in the same room. I wonder what's holding us back. Is it the pack's expectations? Him? Me? Both of us? I look out the window and watch a mother wolf escort her pups, some in human form, some not, into a clothing shop. Something crosses my mind. What do wolves do when they're not hunting? Or killing vampires? I ask the question curiously, the last part with a bit of humor. We're wolves first. Romanians a close second, he replies. Most of the men farm outside the village, while the women raise the pups and keep the home. Many of the houses here didn't have plumbing or electricity until shortly before I was born. It just came to the mountainside a little over twenty years ago. Really? I ask in surprise. A lot of us don't need those things, Lysa says. At least that's what the old ones would say. I don't know how I could live without my video games and shows. I think of Lysar stretched out on the couch in his wolf form, a paw over his head as he laments about how he doesn't have a television. The poor drama queen wouldn't be able to handle it. 
Unable to hold back, I laugh. What's so funny? He smirks. Can't believe you've been transported back to feudal Europe. I shake my head. You'd never see a vampire living like this. They'd consider it primitive. A vampire wouldn't dare to live without conveniences of the modern world. Even in the worst covens I was sent to during my training, none of them had anything less than top-notch technology. Castel de Singe was always regal, modern, up-to-date. Wolves are entirely different. It's like they're set in the old ways and are happy about it, untouched by time. It's simple. He sighs, dropping his spoon into an empty bowl. And pretty boring. Boring? Part of the reason Bryn and I signed up for the war. Fighting vampires is better than being trapped here. He sighs. Sometimes I felt like I was a wolf in a cage, locked away from the rest of the world. He stands, heading toward the door. Besides, when I take over, I've got some plans to liven things up around here. I can only imagine. You've already created quite a chaos, I say as we head out, keeping my head down as a pair of two wolves glare at me. I'm not alone in this, Missy. You started it. You could have just gutted me after all. He nudges me, and I nudge back. His arm next to mine is so warm. Well, whatever I do, it doesn't change that I'm a vampire, I say, sighing heavily. We do have one thing in common. We're all Romanians, he offers. I'm only one-fourth Romanian. There's more Russian in me than anything, I say. Even my heritage is different. It wouldn't kill these wolves to shake things up a bit. Maybe different is what we need. Tradition. Family. Sacrifice. He deepens his voice in a startling resemblance of his father before rolling his eyes. If I hear the pack mantra one more time, I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I giggle. An old-style bell rings, and a dozen or so little ones, in pup and kid form, come hustling out of a stone building, calling and cheering for Lysar. It's the school. They always freak out when I walk by, he explains. Son of the Alpha thing. They're pushing and tumbling over each other to get to him. The children surround Lysar in a circle, calling out for his attention pulling on his clothes and stepping on his feet. The pups don't even notice me, just fix their eyes on Lysar. Lysar puffs up like he's enjoying the attention, and I snicker behind my hand. Kids, I've got someone I'd like you to meet. He crouches down and gestures upwards to me. This is Lissy. She's my girlfriend. Is that like a mate? Mama says she's your mate. A loud one bursts in. Uh, Lysar says, looking at me. Both of us are unable to answer. She smells like food, a pup shouts, wagging his tail eagerly and waddling up to my feet with his big sloppy paws. No, she smells like Lissy. Lysar picks up the pup and holds him aloft. He holds him out for me to take. Here. Lysar, no, I... My words are cut off as Lysar drops the pup in mid-air and I reach out to catch him. The pup's eyes are huge and brown and golden and his fur is soft against my skin. I instantly melt. You're very cute, I say, ruffling the tuft on top of its head. You want to play with me? Let's play! The pup wiggles out of my arms, jumps to the ground, and heads towards a large leather ball. He picks it up with his teeth and throws it at me. It bounces off my knee and goes rolling across the playground, the pups chasing after it. Lysar growls playfully and joins in, changing into a wolf and tossing the ball into the air. I start forward to join him. I'm not sure what we're playing, but I don't think it matters. After I kick the ball a few times, the pups get excited and start passing it to me more and more. It blows my mind they're completely unaware that I'm a vampire. 
It looks like they don't care what I am, only that I'm playing with them. At least the young ones seem to like me, though by the angry look of their teacher, who's standing at the edge of the courtyard, I have to say the children are the only ones giving me a pass. The school bell rings and we stop the game, the wolf cubs panting excessively. Thank you, I say, catching my breath as the pups gather around me, for letting me join the game. You don't have to thank us, one of the older pups says. You were here, you should play. It wouldn't be right to keep you out of it. As they romp back inside the building, I realize there are tears welling up in my eyes. I wipe them away with the back of my hand before Lysar sees. You okay? He asks, tossing the ball carelessly back into the schoolyard with his fangs. I expected them to hate me, I whisper. Like I said, the young ones have more of an open mind, he says. It's the old dogs that'll be hard to convince. I'm too emotional to say anything right then, so I keep my hair over my face and follow Lysar. He leads out of town to where the cobblestone ends and the forest begins. When his paws hit the grass, he shakes his sandy pelt and gives a victorious howl. Come on, Lizzie, Lysar shouts. Let's have some fun. I give a whoop and follow him. Lysar breaks out into a run. I equal his strides, keeping pace and matching my wolf step for step, creating a drum-like harmony with each foot that touches the ground. The moonlight twists through the trees and light upon his brown eyes, deep and glimmering. When I glance to the side, I see he's looking at me. Lysar runs up a rock and jumps off, sailing over my head. Show off. To keep up with him, I grab the branches of a few low-hanging trees, swinging myself up and over. I somersault over him in mid-air, landing before him and sprinting ahead. You're obviously feeling a lot better, he barks. That's not even close to what I can do, I shout. I slide to a stop and fling out my leg, kicking Lysar's feet out from under him. He goes sliding down the hill, yelling loudly. Whoa! When he finally comes to a stop, he shakes his fur. I like a girl who can handle herself. I'm not an easy kill, that's for sure. I shake my head of leaves, which caught and gathered in my hair as I ran. I'm glad I never fought you. He snickers. You probably would have mopped the floor with me. Yeah, right, son of the Alpha, remember? You could easily overpower me, I say. He raises an eyebrow, then changes back into a man. There's an eager look on his face. Oh, yeah? What if I did that right now? A mischievous smile lights up my face. Not if I get away. I'm faster, vampire. We'll see. I take off. Lysar shouts, but he doesn't change back. I sprint, zigzagging between trees and bushes, but it isn't seconds before he catches up. He nabs me around the waist and spins me around, clenching my body to his tightly. I can feel the sweat on his skin as his thick arms hold me still. You're caught, he whispers in my ear. Now what am I going to do with you? I gasp and say breathily, I guess that's for you to decide, Wolf. Hmm, I kind of like that idea. He turns me around and crushes his mouth against mine. I eagerly accept the kiss, tasting the rays that have become warmth and home. Lysar takes two heavy steps forward, pushing me up against a tree, hands grasping my middle. My back hits the trunk roughly. Lysar trails kisses down my neck and across my shoulder, his fingers beating the bottom of my shirt. Just as he's about to make another move, a branch cracks behind us. We jump, whipping around into a defensive stance. It's only Bryn coming round the bend. I sigh in relief, though a twinge of annoyance flickers within my chest. Jeez, Bryn, nearly gave us a heart attack. Give a little warning next time when you barge in on us, won't you? 
Lysar says, irritated. Sorry, I'll keep that in mind, she snaps. Her face is deadly serious. I was sent out to get you. Dad ordered you to babysit us, remind us of our curfew? Lysar asks, spitefully. No, Bryn shakes her head. I'm sorry I have to tell you guys this, but things are a lot worse than we thought. Worse? I blink. How can they be worse? You don't understand. You have to get back to town, Bryn insists. A wolf's just been killed. Chapter 7 there are dozens of wolves gathered on the outskirts of town when we return. Lysar shoves his way toward the front, taking command, while Bryn escorts me through the mess. When I enter the group, accusations fling at me from all sides, but nobody makes a move against me, not without the approval of the Alpha. Nikolai is already there. His face is red, eyes burning with rage, while Sylvia stands at her mate's side, face mottled with tears. At their feet lies the body of an adult wolf, lying in a pool of darkened blood and exposed muscle. The wolf has been horribly mangled, gashes running across its pelt, its throat savagely ripped out as if by some beast. Keep away! We will find out who did this! Nikolai cries. It doesn't take him long to find me. He instantly points an accusatory finger and says, Bring her to me. I want her head. The other wolves turn at an instant, but Lysar grabs my arm and wrenches me to him, screaming, She was with me the whole time. Lissy had nothing to do with this. Stop defending her, son, Nikolai roars. If it wasn't her, it was one of her other blood-sucking servants. I want all of those vampires brought here right now. Nikolai, calm down. Sylvia's voice is like thunder, and at it, the pack shirks. There's a harshness to her voice I haven't heard before, and it shocks me to see the gentle she-wolf be so fierce. We will find out who did this, but not with false accusation. False accusation, Nikolai roars. Are you telling me you don't believe the leeches are behind this? Examine the body, Sylvia shouts. Then we will find the truth of the matter. Nikolai shouts at the top of his lungs, an enraged, guttural sound. For a minute, I think the two wolves are going to fight, but Sylvia stands her ground. Nikolai snarls and stoops down by the body. He observes it before calling for a wolf named Bogdan, who appears to be his beta wolf and second in command. You've seen more battles than I. Tell me, what do you see? Nikolai demands. Bogdan narrows his eyes. He clears his throat before speaking. These aren't typical of a vampire, Alpha, the beta responds. Vampires usually leave clean kills, a bite mark or a broken neck. They don't like to get messy. Whatever did this is some kind of monster. The beta hesitates. The wounds appear typical of a haunted. Scared whispers run throughout the pack. Nikolai shakes his head frantically. No, no, that's not possible. From the haunted kills I've seen, Alpha, there are no haunted here. They have never entered the den and never will. Nikolai stands up, sweeping his cloak behind him. I'm not questioning you, Alpha. It is only what I see. The beta steps back cautiously. You wished to see us, Siege asks rather dryly. The gods have brought him and the rest of the vampires at the worst possible time. Sergei's barely paying attention to the dead wolf on the ground, which, after his career, I suppose it's nothing new. Yes, I wished to confront the people responsible for this tragedy, Nikolai responds. We haven't done anything. It's not my fault if you've lost control of the den, Sergei says. Grandfather, I hiss. Did any vampires escape the cell? 
Nikolai asks, rounding on his guard. None, sir, the soldier responds. All were accounted for at the time of the murder. If this was a vampire, wouldn't they have drained the blood before leaving the body? Sylvia asks. A vampire wouldn't think of drinking the blood of a filthy wolf, Sege says, his lips curling. Grandfather, you're not helping. I growl through clenched teeth. Everyone clear out, Nikolai orders. We will find the perpetrators of this crime and make sure they pay dearly. As the wolves leave, Nikolai closes in on me. Are you telling the truth, girl? He asks. Because if you aren't, like I said, she was with me, Lysar growls. You can ask the wolves at the cafe and the school. We were just there not twenty minutes ago. So you're insisting she had nothing to do with this, Nikolai sneers. No, unless you think I did it. Lysar stares rebelliously back at his father. Nikolai narrows his eyes. No. He turns away, his broad shoulders blocking out the moon. Keep control of your vampire son, or someone will have to. Nikolai stalks away. His guards move in to take care of the body. Sige gives me a be safe look before he's rounded away with the other vampires back to his cell. Okay. It's pretty obvious why Nikolai would suspect me, even though the evidence isn't there, I say in frustration. But I've heard of Haunted before. Are we certain one did this? Haunted were mutated werewolves that were similar to cursed ones. They became deranged and feral by consuming human flesh. I'd never met one, and didn't plan to. Must be. Haunted are awful. Bryn states. Not pleasant. Not kind. They don't do much but kill things, Kipcha adds. That's why the pack's so scared. A haunted has never gotten inside the den before. They're stronger than normal wolves, so if one's running loose, it could easily take out quite a few of us before it could be stopped. Did anybody see anything prior to the attack? Bryn asks. Lysar and I did see something sneaking around last night, I muse. If it was a haunted, why didn't it attack us when we spotted it? You were with me. I'm an alpha, Lysar explains. No haunted would dare pick a fight with me. I'd easily kick its ass. Will it leave traces of where it went? I ask. Oh, yeah. Kipcha nods. If it is a haunted, it won't get far. They're not good at keeping themselves hidden. They're really sloppy. Don't cover their tracks. Then we should go find it, I suggest. If we kill it, it won't hurt anyone else. That's a good plan. Kipcha rolls his shoulders and changes into a wolf. Should be easy with Lysar on the team. Lissy, this is a haunted we're talking about. It's dangerous. Maybe you should wait in my room, Lysar argues. We'll stay together. With the four of us, it doesn't stand a chance. I say. Besides, I'm not letting you go out there without me. Lysar grimaces, but eventually relents. Together, the four of us head into the woodland, looking for a killer. Lysar draws close to me, ducking his head so only we can hear. Lissy, he starts. Are you sure you're doing this for the right reasons? You don't need to bring home a haunted trophy just so you can impress my dad because it's going to take more than a bit of taxidermy to win him over. Of course not. I wave my hand. I just want to do my part to help the pack. Lysar changes into a wolf, so I can't read his expression as clearly. He's not convinced by my words. Neither am I. As the dawn rises, we head back to the mansion, feeling a little defeated, Bryn, Kipcha, Lysa, and I poked around the area, but we didn't find anything but a few bloody trails that led off into the woods before they ceased completely. We didn't pick up any other clues or even a scent. This doesn't make any sense, Kipcha says, kicking a stone and watching it skitter away. 
If it is a haunted, there should be signs pointing to it, but it's like whoever it is had a clean getaway. Maybe somebody is helping it get in, Bryn thinks out loud. There is no wolf in their right mind who would help a haunted or cover its tracks for them, Lysaw rebukes. Maybe Bogdan was wrong and somebody in the pack wanted to target the victim. For what reason, though? Everyone knows the law. The penalty for murder is instant death, Bryn says. Maybe eliminating this wolf was so important to whoever did it that dying didn't matter to them, Lysaw says. They'd have to be desperate for revenge. Everyone in the pack seems so happy. Family, unity, and all of that. But perhaps it isn't as picturesque as it all seems. Still, within this simple world, what could be so awful that someone would want to commit murder? When we enter the mansion, we find that everyone has gone to bed but us. I'm gonna walk around a bit more. Kipcha says, see what I can find. Be careful, Lysar warns, and off Kipcha goes. Bryn has already slunk off without a goodbye. To bed or to investigate, I don't know. Me, I'm too tired. I drag my feet up the stairs as Lysar and I proceed up to our room. Lysar's muscles, especially in his arms, are stretched and tense. I doubt he's going straight to bed. What are you thinking? I ask as we enter the main hallway. Nothing like this has ever happened in the den before. Lysa's face is stoic. There's too much happening around your arrival, Lissy. I'm worried someone is trying to frame you. The murderer needed an excuse to kill and just waited until they had the proper opportunity to blame someone that Dad would happily go after. He's probably right, so I don't answer. Instead, I open the door, looking forward to a long, hot bath. My breath catches in my throat, and my saw stutters. Our room is destroyed. Drawers are overturned. Furniture is laying on its side, and items are everywhere, scattered carelessly around the room as if they were thrown about in a hurry. All of our clothes are clumped on the rug in scattered piles. Lysar's games are strewn about the bedding torn off the mattress. Even the curtains are ripped from their rods, dangling limply as fallen banners in war. Someone was in here, and they were after something. Immediately I go to my backpack. I begin ruffling through it in a panic, fear growing inside of me as I realize what's missing. Lissy, what are you looking for? Lysar asks, stooping beside me. The invisibility potion. I say, it's gone. Chapter 8 Lysar shifts through the remnants of our things on the floor. Despite our room being trashed, it's all accounted for, except the invisibility potion. Lysar and I used it a few months ago back at Castel de Singe, when Valentina gave it to us to purposefully mislead us into thinking she was on our side. We had some of it left to use in an emergency, but now it's missing. We were gone all day. I put a finger to my chin. Whoever it was could have broken into our room at any time, and we wouldn't have known about it until we got back. True. No one's allowed in here but us. Lysar gets up. Though I'm not sure who could have known it was there— Nikita took the pack, but as far as I know, he didn't go rifling through it before I took it off of him. They had to know it was in here, I say. They weren't looking for money or valuables. It's the only thing that's taken. Do you think this is connected with the murder? Maybe. It's too big a coincidence. I take a few anxious steps. But if what you've told me about Haunted is true... It wouldn't make sense for them not to take everything, and there's no way they'd get past the guards. I don't know how they got in here without getting caught. Good point. We watch the servants closely as they rearrange the room, not because we can't clean up our own stuff, but to see if any of them appear guilty. This leads to a dead end, as they all look just as clueless as we are. This doesn't make any sense, 
Lysar says once they're done, shutting the door behind the servants and locking it as he's taken habit to. I'm betting whoever murdered the wolf knew about the potion, went looking for it before the murder and then used it to escape, I say. That's why we didn't find any clues when we went looking for the haunted. But who? All the wolves are accounted for, Lysar says. Nobody's missing. I don't know. I draw away, looking over the balcony. Even though this isn't quite my home, this is my space, tucked away for me and Lysar, and it's been defiled and violated. I don't feel safe. We'll figure this out, Lissy, Lysar says, wrapping his arms around my waist. He moves my hair back and starts placing kisses down the back of my neck, moving his hands slowly upward. I shiver at the touch of his lips against my skin, his fingers brushing against my shirt. I turn around where he places a desirable kiss upon my mouth, and that's when everything freezes. Every part of my body is firing off, longing for him to continue. But I can't. I go to kiss him back, but before I can, I pause for a second, slowly drawing away. You're hesitating. He steps back, holding my shoulders. Why are you hesitating? I... I don't know. I bite my lip and pull my arms across my chest. I guess I just don't feel like it right now. Okay, then we won't. He steps back. Is it really all that simple, when we just did? Lissy, nothing in our lives is simple, he argues. But this is easy. If you don't want to, fine. Oh. Lysar jumps onto the bed with a whoop and grabs the remote, turning on the TV. He settles on a hockey game before stretching his arms out, inviting me to join. This is an area in which I am much more comfortable. I crawl in beside him and curl my knees against his stomach, placing my hands on top of his gorgeous pecs. I watch his chest rise and fall as the sun shines behind the drawn curtains. Oh, come on, you goons, Lysar shouts, immersed in the game. Shoot the damn puck, it's not that hard. I put my forehead against his chest, breathing in slowly while he rants. He might be distracted, but my mind is miles away, trying to figure things out. I wasn't wearing clothes when I took a bath the other day, and he helped. He saw me naked then. What's the big difference? Why can't I be with him? I know why. Tradition. Expectations. Reality. Society has forced into my head all these stupid requirements and rules, making me feel like our love is wrong. The first time was easy, because he and I had nothing to lose. I was getting married to Tomlin the next day if we couldn't manage to run away. Everything was on the line. We had planned to live a life outside the war, without wolves and vampires both. But all of this, becoming the next alpha female, living with the pack, it brings me back to what me and Lysa are trying to do. Nobody wants us together. They're all just waiting on the sidelines for us to break up or kill each other. What if what we're doing is wrong? What if we're dooming both of our races by attempting to be together? Hell, we don't even know what we're doing. We don't even have the right label for it. We're living in a world where girlfriend, wife, and mate all seem interchangeable depending on the situation. Talk about defining the relationship. Whatever happened to just plain love? I can practically hear the gears turning, Lysar says, tapping the side of my temple. What's going on in there? I shift against his chest. There's so much I want to tell him, but don't want to burden him with. I can't understand this constant need the pack, and to some extent my own family, has to watch and judge us. 
Lysar and I are both adults. We're supposed to be able to make our own decisions and our own mistakes, but we're treated like children. Are our parents convinced they have to constantly supervise our every move to be sure we don't mess up in some way? When do Lysar and I get to be ourselves, able to make our own decisions? I'm just frustrated, Lysar, I say. This is a messed up situation. I try not to think about it. He yawns. How can you not think about it? I sit up. This affects everything. I can't stand the thought of us not being together forever. But we've been having so much bad luck lately. It seems like even the universe wants to keep us apart. It's not as bad as you think. You're letting your head get in the way. Lysa brushes back my hair. Relax, Blondie. I feel like we're never going to meet their expectations, I complain. I don't feel the need to meet their expectations. I'd rather blow them out of the water. He grins. I just want to be with you. This is our life, Lissy, not theirs. They don't get to tell us how it's run. My shoulders slump, and I curl next to him again. Okay. I don't say anything for the rest of the game. When Lysar's team loses, he grumbles about how their defense sucks before deciding to go to bed, turning on his stomach. When he notices the worried expression still on my face, Lysar snorts and shakes his head. Women. He leans over and buries his head in the pillow, closing his eyes. Things will get better, I promise. Sleep tight, tough guy. I smile at the old nickname. Lysar's snoring in minutes, but I toss and turn half the day, unable to get a wink. After deciding what I really need is a cup of water, I get up and go searching the mansion for the kitchens. I'm thirsting for blood, which accounts for my grumpiness, but there's none here. I'll have to go hunting soon. I walk through the dimly lit hallways, jumping when I run into someone in the hallway. I jump five feet in the air, thinking it's the ghost of Ivan Grigore, before I see the ruffled pelt. It's an old mangy wolf, probably one of the servants. Hello, I say. Could you point me to the kitchens? I'm a little lost. I wouldn't do anything to help a filthy leech. The wolf replies in disgust. Find it yourself. I only wanted a drink, I say, outraged. Lysar likes you because you're different, the old wolf sneers. A new toy to play with. Once his youth expires and he gets tired of rebelling, he'll settle down and return to his old life, leaving you behind. United, we sacrifice so we may live. Divided, we wander until we die. The old wolf turns and slinks into the darkness. Then I am alone. Hey, Lissy, you've been out on that balcony all night. Look at me. I turn my head towards Lysar, who's standing by the doorway. He knows what the old wolf said to me because I told him, but beside reassure me, he can't do anything about it without getting Nikolai involved. I haven't really felt comfortable going out amongst the pack since, so I've been hiding in our room, hoping nobody comes in. The pack is telling stories tonight. It's really special. You should come, he offers, leaning against the frame. You'd have a blast. Do they want me there? I ask, a little spitefully. I've taken the mangy wolf's comments to heart, though I know I shouldn't. I do, and I don't really care what they want. Lysar holds out his hand, and I take it. We go outside, the world a map underneath billions upon billions of diamonds in the sky. I can hear the howls and songs of the pack from a distance, watching as they dance in wolf and human form, around a large, barely controlled bonfire. The entire pack is present, huddling around as we approach. 
hundreds of wolves mole around the area, playing games and laughing by the light of the fire. The wolves give me suspicious looks when I enter, but at least nobody says anything. By the roaring fire sits Sylvia. She has her legs crossed and is looking around expectantly. She smiles when I arrive. When Lysar sits down, so does the rest of the pack. They gather around the bonfire in a circle, pressing as closely together as they can. I take a seat, not caring if the wet grass stains my jeans. Lysar changes into a wolf, pressing his body against mine, and I wrap my hands in his soft fur for reassurance. Very good. Now we can begin. Sylvia starts. She takes a bit of red powder out from her cloak and throws it into the fire. The flames shoot up into the sky, tall as a building, and the pack ooze and awes. In the beginning, at the very start of the world, everything was dark. Sylvia sweeps her hand over the fire and it dims, casting a low light. Magic was everywhere, more so than it is today, and it was the force that ran the world. Evil was rampant. Dark creatures lurking in the shadows grew strong from its influence. Lysa is paying rapt attention, his eyes wide, ears up. Bryn is mouthing the words along with her mother, as if she's heard this story recited a thousand times and the retelling never dulls. Humans were weak and fragile, unable to protect themselves against these monsters. Some of their own even turned against them. Violent, cruel men who had tortured others in life were buried and rose from their graves, hideous in appearance. They were undead, cursed to wander the earth, surviving only off of human flesh. They had wolfish qualities, though they weren't wolves at all. These beasts became known as the Precolich, the haunted. Sylvia waves her hands, and the flames morph into a misshapen, growling creature with long claws and sharp teeth. The pups huddle closer to their mothers, gasping in fright, while the eyes of the elders reflect ominously, as if remembering past fights. Fain, the creator of the world, looked down upon humanity and the preco-leech that hunted them, and knew something had to be done. Something would have to be created that was strong enough to stop the preco-leech. Fane turned his head and saw, looking out the window of her cottage, a young girl within her woodland home within Transylvania. The fire changed to display the maiden and the wolf. Both drew closer and closer, taking small steps, reaching out to each other, but never able to touch. The wolf loved the woman too, but could not see how they could be together as they were born different and not the same. When the wolf came to spy upon the woman, Fane turned him into a man, so the wolf could attempt to woo his true mate. The fire flickers in a brilliant display, showing the transformation of wolf into man. Lysar nudges me eagerly and I smile back. This is quite the show. The wolf did his best to win the love of the fair maiden, but since she didn't recognize him for who he was, she ignored every effort to gain her heart. She only loved her wolf. The wolf himself wasn't happy, as he didn't feel like himself in his new skin. Both cried out to Fane and he gave the wolf the ability to change back into his old form, should he ever have need. When the maiden saw the man change before her very eyes, she instantly realized her mistake and ran to him. They got married and had many pups, starting the lupus pack, which continues on to this day. And ever and ever, the pack says back to her in a dreamlike chant, I look around, feeling left out. I cast my gaze back instead to the fire, where the maiden and her wolf are entangled in a lover's embrace, 
wrapped within the flames. The Lupus Q pack was given one task by Fane. They were to kill the haunted and rid their influence from the earth. But if they turned from their ways and consumed human flesh, they too would become the very things they hated, the monsters they were created to hunt. The fire gives a brilliant flash, raging as a wolf fights painfully against a hideous transformation, the elongation of limbs, a hunched, crooked back. I wince. I've never seen a haunted myself, but even in the vague depiction of the fire, even I can tell it's ugly. The Lupuscu family will always fight their greatest enemies, the Precolich, until either they or we are erased from eternity, Sylvia finishes. Just as we will war with the Strigoi to their end or ours. Strigoi? I ask. The words ring in my ears, carrying a faint familiarity. Strigoi, Bryn whispers quietly. Vampire. Lysol looks at me. Strigoi, my name. Vampire. It sounds so dirty here. The pack seems to shift uncomfortably, and Sylvia takes an uncomfortable pause. Tell it, Mom, Lysol says. Lissy deserves to know our stories if she's going to be one of us, and this is the oldest one. Sylvia swallows. Very well. She throws some more powder into the fire, and it dies down to a subdued flame, giving off a pleasant glow. Centuries ago, a witch put a spell upon a man, Vlad Dracula, that he, his descendants, and whomever he infected with his venom would be granted supernatural strength, incredible speed, and unnaturally long life, with a thirst for blood. This curse would give him the power to defeat the Turkish forces that had invaded his country. The pack heard of this, and since they too had experienced difficulty with the Ottomans, they went to join the ranks with the Strigoi to see if they could chase a common enemy out of Transylvania. Sylvia's face is hollow as she gazes into the fire, but it was not meant to be. The wolves agreed to meet with the vampires at a certain place so they could stage an attack on the Ottomans. But that morning, the pack overslept and did not waken in time to join the Strigoi ranks. Vlad Dracula was ambushed, and without the help of the pack, his vampires fell, and Vlad himself was slaughtered. I had never heard this part of the story. Why wasn't this told to me? I glance at Lysar. His gaze is apologetic and anxious. The wolves attempted to apologize, but it was too late. Vlad's son ruled that only vampires, not wolves, could exist in the world he lived in. He turned on the wolves, and his ranks murdered hundreds, pushing our pack to the edge of extinction. We have been at war ever since. The only sound is the crackling of the fire. Nobody moves. It's a pregnant silence. Sylvia moves first, waving her hands so streamers appear in midair. The pups squeal, jumping up from their parents' laps and beginning to chase them around the fire. When Sylvia acts, it signals the rest of the pack that they can relax. As the other wolves begin to play games, I shake my head unable to believe it. That's all this war is about? A silly misunderstanding? I sputter. You didn't know? Bryn questions. All I had ever known was that it's been going on for years. No one ever told me how it started, I insist. Well, now you know, Lysar box. This whole thing started because we slept in. Teaches you to get your ass up when the alarm goes off, huh? It's no excuse for genocide. After tonight, I'm even more convinced how silly this entire thing is. Thousands on both sides killed over hundreds of years for practically no reason. This is why Lysar and I aren't supposed to be together? It's ridiculous. Hey, Lysar, get over here. 
Kipcha calls from the other side of the fire, waving his hand. We have ale. All right. Lysar gambles over. Bryn wraps her arms around her legs, watching as her brother sips at a spirit bottle slowly. Lysar put this together for me, I whisper. Didn't he? Don't ask me. Bryn gives a dashing smile that looks just like her brother's. I had nothing to do with it. Oh, I'm sure. Lysar was so protective of the pack's secrets back at Castel de Singe, and now he's revealing them to me in front of everybody. It's surprising that nobody's objected to it. But then I realize with a quick look around that Nikolaye isn't here, as well as some of the older wolves. Obviously, those that didn't approve didn't show up. That means the majority of the pack is at least willing to give me a chance. A warmth spreads throughout my chest. Maybe everything isn't as hopeless as I thought. The other wolves are calling out stars, counting the ones that shoot by. I cuddle next to Bryn, sharing her body heat as the night grows longer and cooler. I don't feel comfortable enough to join in on the festivities, so I just watch, enjoying being present. Lysar stumbles into me, hanging on my shoulder. Hey, Lissy. He plants a wet, sloppy kiss on my cheek. Enjoying yourself? You obviously are. Had too much to drink? I snicker. Nah, I'm fine. He picks me up, swinging me around. I yelp before he puts me down and he grabs my hand, pulling me away from the party. Where are we going? I ask, feeling a thrill of excitement shoot through my chest. I want to show you the den entrance, he whispers. It's really cool. I bet Nikolaye won't appreciate that. I grin coyly. Oh yeah, he'd totally freak out. That's why we're doing it. Lysar winds me through the trees before stopping at a huge boulder, which is pushed tightly against the side of the mountain. Watch, Lysar says. He presses his hand to the side of the mountain, and of its own accord, the boulder begins to move. It rolls out of the way, revealing a cavern drilled out within the belly of the mountain. That's incredible. I step inside the cavern, my voice bouncing off the walls. Can I try? It won't work for you, Lysa explains. Shioni did the enchantment. Only wolves are able to open the door. Oh. I begin walking down the cavern, and as Lysar steps inside, the boulder rolls back, closing us into darkness. As both of us can see pretty well in the dark, we continue forward toward the moonlight at the end of the tunnel. The cavern entrance is thick with brambles and branches, which we have to push aside to get through. When we emerge outside, I find the forest vaguely familiar, the hill I rolled down days ago only a short distance away. This is the same place I was before, I say sourly, surveying the area. I was really close. Yeah, but you wouldn't have found it without a wolf, Lysar says. Don't come outside the den unless you're with me. You won't be able to get back in. Why would I want to go outside? I ask mischievously. You're always in there. Lysar goes to make a move, but I get to him first. I grab his arm, wrenching him to my side and planting a light kiss on his lips. He makes a low sound, like he likes it, and kisses me back. I giggle as he starts to tickle my sides, pressing my body against his. Lysar, cut it out. Why, I like it when you squirm. You're like a little rabbit, and I've caught you. He bites my ear and I let out a playful snicker. A loud crack in the bushes makes us stop. We freeze, completely immobile, changing from playful teenagers into trained killers. We didn't make that noise. Something's out here, and it's not a squirrel. Stay back, Lysar warns, instantly sobering up. He changes into a wolf and crouches down, taking a few slinking steps forward before giving a growl and jumping into the air. 
He hit something solid, tumbling behind the bushes. There's no noise afterward. My heart drops. Lysa, you okay? No answer. I sprint after him, wondering what's going on. When I see what he has in his jaws, my eyes widen with shock. Lysa, stop! I shout. I run forward, grabbing the scruff of my wolf and pulling him off his prey. It's Tomlin. Chapter 9 What are you doing here? Lysar growls. His teeth are bared, ears back. I can explain, Tomlin says, shuffling away. There's a pistol on his hip, but he's not reaching for it. You better. Lysar goes to lunge forward, but I step between them, observing the vampire prince. He's in combat gear, which is torn and coated with grime and other muck from the forest. He looks healthy, but it's obvious he's been living in the woods for weeks. What's going on? I ask slowly. Were you with my grandfather before he was captured? No, I followed Sige at a distance. Tomlin takes a deep breath. After you left, Lysandra, the castle turned into a madhouse. Dragomir started butchering everyone he thought was involved with you and Lysar. It started with the slaves, but then he started killing the servants and members of the council, too. Half the castle is lying in a grave right now. My blood runs cold. My father executed members of the house? The servants, the slaves, even some of the royal court? All because I got away. I did this, I say weakly. This is all my fault. I was selfish. All those people. It's not your fault, Lissy. You're not the murderer. Your father is, Lysar growls. And I'm not convinced that this goon isn't a spy. I'm not a spy. Tomlin shouts. And why should I believe you? Lysar asks. I'm not a monster, that's why. Tomlin rebukes. Dragomir wanted me to prove my loyalty by becoming his executioner. He didn't like that I spared Lysandra's life and decided to make me pay for it. I wasn't going to have any part of it, though. I ran away the night before I was supposed to start executing prisoners. How convenient. What a compelling and believable story, Lysar spits. Tomlin wrinkles his nose. I figured joining whatever fool cause you were part of was better than being a slaughterer for a madman. Tell us the truth, Tom. Are you a spy? I ask dangerously. Because if you are, I can't let you live. I've left everything I've ever known to be with Lysar, and I'll do what it takes to protect him. Really, Lysandra? You've known me since we were little, but we're strangers compared to you and the wolf? He asks spitefully. You need to accept Lysar and I, that's the bottom line, I say firmly. You and I are friends, that's all we'll ever be. I swear, Lysandra, there's nothing going on between us. I'm not on Dragomir's side, I'm on yours. Tomlin's gaze turns from pleading to painful. As for you and the wolf, you hurt me. Pretty badly. I was in love with you, and you kept me completely in the dark. I never knew why you didn't want me. Now I do. I still say we get rid of him, Lysar grumbles. Now that the threat is gone, he changes back into a man and immediately starts sulking. We can trust him, Lysar. I know we can, I insist. If he says he's not lying, he isn't. Lissy, he tried to kill you, Lysar reminds me. I look down at Tomlin. I know, but we have a history together, and I owe it to him to give him this chance. After what I did, Tomlin's eyes connect with mine, thanking me. I don't feel like his forgiveness is deserved. All my choice did was ruin lives, starting with Tom's. We can't bring him to the den. Lysar shakes his head. 
Dad won't let another vampire in there. If he finds out about this one, we're toast. The Alpha isn't going to find out about this, Tomlin says. I've been outside the den for a while now, and I haven't been spotted yet. Why, have you had help? Lysar snaps. He's had me. The air whooshes out of my lungs as I see Bryn coming round the bend in wolf form. Tomlin's form relaxes, as if he's relieved to see her. Lysar is currently doing an impression of an exploding geyser. Bryn, what the hell are you doing here? We've been working together. Bryn stands beside Tomlin, changing back into a girl. I found him shortly after Lys got here. I interrogated him, and after I made sure he wasn't a threat, we made an agreement that nobody else would know he was out here. We've been patrolling the area, making sure no more vampires find the den. You've been working with him? Are you insane? Lysa hisses. He strides forward and grabs Bryn's arm, dragging her back to the den. There's no way I'm letting my little sister around a- You don't get to tell me what to do, Lysar. You aren't Alpha yet. Bryn snaps back, wrenching her arm from his. This is the best way to protect the pack, and if you haven't noticed, as daughter of the Alpha, that's my job. So butt out of it. Lysar's mouth drops open, and I have a sudden spurt of respect for Bryn. Tomlin gets off the ground and says, Look, Dragomir is searching for Lysandra. Eventually he's going to find her, and you'll want me here to lure him away when he arrives. I turn to Lysar. His face is so red right now. He has a point, I say softly. Lysar's whole form is trembling. Fine. He points a finger at Tomlin. But if you even think about hurting her. Don't even go there, Lysar. Bryn rolls her eyes. You should have seen me when I found him. Guy's a weenie. I can take him. Tomlin blushes fiercely. Lysar glares at his sister, and I ask, How have you been sneaking out, Bryn? You're always around. We take turns patrolling the area for Dragomir's forces. Me in daylight, him at night, Bryn says, tilting her head at Tomlin. And how do you feel about aiding the enemy? I ask Tomlin, crossing my arms. A few months ago, you weren't even willing to consider that wolves had feelings. I don't want to help the wolves, but I also know that if Dragomir keeps running things, the vampires aren't going to be around for much longer anyway. Tomlin says. Sige said you were our only hope, Lysandra, and I believe him. You're the chosen one. You have to stop this. The prophecy says so. Bryn clears her throat to break the awkward silence that follows. So, you're okay with this? She asks Lysar. I trust you, Bryn, Lysar says gradually. I just hope you know what you're getting into. You're the one who dragged me into this, brother, she responds calmly. I'm only doing now what I think is right. Lysol makes a sarcastic noise. Whatever. I need some space. Lysol stomps off into the woods alone. I look back at the other two. You guys stay here. I'm gonna help him cool down. I have to jog to keep up with him. Hey, wait up! I skid to a stop at his side. He's angrily smacking branches and leaves out of the way. I get why you're upset, I start. Bryn should have told you about this. It was a big deal. He doesn't say anything, and I hesitate. Oh, are you upset about the prophecy? I'm sorry Tom brought it up. I'm worried that my baby sister is on an intel mission with a dangerous, unstable asshole who tried to murder his last fiancé, he says harshly. I honestly couldn't care less about the prophecy. You aren't worried about it at all? My eyes bug out. It says that I'm going to kill off every single person you care about and will send the werewolves, your family, into extinction— that doesn't concern you the least bit. Maybe it doesn't mean the end end, he offers. It could be something else. 
Really? The one who will end the shifter line comes? I repeat, because I think it makes things pretty clear. You aren't even sure if it's real. The witch could have been lying, bolstering her own place in court by promising that the new princess would stop the war that's been going on for centuries, Lysa says. It's wrong, Lizzie. It's either not true, or it's talking about someone else. He could be right. Valentina was the one who made the prophecy after all. Could she have fabricated the whole thing at my birth, to serve some purpose of her own? But then why would she? Prophecies don't lie. They have to come true, one way or another. I need a minute, Lissy, he tells me, letting out a sharp breath. Just go back. This isn't about you. I need time to think. I raise my hands, giving him space. Okay. I turn around, heading in the other direction, back to Bryn and Tom. I know a lot of girls would be hurt by Lysar telling them to leave him alone, but I'm not. I get how he is. He'll come back when he's ready. On the way back, the air grows colder, and develops a pronounced chill. I shiver, pulling my jacket closer around me. There's nothing but the silence. Silence. Wait. I come to an abrupt stop. I should be able to hear something. Birds moving, owls hooting, animals moving in the brush. Something. Instead, it's dead quiet. I know what that means. A predator's around, a big one. We've forgotten that we're outside the den and that it's not safe out here. I don't have my pistol or any weapons on me. They're all in my room back at the den. I sniff the air and a foul smell reaches my nostrils, putrid enough to make me want to retch. It's coming downwind. I whirl around, expecting to face whatever's hunting me, but something enormous slams into my middle, knocking my body aside. I cry out for help before I go spiraling through the air. When I finally crash to the ground, I groan, lifting my hair away from my face. I stare toward the tree line, into the shadows. What emerges is a monster created from the depths of hell itself. Chapter 10 It's hideous. Clumps of ratty black fur cling to grey and peeling skin, rotten with sores and infested with disease. Elongated arms hang by the monster's sides down to the ground, while long legs stretch him upwards, a curved back, exposed spine over taut skin. The head is round and bulbous, with large pointed ears and a wolfish snout. A silver scar carves across beady eyes, ending at the throat. Fangs drip saliva, while a wide nose seeps snot. The creature walks on all fours toward me, an eager shine in its gaze, licking its chops. Get away from me, I say. I scramble backwards, but that doesn't stop the monster's pursuit. He advances quickly, mouth widening in hunger. Liss! The monster backs away at the sound of Bryn's voice. She and Tomlin skid in front of me, Tom with his pistol raised, Bryn's shoulders hunched. What is that thing? I shriek. It's a haunted, Bryn says. Don't try to fight it, you won't win. Lysandra, stay back. Tomlin warns. He fires a few shots, but they miss. The monster turns on him, hackles rising. Tomlin brings out a sword and goes to charge, but Bryn holds him back. Stand down, she whispers. He'll tear you to pieces. What are we supposed to do? Tomlin hisses at her, demanding direction. I've got this guy, she growls. Bryn transforms into a wolf and then pitches herself at the haunted, snarling. The wolf and the haunted collide, and they start a vicious brawl that churns my stomach to see. The haunted and the she-wolf tumble on the ground, 
rolling over each other and trying to gain the advantage with tooth and claw, aiming to kill. Brin's only a fourth of the haunted's size, but as I watch her, I realize that she's got the upper hand. She isn't as strong as an ordinary wolf, but stronger. The daughter of the Alpha. Brin's powerful, but not as strong as Lysar. While Brin has herself latched to the haunted's back, going for the neck, the haunted bucks and throws her off, sending her sailing through the sky and against a tree. She crashes against the ground, moaning and dazed. Brin! Tomlin rushes to help her, leaving me defenseless. The haunted gives a doggish sneer and turns to me, racing in my direction with his fangs exposed. Tom, throw me your sword, now! I cry. Tom pitches the blade toward me. I snatch the hilt and slash the sword in an arc motion upward, cutting into the side of the haunted's muzzle. The haunted howls in pain before returning to its pursuit, lashing out its claws. I get the underside of its paw and manage to cut the belly, dealing heavy wounds. They're bleeders, but not enough to stop him. I can hold him off, but not for long. Lysandra, look out! Tomlin cries. I jump in the air as the haunted bites at my legs. Tomlin helps Bryn stand. She's a woman again, still confused and unable to fight. When the haunted snaps his jaws upon the steel sword, it breaks it in half. I'm left without a weapon. I look at Tomlin for his pistol, but he's refilling the magazine. It's out of bullets. Where the hell is... Lysar? My boyfriend tackles the haunted out of the way, slamming him into the ground. I fall backwards in shock, hitting my head against the side of a tree. The sandy wolf latches his claws onto the haunted and bites down roughly onto his shoulder. The haunted lets out a howl of pain before smacking Lysar across the jowl. But Lysar only changes his position and digs his fangs into the haunted's throat, ripping away at the tender muscle as the monster screams. Before Lysar can deal a final blow, the haunted shakes Lysar off his neck. He runs away into the woods, leaving a bloody trail behind. Lysar changes back, immediately scampering to my side. Lissy, I am so sorry, Lysar says, helping me off the ground. I forgot it's dangerous out here. I never should have let you go alone. It's not your fault. I hold my temple. I've developed a terrible headache. I should have known better to leave, too. There's never been a haunted this close to the den before, Lysar says. I think our original theory is right. Someone's been letting them inside. Let's go, Tomlin says, before it comes back. No, Lysar shakes his head. Let's follow it. Follow it? Are you crazy? Tomlin hisses. It's bleeding, leaving a good trail. Maybe if we track it, we can find out who it's working with. Lysar says. Good idea, brother, Bryn says eagerly. Let's go. Lysar looks at me. I nod to show I agree, grimacing as I hold my head. Lysar offers me his arm. I take it so he can help me through the forest. Tomlin complains before he follows us, and we make a quiet trail through the woods, tracking the haunted's path by large bloodstains littering the ground. There comes a point where the blood stops. Lysar motions for us to get down. We slump to our bellies, army man crawling through the brush. When we come to the top of a hill, I peek my head out through the brambles, looking down at a clearing below. The wounded haunted is down there, but he's not alone. He's surrounded by five others, who have set up a makeshift campsite with a small fire and a tent made from elk skin. The site is littered with bones and dead carcasses of human beings. Must be the locals surrounding the mountain. I immediately start to back off. Lysar could barely handle one of those things. If we're discovered, there's no way we'll be able to take six at once. Bryn and Lysar seem more shocked than I am. 
They stare down at the encampment in amazement, mouths open. This can't be right, Bryn whispers. It doesn't make any sense. Lysar shakes his head, his mouth a thin line. Let's get out of here, now. He doesn't have to tell me twice. We slink back, falling into a run once we've climbed down the hill, not stopping until we've reached the entrance of the den. Mind filling the vampires in? I ask the wolves as I observe their concerned faces. If I thought it was possible, I'd believe that Lysar and Bryn were communicating silently, judging by the worried looks on their faces. Haunted don't run in packs, Lissy. They're too hostile, Lysar says. I've never seen Haunted work together, only alone. Why are they gathering now? Maybe somebody's rallying them, Tomlin offers. Yes, but for who and what purpose? Bryn says in frustration. Whoever is bringing them together must be promising something really good. A haunted's territory spans for kilometers. Usually, they kill whoever crosses their boundaries. We have to tell Dad about this, Lysa says. There's only been one murder. Maybe we can stop other killings before they happen. Um, not true. Bryn lets out a nervous laugh. What do you mean, not true? Lysa turns on his sister, brow furrowing. With you finding Tomlin and all, I forgot to tell you why I came out here in the first place, Bryn says sheepishly. We have to go back. There's been another murder. My stomach drops. What? How? All the wolves were together tonight during the party. How could someone have gotten hurt and nobody saw it? It's a mating pair. They snuck off to be alone after the stories. Bryn says sadly. We found them behind a couple of bushes. Same thing as before, their throats ripped out, pelts slashed by claws. Lysar puts a hand to his face. That means whoever let it in had to do it before the party. The haunted who committed the murders is long gone now. Probably was the one we ran into, I suggest. We should get back. Yeah, we should. Lysar looks at Tomlin. Can I trust you not to get yourself killed out here? The haunted won't find me. I'm good at staying out of sight. Tomlin responds. Yeah, right. I forgot you're a big chicken, Lysa says flatly. Tomlin gives him a glare before saying, I'll stay behind, but I ask that I be given a moment with Lysandra. Alone. Why? So you can kidnap her and drag her back to Dragomir? Lysar's hands bunch into fists. It's fine, Lysar, I say. He won't do anything. I stare pointedly at my boyfriend. He turns into the bushes to wait a short distance away. Bryn is slower to leave, glancing behind at Tomlin before joining her brother. What's this all about? I cross my arms. I seriously have doubts that you want to be here. I don't want to be here, but there's nowhere else for me to go. Tomlin says, but I want to make sure you're making the right decision. It's already been made, Tom. You can't make me change my mind, I say. We can return to my house. My family will take us in if you're with me, Lysandra, he insists. They'll protect us from Dragomir, but I can't go back without you. They won't accept me. My place is with Lysar, and this decision is my own, not yours, I state firmly. You've been following the orders of your family and Dragomir for years. Don't you think it's time to start forging your own path? Tomlin sighs. Maybe. Listen, Tom. I grab his arm. If you don't want to be a part of this, you don't have to be. You can go and make a new life for yourself. Do what you want to do, but don't ask me to leave the wolves. I'm starting a new life here, and I'm not going back. Not ever. Tomlin's face hardens. Fine. He pulls away. But I don't know what I'm going to do now. That's for you to decide, I say. I just know that I can't have any part in it as your wife. I belong to Lysar now, and he belongs to me, you're going to have to find someone else to love. 
because I'm not it. I walk away to rejoin Lysar. There Tom goes again, trying to tell me what to do. Me not being his fiancé sure hasn't made him hesitate on stating his own opinions. On the way back, I pass Bryn. Out of the corner of my eye, I notice her and Tomlin whispering quietly to each other, voices fierce, as if they're having an argument. What was all that about? I ask Bryn curiously as she rejoins me. I can hear Tomlin setting up camp behind us, roughly, paying no attention to the noise he's making. He's just a stupid vampire, she says, huffing. It's nothing. By the look on your face, it doesn't seem like nothing, I say. Mind your own business, she says sharply, and I recoil in surprise. When we reach Lysar, Bryn changes into a wolf and runs off into the woods. Lysar watches her go with a confused expression, gesturing at her as she darts away. He turns to me, and I shrug. What the heck is up with her? He asks, jerking his thumb in his sister's general direction. I don't know, I say slowly, narrowing my eyes. If I didn't know any better, I would think Bryn and Tom are hiding something. Chapter 11 Where have you been? The words part from Nikolai's lips in a growl as Lysar and I return to the mansion, greeting the Alpha in the throne room. There's another murder and you are nowhere to be found, Nikolai barks. Why am I not surprised? Bryn already told us about it, Lysar shoots back. You don't need to make us aware. Lissy and I were just, this is why you're not ready to be pack leader, Nikolai shouts. You're too busy enjoying the foolishness of youth instead of concerning yourself with the lives of your people. I am concerned, Lysa snaps, but he flinches. I can tell the comment bit him. Then prove yourself. Nikolai points a finger directly in Lysa's face. I am holding you personally responsible for whatever happens. From now on, any wolf that loses its life to this madman is your fault, since you find yourself so eager to jump in bed with demons. The Alpha saunters away, slamming wooden doors behind him. Beside the demon comment, Nikolai didn't even acknowledge that I was here. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I follow Lysar at a distance. I know better than to touch him right now. His shoulders are rippling, like he's about to explode into a ball of fur at a moment's notice. I finally work up the courage to say something when we're back in our room. It's not your fault, I say. Your dad just wants a scapegoat to put the blame off himself. Someone is plotting these murders, and we're going to find them. Lysar doesn't respond. He just punches his pillow and jumps on the bed, lying face first. I crawl in warily beside him, hoping he doesn't bite my head off. Get a few hours of sleep, Lysar finally says. You're going to need it. Why? I ask, turning on my side. Because we're using the last of that sun lotion you have to go looking for the killers outside the den, Lysa responds. We'll go during the day, when everyone's asleep. The haunted won't be on the move then. Maybe we'll catch whoever's communicating with them in a slip-up, or we can kill them in their sleep. That's the only idea I have. You don't have to prove yourself to your dad, I insist. You're doing all that you can. Tom and Bryn are looking for whoever's letting them in. They'll find something eventually. I don't trust him with anything. And Bryn's only one wolf. She needs more help. Lysa huffs. Even if we do slaughter all the haunted, it won't solve the problem. We need to know who's betraying the pack by sneaking them into the den. Otherwise, this individual will just find other ways to kill once the haunted have been dealt with. Won't your dad get mad? What he doesn't know won't hurt him. 
I'll take a few of the younger ones. Kipcha, others, they're loyal to me, he says. They won't say anything. I nod. All right, so long as we don't get caught. Lysa turns off the light, then smacks his head down on the pillow. My brain is sorting through the possibilities of who could be helping the haunted slaughter these wolves. Sadly, at the moment, my only two suspects are Tomlin and Bryn. Why were they whispering to each other before we left? Could either or both of them have something to do with the murders? Bryn and Tom are my friends, but I've been betrayed by friends before. My heart twists at the memory of Lydia. We were best friends for ages, or at least I thought we were. If someone I knew since childhood could betray me in such a way, I don't put it past Tomlin or Bryn to do the same thing. This is war. Really, at the end of the day, you can't trust anyone. After a fitful sleep which doesn't lead to much rest, I take a shower. Lysar's up when I come out. I talked to the others. They're waiting, he says. He helps me slather on all the sun lotion that's left. We slink through the hallways and meet a group of wolves, aged sixteen to twenty, at the back of the mansion. Oh man, I can't wait to get out there, a little wolf says, raising his rear end and wagging his tail back and forth. He's the same one that stuck up for me when Nikita had me cornered. Let's go on the hunt! Calm down, Georgie, Lysa says. We're not hunting. We're looking for clues. Yeah, don't piss yourself in excitement like you did last time, his friend says, smacking the young wolf's shoulder. Georgie blushes. Shut up. Why is she here? A snotty she-wolf looks me up and down critically. If you ask me, she's the one who did it. That's enough out of you, Rosa. Kipcha growls. If we can't trust you, you can't come. Rosa sulks while I saw gestures with his hand. Come on, let's go. All of the wolves change simultaneously into their animal forms. Feeling left out, I slink down among their ranks, hoping nobody spots us. Once we're outside the den, Lysar turns to the group to delegate ranks. Kipcha, you head out with Rosa to the east side of the mountain. Georgie, you take Andrea and Elena to the west. Andre will go with Vero and Christian south. I'll take Lissy north. We'll meet back here at sunset to discuss what we found. If anybody gets into trouble, howl, and we'll all come running. Yes, Lysar. The wolves bow, then take off in different directions. Lysar relaxes, sighing in relief when they're gone. They listen to you so well, I say. Sometimes, he says reluctantly. It took a lot of whipping them into shape to get them this way. You've trained them. They're my designated guard. My counsel, really, he says. It's been decided since birth. Kipcha is supposed to be my beta when I take command. Only one missing is Bryn. I've been working with them since I was born, getting them to listen to me. Hopefully they'll be ready when my dad kicks the bucket. I watch Georgie gamble away, laughing and fumbling over his big paws, thrilled to be in the outside world. Hopefully. Lysar and I start searching the forest. Lysar gave us the area with the haunted camp so the others wouldn't stumble upon it and get themselves in trouble. But I'm still worried that a wayward haunted will wake from his slumber and stumble around right into one of the others. Did you tell them about the haunted? I ask. I told them that we ran into one last night and about the camp, he says. They know to stay cautious. Lysar looks down at his paws as he walks. Kipcha seems to think I shouldn't tell Dad, that it'd just start a riot. He deserves to know. I know, but I'm worried if he finds out it'll cause more chaos than it'll help. Can't argue with that one. Nikolai seems like a loose cannon. If Lysar told him about the haunted pack, he'd probably pull some vampires out of the cells and start executing them one by one. Lysar and I search for an hour, but we don't find anything. 
We still aren't sure how this betrayer is communicating with the haunted camp. We figure they'd have to leave the den to do so, but that doesn't seem to be the case. We take a rest by a raging waterfall that comes off the mountainside and filters into a peaceful river. It's such a beautiful, breathtaking sight. But Lysar doesn't seem to notice. We should have found a clue by now, he says. Footprints, something. Maybe one of the others did. I don't know. He glares grumpily at the river. I hate seeing him unhappy. I wish there was something I could do. Hey, Lysa! When he looks up, I reach down and splash a bunch of water in his face. He sputters, and I laugh as he tries to get it off his face with his paw. Oh, that does it, he growls. He launches himself forward and tackles me into the river. I hold my breath and go spinning under the water, grabbing Lysa and twirling with the path of the current. When we come up for breath, Lysar's transformed back into a man. He's smiling again and has a playful look about him. Come on. He grabs my wrist and begins walking me upstream, the golden sunlight reflecting off the water. When we're underneath the flow of the waterfall, he pulls me inward, taking both of his hands and parting my wet hair back. He kisses me deeply, and I return the kiss twining my hands around his hips and yanking them to me. He groans, intensifying his pursuit, lips caressing my mouth with care. The final result leaves me dizzy and out of breath. Did you like that? He asks, dots of water beating his face. Your home is spectacular, I shout over the noise of the falling water. Just like the people. Lysar drags me underneath the waterfall to a crevice underneath. He throws me onto the crevice, kissing my face, my ears, and the top of my wet clothes. His body, still warm despite the chilly water, radiates heat into my cold skin as he presses into me. This is so incredibly, blissfully romantic. I'm losing my head. I sit up slowly, pushing Lysar back, and say, Don't you think we should be doing this somewhere more private? No, much more fun in public. He grins. I laugh. Of course you think so. I shake my head. Are you okay to go back out there? Didn't the sun lotion wash off? He asks. It doesn't come off in water, only dulls with time, I say. I see. Come on. Lysar changes back into a wolf and dives into the water. I follow him, swimming after him until he crawls onto the shore. He heads into the woods. I wonder what he's up to. What are you doing? I ask curiously. I'm going to teach you how to hunt, he says. But I already know how, I protest. Not like a wolf you don't. Follow my lead. Lysar slides into the brush on his belly, and I inch onto the ground. He comes closer, leaning into my ear. You see that bird over there? He whispers. The key is to keep yourself as hidden as possible. Keep your eyes on it and don't spring until the very last second. Usually, a vampire would just compel prey to come near, drawing it inward with our natural attraction— I decide to not cheat and do it Lysar's way. I crawl forward, coming closer and closer to the bird, until I decide to spring. It flies away, sailing upward until it lands on a pine tree. Try again. I know you can do it. He jumps up into the air to demonstrate. Just like that. After about my millionth try, I finally get it right. I let the bird go and watch as it flies away into the horizon. Great job! Lysar wags his tail. With form like that, you'll be taking down an elk in no time. I look upward once more, this time to check the sun's position. With surprise, I realize that it's far lower than I thought. Lysar, it's late. We need to go meet the others. Gotcha. Lysar turns and pads away. As we walk back to the den, 
I have a strange thought. I enjoy being a wolf. I've never experienced such exhilaration, such freedom. No stuffy dresses, fancy parties, or mandates of ridiculous finery to follow. No manners to learn or rules to obey. You don't have to worry about court politics here because there's no such thing. Everyone in the pack has their rank and responsibility and knows their place. It's comforting and not as confusing as the endless betrayals of vampire court. What's so great about being a vampire anyway? I was miserable that way. I feel much more at home being with Lysar. Being like him. Did you guys find anything? Lysar asks when we rejoin the group. Everyone is accounted for, and to my relief, not hurt. Not a thing. Kipcha shakes his head. I'm not convinced the traitor is coming out here, Lysar. They're probably staying inside the den and just letting the haunted in whenever it comes to the door. The others aren't listening. They're too busy playing with each other. Rosa has flowers in her fur, and Georgie and his friends are covered in dirt. It looks like most of us spent the day playing around instead of investigating the murders. Maybe Nikolai is right. Maybe we're too young and too immature to be handling this. You're probably right, Lysar confirms. We'll start poking around the den, seeing what we can find there. Lysar leads us back inside. We split up to make it look like we're all wandering around by ourselves really early in the night instead of returning from a mission. When we pass the stockades, I get an idea. I'm going to talk to my grandfather, I say touching Lysar's arm. He might have some idea of what's going on. Okay. He gives me a light kiss. See you in a little while. I don't have a lot of time as the night's deepening, but I manage to sneak past the guards and whistle for Siege, sinking to my knees. Lysandre? His eyes are bleary as he shifts to one side of the cell. Why are you here? You could be caught. I had to ask you something. It's important. Grandfather, was Tomlin with you when you left Castel de Singe? I ask. What? Tomlin? Sige gives me a sharp look. Why do you ask? Do you still have feelings for him? No. I shake my head. I only hoped he was one of the vampires who joined you. Tomlin decided to align himself with Dragomir, Sege says. That much was obvious before we left. Hmm. If that's true, why is he outside the den now? Is his whole story about Dragomir's cruelty just that, a story to get my guard down? Oh, very well. I sit back on my feet. How are you? Is he treating you well? Sergei reaches through the bars to grab my hands. He's treating me fine, Grandfather, I laugh. I'm very happy. I'm glad to hear it, he says gruffly. Though you should be on the lookout. I've heard about the murders. Something isn't right, Lysandra. I can feel it. Do you have any idea of who might be doing this? Not the slightest clue. He leans back against the wall and lets out a breath. If I did, I wouldn't be in this cell, that for certain. It won't be long. Lysar has a plan. He'll figure this out. Don't be so eager to depend your life on him, my dear. What do you mean? My heart skips a beat. I'm concerned you're becoming too accustomed to these wolves. I know you are in love, Lysandra, but don't lose yourself in this boy. And don't forget who you are. I know who I am. I am Grand Duchess Lysandra Kocha Romanova Dracula, I say. The Chosen One, descended from Princess Anastasia herself. That is your name, but not your identity, he insists. You may like the wolves and enjoy living with them, but you are a vampire and as such can never be one of them. Don't pretend you can be. 
I do my best not to pull away. I'll try. Do not take what I say to heart, he says gently. I too have been in your position in love. I merely ask that you be careful. I will be grandfather. I squeeze his hands. I promise. And I'm going to get you out of here. Nikolai blames you now, but he won't for long. I'll make this right. Don't concern yourself with an old vampire. The lines at Sergei's eyes crinkle. Live your life. Be young and enjoy yourself. Too long have you concerned yourself with this war. I blame myself partly. I pushed you too hard. I won't be at ease until you are free, living beside me, I say adamantly. I lean in through the bars to kiss his cheek. Be safe, granddaughter. Sergei's face is sad as I pull away from him. A pit of despair weighs heavily on me as I tiptoe away from the stocks. I don't want to see my grandfather wither away in some old jail. That's not what someone who sacrificed himself for his nation deserves. He should be out here with me, not waiting to die in prison. I fiddle with my hands. Is Sige right? Am I really losing my identity as a vampire and turning my back on my heritage? My people? I'm not ashamed to be a vampire, but I can't say I was happy as one, or that I really fit in. What's so wrong with pretending to be something else if it makes me feel better, like I belong somewhere? I know Siege doesn't want me to be with Lysar. He won't object because he knows I love him, but he'll never want us to be together. He'll always be looking for the bad of it, for Lysar to slip up, to do something wrong. No matter how hard we try, Lysar and I will never win his approval. The thought of it makes tears well up in my eyes. I love my grandfather so much, but I love Lysar too. I constantly feel like I have to choose between the two of them. My spirit is heavy as I wander back to the mansion. On the way, I see a lone shadow. Someone wearing a cloak, their hood up, is making their way out the back door. Who could be up this early? I hide behind a corner, daring to peek my head out just enough so I can see. The figure looks behind them to make sure they aren't being followed. When I recognize her... My hand flies to my mouth to suppress the gasp that emerges. My back hits the wall as my mind calculates quickly. Either I'm seeing things, or the person sneaking around is Sylvia Lupuscu. Chapter 12 A month goes by before I work up the courage to tell Lysar what I saw. I spend most of my days with Lysar, exploring the village and relaxing in the mansion, sometimes with Kipcha and the others, sometimes just Lysar and me. When he's busy, I assign myself to start tailing Sylvia. I make excuses to follow her, running errands for Lysar where I purposely know she'll be, or pretending to read while she's in the same room, consulting with her court. Sometimes I'll watch out the window after Lysar's asleep to see if she leaves the den, but she never does. A flicker of doubt lies behind it all. I can't foresee why Sylvia would do this. She's the kindest, most motherly wolf I've ever met, and she obviously cares about the pack. She has no motive to kill anyone. But if that's true... Why was she sneaking around that night, anxiously watching her back as if terrified she'd be followed? In the meantime, there's no more murders. Whoever's behind them is being cautious. Bryn and Tomlin are still a possibility, though I haven't made any headway on that either. Since Tomlin's been out there, he says he hasn't seen another haunted or any signs of those working with them. At least... That's what he tells us. I take a deep breath as I wait on the balcony for Lysar to return. I can't put this off any longer. 
Holding things back from him is killing me. But at the same time, I don't want to hurt him. Accusing the alpha female isn't only serious. It's a death sentence if I can't prove her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And I have no evidence. Even worse, I don't want to tell Lysar that I think his own mother is behind all this, or have him feel he misplaced his trust in me if my suspicions prove to be false. The door opens. Here goes. Time to be brave. I turn around, taking a deep breath, but it whooshes out when I see that Lysar has a large present in his hands. For you, he says, handing it to me with a smile. Don't get too used to it. I'm not a sentimental guy. Oh, I saw. I sit on the bed and open it, tearing the wrapping paper precisely at the tape. You didn't have to. Yes, I did. I love you. He watches me unwrap the present, tilting his head. Why are you opening like that? It's the way I was taught. Don't make a mess. I look up. You're not at Castel de Senge. Just tear into it. I smirk. Okay. Eagerly, I rip off the paper and find a box. Underneath the lid is an easel with a pack of fresh canvases and acrylic paint, paintbrushes all lined up in a row. Oh. All the wind leaves my throat in a steady breath. Do you like it? He asks expectantly. Of course. I jump up, hugging the supplies to my chest with one arm and throwing the other around his shoulders. It's perfect. I saw them while I was out and thought of you. And I love watching you paint. You seem so happy. It's absolutely brilliant. I feel like I'm glowing. I'm so thrilled to be able to paint again. But then the smile slides from my lips as I remember what I have to tell him. What's wrong? Lysar asks, immediately aware that something's up. It's just, I have to tell you something. I hug the canvas package closer to my chest. Please don't be mad. Okay. His face takes on an edge of fear. What's on your mind? It's nothing like that. I... I saw your mother sneaking around one night a few weeks ago, I confess. She was alone. I wasn't sure where she was going. His scared expression gives way to relief. It's nothing to worry about. He shakes his head. She just leaves the den sometimes to get away from Dad. She's been doing it since we were little. Really? I ask, a little shocked. Yeah, wouldn't you if you were married to him? I mean, probably. Nikolai isn't really a nice person, but he and Sylvia seem so close. I hope Lysar and I's future doesn't include me running away from him just to get a break. Do you... do you think your mother has anything to do with what's going on? I can't bear to say the word murder. No way. He laughs. I know my mom. She couldn't hurt a fly. I look down at the blank canvas in my arms. It's void and white, desperate for answers. Suddenly, I get an idea. Thank you. I lean in and put my head on his shoulder. I appreciate the gift. I wish I could stick around, but Dad needs me. Alpha stuff. He gives a glum look. I know you're busy. Get your stuff done. I'll be here when you get back. I tilt my head upward and kiss his cheek. I have business of my own to take care of. I hustle to the other side of the mansion with my art supplies in hand, towards a section specifically built for the privacy of the Alpha's mate and the other females of the court. Men aren't allowed in, but I hope the restrictions don't include vampires too. I trust Lysar's judgment. He's known his mother longer than I have. But then again, maybe that blinds him to the possibility of her being a killer. When I reach the doors that lead to the outside gardens, a couple of she-wolves stop me. Sylvia peeks her head around the corner. 
Lysandra. Her face is kind. What a pleasant surprise. Please come join us. I swallow as I step into the garden. It's a beautiful place, with flowers that bloom around a marble path in a twisting pattern. Sylvia is sitting upon a stone bench, wearing a regal gown, and poised in a carefree, dignified manner. Not in all my years at Castel de Singe did I ever see anyone looking so grand. Do I really believe this woman is a traitor? To what do I owe the pleasure? she asks, taking a flute of wine from a nearby servant and sipping lightly. I wanted your help, I start, and her eyebrows raise. Lysar gave me these as a present, but I don't have anything to paint. You are welcome to stay here. The flowers are lovely this time of year. I'm sure they'd be a compelling subject. I'd like to paint you, I offer, if that's all right. Me? Her mouth opens in surprise. But there is much beauty to focus your talents on, my dear. I don't know if I deserve such an offering. Apologies, Alpha, but I would like to, I beg, if that's all right. Sylvia gives me a warm smile. Very well. I shall sit here upon the bench. Is this all right? Yes, that's perfect. I set up the easel and the canvas, mixing the paints so I can begin. I do love a girl with talent, Sylvia says as I make the first stroke. Too many of us have lost the old ways to the new. It's nice to see a young person so invested in the pursuit of the arts. Pardon me, Alpha, but it is only a hobby. Lysar has told me otherwise. She tilts her head, and her eyes glimmer, just like Lysar's do. She appears so elegant. I don't think I can capture her adequately. I'm distracted for a minute by the flow and ebb of my art, until I realize what I'm here for. I turn the focus back to conversation. I'm glad I have something to take my mind off things, I start, hoping she'll take the bait. My dreams have been rather dark lately. Yes, Sylvia's face saddens. So have mine. Has the Alpha grown closer to finding the killer? I ask curiously. No, Sylvia sighs, and I doubt he will. I know there's probably someone out there who wants to frame me or my people, I offer. I wish they would stop. I only want to live in peace. Everyone wants to frame you, child, Sylvia says softly. If my husband had his way, you and your family would have already been executed, but that doesn't mean the killings would stop. Dead end there. I keep silent for a couple of minutes, not wanting to press my luck, before I say, I'm sorry I've made all this trouble for you. Having a vampire live among you can't be easy when things have been this way for hundreds of years. And that's precisely why it needs to change. Sylvia's eyes, dark and full of conviction, catch mine. It's a good thing that you're here, to shake things up. Perhaps it will bring the others into reality, that we can't keep doing this for much longer. In my opinion, we've sacrificed too many of our loved ones to this wretched war, though my husband doesn't share this sentiment. Have you lost someone? A brother, she says. Her voice becomes thick and choked. Someone I loved beyond reason. I'm sorry. Yes, it was very tragic how I lost him. Yet we've all suffered. Her frown deepens. Lysar told me about your mother. I am so very sorry, my dear. I miss her, as we all miss those we've lost. No one can replace her, of course, but I can only hope that I can be an adequate substitute. You don't object to Lysar and I? I ask, astonished. You've changed, my son. He's happier now. That's all a mother can ask for she responds. But Lysar bonded with me, I say quietly. Certainly you wanted him with one of your own kind. It doesn't bother me, 
I have never been able to hate vampires the way most of my people do, Sylvia says. Since I was a pup, I've seen more similarities than differences between us. You're good for Lysar, and I believe he's good for you, too. I work on finishing the painting, too emotional to speak. So far, I haven't been able to find a single thing incriminating about Sylvia, except that one night. I've been following her for a month, and nothing— if she was the killer, she would have slipped up by now. Sylvia is off my list. She's been nothing but wonderful and welcoming to me since I got here. She cares about me, about vampires. It's got to be someone else. Convinced I've tied off this loose end, I turn the painting around. Ah, oh. Sylvia puts a hand on her chest, breathless. It's lovely. You truly do have a gift. You can keep it, I say. I only wanted to paint. Thank you, my dear. Sylvia rises from her seat and pecks the side of my cheek. It is a gift I will cherish from my daughter. My heart emits a warm glow that spreads throughout my body at her words. The large hole that my mother left fills and closes just a little, but it's enough to make a huge difference. Sylvia's affection has made me so emotional that I need time alone. I decide to go for a walk to clear my head. I start by circling the grounds, but after a while, I take a walk around the village instead. The sound of the moving boulder that guards the entrance catches my attention. I watch Bryn enter the den slowly, she looks around a few times before closing the border behind her and sneaking away. What's she doing outside the den? It's night time. It's not her turn to trade places with Tomlin. She's acting quite suspicious. Her face immediately reddens when she sees me. Guiltily, her eyes flash to the side. Liz, she starts. I was just... She shakes her head. Never mind. Bye. Bryn walks away from me so quickly it makes me think she wants to run. Sylvia doesn't have anything to do with this. But Bryn might. And that's what worries me. Chapter 13 Lissy, get up. Lysar pulls the covers off of me with his teeth as he's in wolf form. I groan, looking out the window. The sun just set, I moan. Why are you waking me up so early? There's a huge stack seen just outside the den, Lysaw says eagerly. Dad's called a contest. Whoever brings it down gets a party thrown in their honor. I instantly wake up. Does this happen often? Every now and then, but it hasn't lately with all that's gone on. He's probably throwing it for pack morale. If I catch that stag, the pack will finally accept me. I can't miss this opportunity. Let's go, I say, throwing on a pair of cargo pants and a long-sleeved shirt, lacing up my hiking boots. I want to see this stag. Take your jacket, autumn's setting in, Lysar says. I nab it, throwing it over my shoulders on the way downstairs. When we get outside, tons of wolves are holding around the den exit. The only ones missing are the pups and the elders, who are too young or too old to participate. You all know the rules. A familiar voice calls my attention to the front. The hairs on the back of my neck bristle when I see Nikolai prowling at the den exit in his wolf form. He's huge and black, with jaws my head could fit inside. He's easily twice the size of Lysar, nearly as large as a horse. His eyes glow red in his wolf form. I swallow down a pit of nerves. First one to bring down the stag wins, Nikolai bellows, shown by claiming the heart. The heart, I whisper to Lysar. It's the part that goes to the winner, shows they're the best, Lysar says. Ew. I wrinkle my nose. It's not that bad, 
actually tastes good. Lysa licks his chops. You're not getting a kiss later if you catch that thing. I'm gonna get it this time, guys. Georgie is next to us, and he's hopping up and down. I can feel it. Yeah, right, Andre grumbles. We all know who's gonna get it. Why even try? Dad usually wins, Lysa informs me. The stone over the entry rolls away, and I follow the group into the cavern. Nikolai gives a disgusted snort when he sees me. Good luck, a kindly voice behind me says. It's Sylvia. She changes into a white wolf, giving a wink before taking off into the woods. When the alpha female starts the hunt, the rest of the pack goes crazy, running in different directions. Lysar takes off to the east with Kipcha, and I go to head after him, before I pause. It's probably better if I go alone. Nobody will be able to claim Lysar helped me if I win. I stop and sniff. My sense of smell is just as good as a wolf's. I catch a musty smell. Deer blood pounding harshly through thick veins. I could compel the deer to come to me and take it easily, but that would be cheating. If I want the pack to see me as their own, I have to do it their way. I crouch down in the woods, creeping behind the tree line. There are wolves everywhere, dozens of them. I'll be lucky to spot the stag first. I might have an advantage, though. The stag will be on the lookout for the smell of a wolf, not a vampire. This many wolves in the area will cover my scent. I stoop down to observe large hoof prints as big as my hand. It's fresh. The deer has been here. I use the tracking skills Sergei taught me to follow the deer's maneuvers through the forest. I journey for about a kilometer. There's a rustling up ahead, and I look up. What luck! It's a red deer, a big one, ten points on its antlers at least. The buck raises his head and sniffs, eyes darting around curiously before it returns to its nighttime snack. I creep closer until I almost have it. Then a black blur springs from the foliage and alerts the deer, sending the prey scattering. It's Nikolai. The black alpha snarls and gives chase, racing after the deer. Wolf sense says to back off and let him have it. But the vampire in me whispers to take it for myself. I dart after them, weaving through the trees at a quick pace, silently so I'm not spotted. Nikolai is too immersed in the chase to see me coming. I pass him and the deer, sprinting to a beech tree that's in the deer's direct line of escape. I climb up it at top speed, inching out on a thick branch and waiting. Just as Nikolai is about to pounce, I launch myself off the branch and drop down from the tree, tackling the deer to the ground. The animal gives a groan as I loop my arms around its neck, and it attempts to scramble away. I retract my fangs and bite down hard into its jugular, severing the critical vein. The stag moans in pain. I grab its antlers and give a sharp jerk to break the animal's neck for a quick and merciful death. The stag goes limp underneath me, neck still bleeding. With caution, I step away from the deer. Wolves are gathering all around, whispering about what I've done. Georgie and some of the younger ones look excited, the adults wary, as if I've crossed the line. Lysar's practically shaking with pride. His tail wags back and forth so quickly you can barely see it. You did it, Lissy. I'm so proud of you. Nikolai is breathing heavily. He doesn't say anything, but I can tell by the murderous look in his red eyes he's livid I stole his kill. I have to write this. Immediately. I bite hard in the stag's chest creating an incision. I use my hands to tear the pelt, feeling around inside for the precious organ. With blood streaming down my hands and arms, I kneel before him, offering the heart. For you, Alpha. Nikolai raises his lip. 
he almost looks like he's about to refuse the offer, before he snatches the heart up, nearly taking off my hands as well. He swallows it in one gulp. As promised, a party, Nikolai rumbles, thrown in the vampire's honor. The older wolves relax while the youth cheer. Nikolai hunches his back and stalks away. Several of the wolves transform. Each take a limb of the stag to carry it back to the den. Lysa and Kipsha rush forward and raise me on their shoulders. Georgie sings some happy Romanian hunting song, subbing my name in for the heroes instead on the way back. When we get back to the mansion, it's in full-on celebration mode. Spirits are passed around the room as the pack feasts on the deer, which has been roasted to perfection, served alongside potato pancakes and red cabbage salad. There's a live band, and wolves are dancing to Romanian folk music, spilling drinks and tumbling against each other in a delirious, joyful fray. Everyone seems so elated. Well, not everyone. I notice Nikolai stalking about in his wolf form. He's obviously not happy I did so well. He's not the only one. His counsel sits in the corner, drinking and brooding, costing me surly looks every so often. They're terribly foreboding. You did wonderfully. A chill shivers down my spine as I feel Lysar's lips grazing my ear. They trail slowly down my neck before he spins me around to face him. His eyes beam with joy. I couldn't be happier today. Really, Lissy, he insists. Smile shining brightly. This is all for you. The other wolves have finally accepted you into the pack. Nikolai isn't so pleased, I say, my eyes still trailing him around the room. Forget about him, Lysa offers. Things are going to change around here real soon. You'll see. Lysa grabs my face and gives me a deep, warm kiss before heading off clapping the backs of those in the crowd. I sit down at one of the long tables to eat and don't notice Bryn sliding up beside me. You really made his day, Bryn says. I know. Lysa is currently parading around the room in his wolf form, leading a conga line. His friends are balancing their front paws on the hip bones of their companions, hobbling around on their back feet after him. He looks utterly ridiculous, but that's what makes me smile. Lysa isn't afraid of looking foolish in order to live his life to the fullest it can be. One of the many reasons I love him. I just hope it doesn't go to his head, Bryn comments. What do you mean? I'm concerned he thinks he's ready. Bryn's face is stone-like with dread. To lead the pack? I'm sure that's nothing to worry about. I say. Nikolai wouldn't give it to him anyway. Alphas don't have to wait for the former leader to die, Bryn says, looking at me in disbelief. They fight for the right to lead. My fork drops. What do you mean? It's settled in a battle. The only way for Lysar to become Alpha is to defeat our father, Bryn says. If Lysar challenges him, Nikolai has to accept or lose his title. Do you mean they fight to the death to see who wins? I gasp. Not to the death, not always, Bryn says. Whoever gives up first is the loser. But if Lysar relents and Dad feels like it, Nikolai has the right to kill him for challenging. It's pack law. Nikolai wouldn't kill his own son. I watch Lysar circle the conga line backwards. Would he? I always thought he wouldn't, but now that you're here, Bryn shakes her head. I don't know, Liz. But then the pack would be left without a leader. None of the other wolves stand a chance against an alpha, I say. It would pass on to me to defeat Dad. Then the males would have a competition for my hand, Bryn says. The strongest among them would become the next alpha. You don't get to choose who you marry? No, not if Lysar loses. It's something I really don't want to do. She slams her mug down. 
Not to mention I don't want to lose my brother. She puts her head in her arms. My innards sink as I watch Lysar romp around the party. Is Lysar considering challenging his father on my behalf? That would be a disaster. I know he's strong, but I'm not certain he's strong enough to take down Nikolaye. Not yet. Great job on the hunt. Kipcha comes around the corner and throws his arm over my shoulder. Congratulations, you're an honorary mutt. How do you feel? No different than I did this morning, I suppose. I chew my lip. Kipcha, is Lysar planning something? He freezes. What do you mean? You know what I mean. He pauses. It'll be okay, Lysandra. Lysar knows what he's doing. Kipcha shakes my shoulder before scooting away to avoid me and get more ale. That certainly didn't make me feel any better. You'd better talk to him if you want to stop this, Bryn suggests. You're the only one he'll listen to at this point. Lysar's grin seems to light up the mansion and all who surround him. He seems so happy, so carefree. But now I know the truth. If he wants to claim victory, he can't show any mercy. The house can only pass into his possession through fang and blood. Lysar has to win against Nikolaye, or he'll be slaughtered, and everything we've fought for will die with him, along with my heart. Chapter 14 I'm losing myself in my paintings the next day when a servant delivers a message. I put the brush down and open the envelope slowly to find that it's a note from Lysar. Lissy, meet me at the edge of town. I have a surprise for you. I fold the note into my pocket and stand up. What's with the romantic surprises lately? He seems to be full of them. I smile, wondering what it would be. I pick up the folds of my dress and hurry outside. I can't wait to see him. What is he hiding? He's leaning against the edge of a tree when I meet him at our designated spot. I look around, but there's nothing here. So what's this big surprise? I ask coyly, folding my arms. I'm quite curious. You'll see. He takes my hand. Come on, we have to drive there. Drive? I blink. Lysar takes me outside the den, down a thin dirt path that leads to the road below. Beside it, hidden, is a large garage, presumably full of vehicles. Wait here, he says. Lysar pulls out a key and enters the garage. A few seconds later, the automatic door opens, and Lysar rolls out of the garage in a red Toyota Supra with black rims and racing-style wheels. Sweet ride, I say, impressed. I slide in the passenger seat, buckling up tight. I don't drive anything slow, he says. He grips the wheel. Ready to go fast? You bet. All righty, hold on. Lysar slams his foot on the pedal, and I give a squeal of excitement as the Supra launches forward, pinning me in my seat. The Supra hugs the sides of the curvy mountain as Lysar speeds down the road, the bar on the acceleration growing higher and higher. A whirl of exhilaration flutters through my chest as the speed increases to a terrifying rate, the trees speeding by in a blur. When the car starts to redline, Lysar backs off and drives at a speed that's only slightly illegal. He chances a glance at me when the road flattens out. I'm laughing, butterflies hopping in my stomach. I feel so alive. You like that? He asks. His face is red and elated. Yes! I burst. It's insane! Insane is right. If I wreck another one of these things, Dad'll kill me. He snickers. Is he okay with us leaving like this? I don't know. Didn't ask him. Lysar smirks. After nearly an hour of driving, Lysar pulls into a parking lot beneath a large towering castle with tan walls and sharp towers that jut up to the sky. Braun Castle, 
he informs me when I give a curious look. I've never been. Neither have I. I peer upwards at the fortress. It's massive. Why are we here? I ask when he opens my door. I thought we should go on a date. A real one, he says, holding out his hand and helping me out of the car. Since we never have. Oh, I saw, that's so sweet. I have to lean back to get the full effect. Bron Castle isn't as large as Castel de Singe, but it's more regal, a national landmark. Lysar's able to break the lock, and we're inside, the entire place to ourselves for the night. We climb up the steps to enter the castle, exploring long walkways, elaborate rooms, and secret passages. When we reach the upstairs balcony, I gasp. Around us, the countryside of Romania is exposed, open to the world. It takes my breath away. Enjoying yourself at your ultra-great-grandfather's place? Lysar says, leaning off the balcony. Dracula never lived here, I say, though the inspiration for Bram Stoker's novel was taken from this location, it was briefly used as a defense against the Ottomans. It belonged to Hungarian kings before the city of Brasov gained it. It became a royal residence for the Romanian monarchy in the 1920s. I lean into him. It stayed like that until World War II. Now it's just a tourist attraction. I never knew all that. You seem to know a lot about this place, he comments. I shrug sheepishly. I've always wanted to visit, but never got the chance. Score. Lysar pumps his fist. I knew you'd like it. Good pick for a first date with a vampire. Don't flatter yourself. I hit his arm playfully. Dracula? Braun Castle? It was an easy guess. Yeah, well, he starts slowly and I sense something's coming. I wanted something to remind you of your heritage. Even if I goofed up and didn't check that this wasn't actually the real Dracula's castle before we came. What are you talking about? I ask. You just... You seem like you're changing yourself for me, Lysar says reluctantly. And I don't want that. I like you as you are. First Siege, now Lysar. Why can't everyone just let me do what I want? Changing how? I ask. You're not making any sense. Don't get mad. I know you want to be one of the pack, he says, grabbing my arm gently. But I fell for a vampire, not a werewolf. One's not any better than the other, but one of them is who you are. And I don't want you to forget that. I hold my breath, trying not to start an argument. I figure that since we're on our first date, it's best to just let it go. Okay, Lysa, I get it. Even though I really don't. Sweet, cool. He relaxes, as if he was expecting a major blow-up. When we're walking along the lake beneath the shadow of the castle, Lysa tells me to wait on a park bench. He comes back with a picnic lunch. You really thought of everything, I say, astounded. I spread out the blanket and sit upon it, taking the basket from his hands and putting it on the ground. I try. He opens the picnic basket and, to my great surprise, hands me a glass bottle of blood. Enjoy that. I had to bust my ass to find it. I'm so glad you did. I take a long drink, then start in on my pastrami sandwich. We eat in silence, watching waterfowl paddle along the surface of the lake. It crosses my mind that I've never been so happy. Did you enjoy your night at the castle? Lysar asks, lounging on his back in a carefree manner. I nod. I've had a really good time, the best day yet, I'd say. I love it when it's just you and me. But there's something on your mind, he starts. I know there is. I can't deny it. Yes. I set my sandwich down with a sigh. Lysol, what are you thinking? Are you really going to challenge Nikolai? His mouth falls open. How did you find out about that? 
So it is true, I burst. Lysa, how could you possibly think you're ready? He'll kill you. He won't kill me. If I lose, he'll let me go, Lysa says with the utmost conviction. Are you sure about that? I press. When he doesn't answer, I grab his hand. Lysa, you have to be careful. I can't stand to lose you. You're not going to. I can take him, Lysa insists. Does Kipcha think you can? What about Bryn? I ask. He says nothing. The memory of him and Kipcha quarreling in our room the first day comes sharply back to me. So that's what it was about. Kipcha doesn't believe Lysa can do it either. I believe in my boyfriend, but I don't believe in Nikolaye. If there's a chance he can remove the vampire stain on his family by killing his son, he just might take that chance. And I'd have to intervene before it ever got to that point. And I'm not sure if Lysar could forgive me for killing his father. I'm not saying I'm going to do it tomorrow, he says in a final manner. Just trust me, okay? An alpha knows when their time to lead has come. You just get a feeling. And I've had this feeling for a while. If Lysar ends up getting his throat torn out because of feelings, I'm going to lose it. Stupid wolf chemistry. Things will settle down soon, he says. The murders have stopped. Everything's fine. I don't think they've stopped. Only that the person doing them is being careful, I say. I fiddle with the edge of the blanket before blurting. Lysar, I saw Bryn leaving the den on her own when it wasn't her shift. She was acting weird and guilty. You don't think Bryn is doing all this, do you? He frowns. I don't think so. But maybe it's Tomlin, I offer. Perhaps they're working together. I did see them whispering to each other the day we fought the haunted. If she is in on it, he probably compelled her to do it, he growls. Compelling doesn't work on wolves, only humans and animals. He brainwashed her then, simple answer. He rolls onto his side. But there's only one way to know for sure. We have to spy on them. Spy? Like tonight? Why not? Lysa is already putting away our things. We wait, and if we catch them doing anything suspicious, we know for certain. Lysa drives the Supra back to the den at a reasonable speed, so the sound of the engine won't attract Tomlin's attention and let him know we're here. White sage powder, I ask when Lysa hands it to me. I always carry some with me, just in case. He dabs some on his clothes, and I do as well, to mask my scent. Lysa and I walk back up the pathway, crawling into the woods, we lie down, bellies first, on the hill outside Tomlin's camp. Tom is busy cooking something. When he's done, he eats quickly and then paces around the camp as if anxious for Bryn's arrival. When there's footsteps nearby, he hurries to clean up his camp, putting everything in an organized fashion. What is he doing? Bryn appears from around the corner and I hold my breath. This is it. Moment of truth. Hey, Bryn says. Did you find anything today? Tomlin shakes his head. Not a thing. No haunted and no other vampires. Like I said, only ones out here are us. Bryn nods, putting her hands on her hips and giving a sigh of relief. That's good. Though I wish we'd find something already. It's maddening going in circles with no clues. I don't think the murderer comes out here. They must communicate with the haunted from inside the den, Tomlin says. But how, I don't know. I still can't figure it out. Hmm, I guess that disproves my theory about Bryn and Tom being the killers. I go to leave, but Lysol grabs my arm and whispers, Wait. This is making me really uncomfortable. I don't feel like we should be spying on them if they're both innocent. But I stay put and nestle down closer in the leaves. I think we're good, Bryn says. There's nothing to worry about. Are you sure no one's watching? Tomlin asks anxiously. Bryn sweeps the area, 
She crouches downward, circling the outside of the camp. She walks toward the bushes. Her boots nearly step on my fingers as she pauses to sniff the air. It's about the longest ten seconds of my life. Bryn straightens up. Nope, no one. Thank God for white sage. I go to pull away again, but Lysar holds me firm. Finally, Tomlin breathes. He rushes forward, turns Bryn around, and plants a deep romantic kiss right smack on her mouth. Oh, my lord. I catch the murderous rage in my boyfriend's eyes the moment before he moves. I have to launch myself at Lysar to hold him back. Bryn and Tomlin stumble apart when he jumps out of the bushes. It takes all my strength to pin Lysar down, and still he's dragging me. What the hell? Bryn screams. Her face has gone pale white. What are you guys doing here? Get away from my sister. Lysar's clawing at the air to get to Tomlin. By instinct, the vampire pulls out his sword, pointing it at us. Put that thing away, Tom, or so help me, I scream. This is no time for theatrics. We can explain, Bryn pleads. Lysar, listen to me. He's panting, barely audible words. I yank him backwards and hiss in his ear. Lysar, give them a chance. Nobody gave us one. That gets through to him. He settles down and I warily let him go, though his hands are still bunched into fists. Start talking, he orders Bryn. Now. You start talking first. You were spying on us, Tomlin accuses. Why? Why does it matter? Apparently I had a good reason, Lysar barks. Lysar, I say as a warning. This was my fault, so I have got to say something. I'm sorry, Bryn. I give her an apologetic look, but after what happened with Lydia, I couldn't take any chances. Bryn's twisted expression of rage falls into one of defeat. Right, I guess I can understand that. Is this the reason you wanted him out here? Lysar snarls. So you could get some vampire loving whenever you felt like it? Vampire loving? I quote back. What exactly is that? Stay out of this, Lissy. Lysar sneers. Well, vampire loving must be pretty damn good since you had no problem getting some. I snap back. The sides of Bryn's mouth twitch. Oh, for Dracula's sake, vampire loving just became a thing, Tomlin says, slapping his head. He slides his sword back in his sheath with a clank. It wasn't like that, not at first, Bryn says hastily. We originally just started going on patrols together. At first it was awkward. But then we became friends. But then one thing led to another, and he seduced you, Lysar says flatly. We fell in love, Bryn corrects. Is it so hard to believe? Did you bond with him? Did you? Lysar screams. That's my business. Bryn crosses her arms and I don't feel like telling you. Oh, no. Lysar puts his head in his hands and moans. This is a disaster. Hey, you guys started the trend. We just followed it, Bryn says defensively. Tomlin nods in agreement. Lysar looks at me for help. I shrug. She's got a point. You can't be with him. He's him, Lysar yelps. Bryn stomps her foot. You're being ridiculous, Lysar. Tommy and I care about each other, and Tommy? He's Tommy now? Lysar's eyes bug out of his head. Tom, how do you feel about this? I ask, turning to him. The forest goes dead silent. Tomlin appears more serious than I've ever seen him, which to me is almost impossible to imagine. Brynwolf speaks the truth. I do love her. I didn't intend to, but she won me over with her charm and bravery. I want to be with her. It's the reason I've stayed in the woods this long instead of returning to my family. And you have absolutely no problem that she's a wolf, I ask skeptically. 
Tomlin hated werewolves when we were living at the castle. He even got enjoyment out of killing them. I can't believe that he's made a complete turnaround because Bryn walked into his life. Then again, the same thing happened to me. Is it impossible to think he's in the same situation? Love changes people, Tomlin says firmly. I didn't expect it to change me, but it did. And now I understand what you and Lysar were getting at. This whole war is absurd. It needs to end so she and I can be together, just like you and Lysar. What do you guys even have in common? Lysar breaks in. How do you know that this isn't just a let's get freaky in the woods thing? We have a lot in common, Bryn says. You don't know. Lysar, can I talk to you for a minute, privately? I ask. He doesn't move. After a moment of silence, he finally opens his mouth. Fine. You too. He points at Bryn and Tomlin. Just don't get caught. We weren't planning on it until you two rudely barged in on us, Bryn snaps. Yeah, well, you've done it to me, so whatever. Lysar stomps away. I hurry after him, jogging to keep up. Look on the bright side. This isn't as bad as them being murderers, I say, ducking under a branch so it doesn't whip me in the face. In fact, it's not really that bad at all. What are you talking about? It's terrible. Lysar punches a tree, and the bark cracks underneath his fist. I don't want that kind of life for her. That kind of life? Like what you and I have? I ask, outraged. Because to me, I think that's a pretty good deal. We're different, Lissy. This isn't easy, he shouts. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It's not easy, but if she and Tom are real, they'll get through it, I insist. There's nothing wrong with her being with someone she likes. Tomlin's a vampire. And what am I? I spread my arms wide. You're not like him. I couldn't trust him when he was around you. Now he's got my sister, Lysar shouts. Listen, I know Tom, I argue. If he truly does love her, he'll treat her right. He's made some mistakes, but he's not a bad person. This is insane. It's never going to work. He paces back and forth. How can you judge Bryn and Tom when we're doing the exact same thing? You're being a huge hypocrite. You honestly sound like your dad right now. I don't even know if what we're doing is right, he screams. He rounds on me, fury still in his eyes. But when he notices my crestfallen expression, all the anger drains away, replaced by guilt and hurt. Lissy, are you kidding me? Tears start pricking at the corners of my eyes. You don't think we're doing the right thing? Do you think we shouldn't be together? No, he bursts. It's not like that. I'm only saying, I've given up everything for you. My people, my home. I hate how my voice wobbles when I speak to him. I wish it could be strong, uncaring. My grandfather is sitting in a jail cell right now because of us, and you feel you have the right to say that to me? That's not what I meant. Just leave me alone. I whirl away before he can say anything and take off through the brush at a sprint, praying he has the good sense not to follow. Bryn's waiting in the cavern when I get back to the den entrance. When she sees the tears on my face, her eyes widen. I heard shouting. Did you guys have a fight because of Tommy and me? Just let me in. I sniff. Okay. Bryn puts her hand on the door and the stone rolls away. Just remember to tell someone when you get back in so they can close off the entrance, she says quietly. Right. Thanks. I run inside, scampering toward the mansion, before I realize that I don't want to go back to our room and wait for Lysar to come find me. I change directions and run around the edge of the village. I collapse against the side of a tree when I can't run anymore. Unable to hold it in any longer, I begin to sob.
Chapter 15 I'm still crying under the tree an hour later. A shadow stalks by. I try to shrivel up, to conceal my pain, but whoever is there notices. To my immense embarrassment, it's Lysar's mother. Lysandra, are you well? Sylvia stoops down and puts her arm around me. What's wrong, dear? Nothing, I blubber. I wipe my face with the back of my sleeve quickly. How dignified I must look right now. I don't really care. Did you and Lysa have a fight? She asks softly. A little one? Big understatement. There, there. It's all right now. She takes a handkerchief from her pocket and dabs at my eyes. Couples have fights. It's normal. We said some pretty terrible things, I admit. That happens too. But you can't let it get to you. She smiles at me. At the end of the day, love is worth more than harsh words spoken. Lysar adores you. He'll forget it. I hope so. I mumble. I don't know if I can forget what he said, though. You will. Give it time. Sylvia gives me an encouraging smile. Forgiveness is more important than wounded pride. I nod, swallowing the rest of my tears. Thank you, Alpha. I... Screams cut off my gratitude. A red dawn appears as a thin line in the distance. Against it comes a storm of howls and terror. Wolves are running this way and that, eyes wide as if protecting their very lives. A deep growl rings through the air, menacing and promising death. What's going on? I ask fearfully. Sylvia grows pale. She grabs my hand and yanks me to my feet. My dear, come with me. We must get inside. I pick up my skirts and flee with her, rushing directly into the mansion. I immediately worry for Lysar. Is he all right? I never should have left him alone. A black shape launches itself in front of us, skidding across the grass and rounding on us with sharp teeth. It's a haunted, the same one we fought in the woods, the one with the scar over its eye. I have a few seconds to wonder how it got in, before my stomach turns into a pit. I realize I forgot to ask someone to close the den entrance behind me. I pull Sylvia away just before the haunted snaps its jaws on her arm. She falls backwards. I lift up my skirts, ripping a dagger from the sheath on my calf before I start circling the haunted. After our last encounter, I've learned never to go anywhere without a concealed weapon. I look closer at the haunted and realize it's a male, a masculine monster waiting to devour us alive. The haunted has put himself between us and the doors. There's no way around. This is my fault. It's my job to take care of it. Alpha, stay back, I warn. I launch myself at the monster, raising the dagger upwards. He lunges back, lashing out claws toward my throat. I duck out of the way and land the dagger fiercely into its side. The monster yelps and kicks me away, but I roll on the ground, slashing the tender ankles. The haunted's legs buckle, and he hisses, dropping to all fours. The dagger wound I dealt isn't phasing him. I go to stab again, but the haunted knocks the dagger out of my hand and charges at me with a furious roar. Without a weapon, I use the only defense I have left. I retract my fangs and launch myself at the haunted, digging my teeth sharply into his shoulder. I have to force myself not to gag. He tastes rancid. I land another bite as the creature howls, clawing at me with its humanoid hands to get me off. A large paw wraps around my middle and tosses me aside. I land on the ground with a woomph, the air knocked out of me. I try to get up, but the throw has me dazed. Through blurry eyes, I watch as the haunted turns his attention to Sylvia. Sylvia, change! Fight! I scream. She's frozen, 
unable to move as the creature advances on her. Pure fear shines through her gaze as the haunted raises himself up to his fullest height, snarling as he stares down at the alpha below. I reach for the dagger, but I won't be able to get to her in time. The wolf queen's going to be murdered right in front of me. Just like my mother. No! I scream as the haunted launches upon Sylvia. She raises up an arm in defense and the haunted slashes at it, cutting through the skin. She cries out in pain, and the wolf's mouth drips saliva, ready to consume his next kill. I go to scream again, but another wolf knocks the haunted out of the way. Lysar is in his wolf form, and he's got the haunted on the ground, Bryn right on his heels. The two wolves tear into the beast, muscle and flesh flying as it screams in utter horror. Lissy, get out of here, Lysar cries in a panic. He doesn't look good. There's a gash on his head, and it's bleeding thickly, soaking his face and dripping into his eyes. I can't leave you, I protest. Though I can't find an opening, everywhere I look is claws and fang. Go, Lissy. The blood begins to flow even more heavily into Lysar's eyes. I've got this. Sylvia still can't move. At least I can do something with her. I run to her side, hooking my arms underneath her and dragging her inside the mansion. Servants flock to us when I bring her in, and they help me set her on the couch, rushing off to grab medical supplies. Alpha, I whisper, why didn't you fight? Sylvia, white-faced, doesn't say a word. It appears she's in shock. I immediately set to working on her arm. It's all right, Alpha, I say. I wash the cut before bandaging it tightly while the servants apply wet cloths to her head and force her to drink water. You're safe now. Yes. Her mouth quivers as she says the word. Stay with me for a bit. She clenches my hand tightly. I hold it, praying soon that Lysar comes back. Eventually, the screams grow quiet. The servants stop looking out the window, and a guard enters, blood coating her pelt. The chaos is contained, Alpha, the guard informs, though three wolves were killed and countless injured before the haunted could be stopped. Three wolves dead, all as a result of my foolishness. I put a hand on my mouth to stop the screams that want to spill out. Was the haunted killed? Sylvia asks in a pitched voice. She shakes her head. It appears he got away, Alpha. Sylvia's body sags. Very well. What of Prince Lysar? I ask, leaning forward anxiously. What's happened to him? Ask me yourself. When Lysar enters the room accompanied by Bryn, my mind loses it. I let go of Sylvia's hand and tackle him with all the force I have, wrapping my arms around him tightly. I'm okay, Lysar whispers, and he gives me a gentle kiss. I can tell by the look in his eyes that all is forgiven from our fight earlier. When tragedy happens, stupid things like arguments don't matter. I grab a spare cloth and wrap his head to stem the bleeding for now. We almost had him, mother but he slipped out the door just before we could nab him, Bryn says in frustration. I'm sorry. It was better you didn't, Bryn Wolf. I don't want my children anywhere near that thing, she says shakily. I've got to go help the pack, reset the perimeters, help the ones who are hurt, Lysa says quickly. Bryn, can you stay here and do damage control? Bryn nods. You got it, brother. Lysar's attention, so valuable, so needed, is on me. Wait for me in our room, please. His fingers brush my arm lightly in a goodbye. Just like that, they pull away, and I'm watching him fade as he leaves to join Kipcha and the others. The servants help Sylvia stand. Shakily, she proceeds toward her bedroom. I need to lie down, girls, she notes. It's been quite a day for me. 
Take it easy, Mama. Bryn gives her mother a kiss on the cheek before she leaves. I watch the Alpha closely. She went from a caring, strong figure to a weak old woman in a matter of seconds. I feel so sad for her. Perhaps the war affected her permanently in previous years, and as a result, she can no longer take any violence. I know how she feels. I'm only eighteen, and already I'm tired of it. This is my fault, Bryn. My words tearfully bubble up as I sit beside her on the couch, feeling totally broken. I forgot to make sure the door was closed. I was too upset. It's everyone's fault. You left the door open, but Lysar shouldn't have blown up on you, and he wouldn't have done that if Tommy and I had been honest. She sighs. Is it worth being in love if it kills other people? I ask, miserable. Maybe we're cursed. I refuse to believe that, Bryn says, looking at me. Us being with the people we love might have started all this, but the haunted are committing the murders. Death by war, by murder, old age. It's all death. Might as well take some enjoyment out of this pitiful world while we still can, where we can. I know it's not any of my business, but have you and Tom... The question falls from my lips. We haven't slept together, not yet. Bryn shakes her head. I know I freaked out when I discovered that you guys did, but now that I'm in the same situation, I totally get it now. I'm just afraid of the repercussions. Plus, I don't think we're ready. I get that. I pull my knees up and set my chin on them. There are a lot of repercussions. Have you and Lysar done anything since you got here? No. I shake my head. Just kissing, stuff like that. We haven't been able to go all the way again. Do you mind if I ask why? It's complicated, Bryn. I start picking at a stray thread on my dress. I can't even understand my own feelings half the time. Well, then that's the problem. You're doubting your heart, she says. What? I raise my chin off my knees. You always try to talk yourself out of being with people who you're in love with, Bren says. It's a habit of yours. I'm temporarily flawed. That's not true, I say, baffled. My saw's the only person I've ever loved. Maybe truly loved, but I know you had feelings for Tommy too, Bren says. And don't try to deny it, she adds as I open my mouth. I know you're crazy for my brother, but you felt something for Tomlin before he came along. But instead of letting it happen, you got scared and pushed what you had with him away. I go to protest before I realize she's right. Tom wasn't more than a crush, but if Lysar hadn't arrived, it definitely could have turned into something more. Yet I had locked him out before I'd even given him a chance. Why? I love Lysar but there's a shield up filling my head with doubt. Whenever the littlest thing goes wrong, my mind goes into survival mode. It's a protective mechanism installed after my mother's death, grown under the harsh treatment Dragomir bestowed upon me, and reinforced by Lydia's betrayal. No matter how good love feels, I can never put my entire heart into being with anyone because there's always something telling me not to get my hopes up. I've learned to count on the worst and expect to end up alone because that's all I've ever known. It doesn't make any sense why I would be this way. After all, I risked my life to hide Lysar while he was in the castle and nearly starved to death trying to find him in the woods when I didn't have any evidence he was still alive. That's proof enough that I believe in us. And honestly, after having the best few months of my life being here with the wolves, I don't see how life could be worth living if something were to tear us apart. So why do I still have this repetitive mantra circling over and over in my head, warning me not to care too much? It's not like believing that he's going to abandon me will make it hurt any less if and when he does. 
That's why it's so hard to be with him. Physically and otherwise. If I can't stop comparing him to the people who've hurt me, our relationship isn't going anywhere. I shake my head. If Lysar and I are going to survive, I have to get rid of these thoughts. They're not doing anything for my relationship, and they're certainly not bolstering my self-esteem. I've got to break this cycle before it breaks us. You're right, Bryn, I say. I do try to talk myself out of loving people, even when I know it's exceptionally unreasonable. I'm not saying that I don't know why you do it, Bryn says softly but it's not getting you anywhere but further into a hole, and I don't want to see you guys stuck in a situation you can't climb out of. He really loves you. I twist the leather cuff on my wrist. Yeah, I know he does. I let out a determined huff. Will you help me, Bryn? Figure out a way to stop this? I can try. She twirls a strand of hair around her finger. Do you think your fears are real? They feel real. But logically, with everything I know about Lysar, they don't seem plausible. I bite my lip. There's just so much about our relationship that people say is wrong. I don't care much about what others think, but after a while, it starts to weigh on you. When you're brought up to hate the person you're in love with, it feels like you're doing something wrong by being with them. I know how you feel on that one, Bryn mutters. That's something I don't have the answer to. I know what me and Tommy are doing is right, but that doesn't take the bad feelings away when we're together. You know Lysaw means everything to me. No matter what happens or how bad things get, I'm never going to leave him. I'd die defending him. But that's not enough. You can't be constantly looking over your shoulder your entire life, waiting for him to leave, Bryn argues. You have to trust him. Trust him. The words sound small coming from my mouth. Bryn ruffles my hair, and I blush, embarrassed. I trust Lysar to take care of me. I trust him to watch my back in battle, to make sure nobody hurts me, and to always be there whenever I need him but trust that he won't break my heart. That's something I haven't trusted with anyone. Despite all my efforts to protect myself, I still got hurt several times over the course of my life, and the memory of pain is much fresher than the recollection of joy. Do you ever have doubts about you and Tom? I ask. All the time. Her lip twitches. But I don't allow them to take over. You've got to go after it, just like you would an enemy or something you need to kill to survive. These thoughts are actively trying to threaten your connection with the person you care about the most. Something like that can't be allowed to survive. It must be obliterated. Just like the pack mantra. No wonder wolves have such strong relationships. Anything that threatens the connection with your mate should immediately be torn apart, Bryn says simply. Even your own thoughts. But we're not married. I know in the eyes of the pack we technically are. But we haven't had a wedding or a formal ceremony or a legal contract. We don't even have rings, I say, frustration welling up inside me. By vampire law, we're not connected in any way. I don't even know what we are. Maybe that's what you guys need to talk about, Bryn offers. You've been trying to live like a wolf, but you're a vampire. You can't deny what you are. I want to be one of the pack, I argue. You are one of us. Forget what my father says, Bryn insists. There's nothing about yourself you need to change to be with him. I let my gaze fall. I hope so. I just wish all these negative thoughts would go away. Don't tolerate them, Lissy. Bryn's eyes flash. I know you're scared to let my brother in, but you guys need to communicate about everything. I think you can trust him a lot more than you think. 
I nod again, this time definitively. You're right, Bryn. Thanks again. For everything. Don't worry too much about it. Lysar will surprise you. She gives me a wink. Big dumb brute he is. My eyes are closing. Bryn leans back on the couch and says, Go get some rest, Liss. There isn't anything you can do right now. Are you worried about Tom? I ask. She wraps her arms around herself. Yes, but I can't go to him right now or we'll get caught. I just have to hope he can take care of himself. He can, Bryn, I reassure her. He's a good fighter. She gives me a weak smile before dropping her head. I trail up the staircase and let my dress fall to the floor when I enter the room. I slip into bed wearing nothing but undergarments, exhausted. My dreams are full of darkness and death. A few hours after dawn, a warm body slides in beside me. I've been awake for a little while, tormented into waking by nightmares. I turn on my side and Lysar draws me close, wrapping his arms around my body and crushing me to him. I can hear his rapid heartbeat through his bare chest. I'm sorry we had that fight. I didn't mean it. His hand strokes my hair. I lost my temper and shouldn't have. I apologize for taking it out on you. I forgive you. I nestle my forehead into the crook of his shoulder. What you said hurt, but I said some awful things too. I didn't mean what I said earlier, Lizzie. I'm just scared. His arms constrict, pulling me in tighter. I don't know what's going to happen to us. I don't know what's going to happen to us either, I whisper. If someone's not pulling us apart, we're running away from each other. Sometimes I want to run away, he confesses. But then I always stop to wonder what would be the point of that, because nothing could be worse than being without you, no matter what we're going through. Me too, Lysa. I'd pick a life full of hardship with you over being comfortable and on my own any day. I breathe deeply to inhale his fresh, woodsy scent. He buries his face in my hair and we stay quietly like that, almost so close we're sharing thoughts. Loving him is so natural. It's easier than breathing, something I don't have to think about, but something that, if I resisted to do so, would suffocate me and cease my existence. So many people in my life have died, but to me, death is living without love. Lysar has opened up so many doors in my life, caused me to see things I never could on my own. Without him, I'd still be a brainless zombie carrying out my father's orders obediently as he sent me to kill wolves one by one on an assembly line. I'd be trapped in a life of servitude and misery until I was killed or Dragomir killed me. Without Lysar, I'd still refuse to see wolves as people, even though I've come to know them as my equals and even some of them, my family. He saved me, even when I didn't know I needed saving. I shift closer. Lysar starts to kiss me, and I kiss back. The kisses start slowly at first, but then start to grow in intensity and passion. He touches a place he hasn't in months, and I roll on top of him, caressing his chest his shoulders. My hair falls around his head, and his eyes take on a peaceful expression to a place where he's waiting to meet me, and has been for a long time. Right now, we're the only two people in the world, and that's what I want. Just when I relax and start to think we're getting somewhere, there's a knock at the door. Prince Lazar, are you there? What is it? Lysar groans, irritated at the interruption. The magical safe moment breaks. I roll off of him, flopping back on the bed as the insecurities come rushing back, foiled again. 
Light breaks into the room as the door opens. Apologies, my prince. Your father wants to see you immediately. He insists you bring the Grand Duchess. Can't he wait until nightfall? Lysol moans. Everyone's asleep. Pardon me, my prince. He said to tell you it isn't a request, the servant says firmly. You and the vampire princess are to come immediately or be dragged out. When Lysol glances at me, his eyes are full of fear. Nikolai, he wants to see me. He knows I'm the one who left the entrance open. It's all over. Chapter 16 Lysar is furious. He stalks down the stairs with his head down, fists bunched, as if ready to head into a fight. Every muscle I have is on high alert. I'm much more poised to flee than fight. My intestines twist themselves into knots the closer we get to Nikolai's summon. Lysa, don't do anything stupid, I whisper when we reach the first floor. If I do anything, it's only what needs to be done, he says. There's a red look in his eyes, one of a raging wolf fighting to get out of a cage. He's going to lose his head. He can't. We can't lose each other now. Not after everything we've overcome. I try to grab his hand, but he shakes it off. There's no stopping him. If Nikolai goes to make a fatal move, I'm stepping in. Damn pack law. I refuse to let Lysar die for a mistake I made. The sight of Nikolai, even in his human form, standing in front of the large fireplace within the throne room, feels like chains tightening around my neck. He turns when he senses our arrival and opens his mouth to yell, but Lysar gets there first. I won't come crawling to you when you call like a pup, Lysar spits. I'm my own wolf now. Nikolai strides forward. Lysar plants himself in front of me, but Nikolai forcefully pushes him out of the way, sending his son flying into a coffee table. I want to help him but I'm too terrified of the impending doom coming right at me. You, Nikolai growls. The vampire bitch. It only takes him seconds to cross the room. I think he's going to hurt me too, but he merely stops in front of me. Alpha, I'm sorry. I instantly fly to apologies. I hate begging, but I'm not above it if it means sparing Lysar and myself. Lysar is picking himself up from the fragments of the shattered coffee table. Shards of glass are sticking out the sides of his arms, blood trickling down his arms slowly. He seems shocked that Nikolai actually put his hands on him. Three wolves were slaughtered because of you, Nikolai screams. The Alpha Queen nearly died because of you! Spittle from Nikolai's mouth lands on my cheek when he roars. His shoulders are shaking, mere seconds from the change. If he loses his self-control, I won't be able to defend myself. Vampires aren't easy to kill, but Nikolai knows how to slaughter my kind. It was an accident, I whisper quietly, voice quivering. There are no accidents when it comes to the safety of my pack. Nikolai bellows. You left the door open. You let a haunted right into the den after I trusted you to keep it safe. You didn't trust her with anything, Lysar says through a bleeding lip. He spits out a globule of blood before adding, you've always hated her. Stay out of this. Nikolai rounds on Lysar, eyes narrowing. His attention turns back to me, and he adds, I would like to know why you left the den in the first place. It was my fault, Lysa snaps. I was the one who convinced her to leave. This vampire is leading you away from your people, Nikolai shouts. As the prophecy that was foretold about her makes clear, the only ending this relationship can have will result in death for our race. There will be no such thing as happiness 
when this draws to a close, son. Only when death claims those you love and you are left heartbroken and alone will you realize you've been a fool. My mouth opens to defend Lysa before my stuttering lips close. Nikolai won't listen to anything I have to say. Hatred for my kind is blinding him. She's my mate. My responsibility. Lysa hisses. He finally clambers off the floor, shoulders back. Whatever consequences there are for tonight falls on me. Lysa directs his attention to me. Let's see, return to our room. I'll come along in a little bit. I expect Nikolai to object, but he doesn't. Only waves a dismissive hand and states, The vampire is yours to order and command as you please, son. She is your mate, after all. The knuckles in Nikolai's hand crack loudly. But you are mine, and I will make you see reason. I saw. The word squeaks out. I don't want to leave him. Go, Lissy. Lysar's gaze doesn't leave his father's as he commands me softly. Now. There's a scratching noise behind me. I don't dare turn around, but my ear catches an anxious whining, high-pitched and mournful. It's Bryn. She's at the door to the throne room, and it's locked. Lysar's eyes are insistent. My legs, made of gelatin, aren't my own as they maneuver me back to the stairs. Nobody below me moves as I climb. Each step is taken slowly, tentatively, hand skimming the mahogany railing, caressing its smooth exterior. I'm desperately searching for something to keep me grounded while every molecule within me is screaming panic. It's only when I enter the upstairs hallway that the yelling resumes. I attempt to block it out, but it rings louder in my ears as I'm walking farther away. I wince when I hear something else breaking below. A chair, another piece of furniture, I don't know. I make the decision to turn back as I round the corner to our bedroom. But it's too late. Something moves within the dark shadows. Five wolves most of them in their middle age, are waiting for me. They're not friendly. The fangs are bared, fur standing on end as they proceed toward me. I reach for the dagger on my ankle and bring it out, gripping it tightly in hand. But it's not enough. I can't take all of them. Not alone. It only takes me mere milliseconds to figure out that this was Nikolai's plan all along. The Alpha never wanted me to join the pack. He was only waiting for the right opportunity to order my execution. My mistake tonight gave him the perfect excuse. I can't change Nikolai's mind, but perhaps his followers can be convinced. Please don't hurt me, I say. I didn't leave the den open on purpose. It won't happen again. The pack doesn't give second chances, a wolf mutters ominously. You have killed six of our own kind. That is six too many. I'm not responsible for the murders, I insist. Please give me a moment and I'll explain. We need no explanations. Nikolai was very clear. The wolf says hatefully, The vampire must die. Chapter 17 the wolves spring at me, all five at once. Instinctively, I roll out of the way and slash the dagger upward. It catches one wolf on the chest, another on the snout. They yelp and back away, but I still have three others to deal with. One wolf latches onto my arm, fangs sinking into skin, while another goes for my leg. The third hurtles himself into the air, jaws wide. I scream, stabbing the dagger into the wolf's chest. He recoils away, gasping at the large hole I've made in the muscle. I hit the wolf who has me by the arm on the temple and kick the wolf who's got my calf as hard as I can. The wolf I kicked spirals into the wall, and the one I've hit stumbles around, dazed. 
The others are picking themselves off the floor, circling around me. My back's to the wall, so I can't escape. What I've done hasn't deterred them. It isn't enough. Come on, I snarl. If you're going to kill me, I'm going down fighting. The wolves move in. I grip the dagger tightly, ready to take at least a few of them with me. There's a vicious snarling. A brown shape leaps over the barricade of canines, sliding in front of me. Bryn. There's a flash at my side, followed by a great, blinding light. To my vast surprise, the witch Shioni appears, her hands glowing with a white and powerful magic. Both women root themselves in front of me, immovable statues against a relentless hatred. Bryn Wolf, get out of the way! The enemy growls. This is the will of the Alpha. I am the daughter of the Alpha, Bryn growls. You will listen to what I have to say or be forced to face my father when he discovers you have killed his heir. His heir? My face blanches. That means the pack no longer considers Lysa a suitable leader. What has happened to him? Shioni. Are you certain you wish to align yourself with these traitors? A she-wolf rasps. I protect the wolf princess, as I have since I was a child, Shioni says darkly. I follow Bryn's orders above all others. If she takes the side of the vampire and you attack her, I'll have no choice but to deal with you in the only way you understand. Shioni's magic glows even brighter. The eyes of the opposition are wary. They know that taking on Bryn, me, and a young witch all at once gives them terrible odds of winning. You won't be able to stop us forever, Bryn, a wolf mutters as he finally turns away. Eventually, the vampire will come to meet her fate. The others follow, disappearing into the dark. I collapse against the side of the wall. Bryn transforms into a human, holding me up. Liz, are you okay? Her eyes are dark with concern. Lysa, what's happened to him? I ask. My whole body is shaking. We have to get you to safety immediately, Bryn says, ignoring my question. Shioni, is she hurt? It's all right, Shioni says. She takes a look at the wounds on my arm and leg, eyes narrowed. They're not too deep. She's very lucky. You're willing to help me, I say skeptically, spitefully. The vampire. Witches have served both vampires and werewolves for centuries, Shioni responds. Though I've grown up with the pack, I don't see that you've done anything deserving death. She hovers her hand over my leg and arm. The bite marks begin repairing themselves instantly, until they're gone completely. It's probably best for her to wait until Lysar gets back, Shioni tells Bryn. If she leaves now, it'll be too disorganized. So he's alive, I breathe. Yes, he'll come for you as soon as he's crawled out of whatever corner he slunk off to. Bryn's voice is thick and hurt. He's a little banged up right now. My entire body goes rigid and cold, colder even than my natural temperature permits. It wasn't your fault, Bryn, Shioni says quietly. I tried to stop him, Shioni, but I couldn't. Her hand hangs. It's over now, Shioni tugs on her arm. The best thing we can do is get the Grand Duchess somewhere where she'll be safe. Without my consent, Shioni and Bryn drag me to my room. They escort me inside, frantically checking if any assassins are hiding within. That was a bold move, setting the pack on you, Shioni says. Nikolai is getting desperate. I believe the attack on the Queen tonight made him feel he lost control. I've never done anything wrong, save for be born a vampire, I say. It's something I can't help. If I can't change their minds, I'd change myself if I could. They're old and prejudiced. They don't change, Bryn spits hatefully. She goes to the balcony, looking over it. 
I have to get to Tommy, tell him what's happened. She only knows, I ask, with a surprised glance at the witch. I tell my handmaiden everything, Bryn says. She only shrugs. It doesn't bother me. Love is love, as I've always thought. I have to go, right away. Bryn changes into a wolf and looks at Chioni. I only have a short amount of time to get to Tommy before Nikolai notices I'm missing. The fact that she didn't call Nikolai her father is something that's not lost on me. Whatever happened after I left Lysar, it had to have been awful. I'm going to guard the door until Lysar gets back, Shioni notes, and probably even after. Be safe, Bryn. You too. Bryn looks to me. Stay here, Lys. Lock all the windows and doors. My brother will be along soon. Both women exit. I lock the door behind Shioni before rushing to close the windows and balcony entrance. As a second thought, I decide to push the couch in front of the glass walkway doors just in case. When there's nothing else I can do to fortify the room, I flop down on the bed. As the minutes tick by, my anxiety lengthens. Lysar wouldn't dream of taking this long to return to me unless he was really hurt or unable to move. What did his father do to him? Surprisingly, I find that exhaustion and worry are enough to push me into a few hours of uninterrupted sleep. It's dark again when I awaken, but Lysar still isn't back. I'm about to head out to look for him myself. Safety be damned. When the door opens again, a man stumbles into the room and falls on the floor. I gasp, skidding to my knees to help him up. To say Lysar looks bad is an understatement. Blood is matted on the side of his face, the result of multiple bruises and cuts. One eye is black, swollen shut, a tooth is loose, and his clothes are torn. A dark bruise is spreading over his middle, a telling sign of broken ribs. Hey. Lysar's voice is raspy, thick. He glances to the side, tilting his head so his good eye can see. You put the couch against the balcony? What, thought someone was going to come in here and steal you? I laugh darkly, tears marring the humor. You and the silly jokes. I put my arms underneath him, but when I touch him, he gasps out in pain. I let my arms fall to my sides uselessly. I want to help, but I don't know where to grab him. Just let me do it. Lysar crawls, literally crawls, to the bed and pulls himself up onto it. I sit beside him, watching as his face contorts in pain. Lysar, what did he do? I ask. What do you think he did? He beat the shit out of me. Did you challenge him? I ask. I couldn't, Lizzie. His fingers gripped the sheets tightly. I really wanted to, but I wasn't in the right frame of mind. If I challenged him right then, I wouldn't have been able to focus, and I would have lost. I just let him do it. I think back to when Dragomir hit me. At the time, Lysar told me a wolf would never consider doing the same thing to someone they cared for. Family, he said, means everything to a wolf. Perhaps that's why he's so shaken. He never thought Nikolai would go so far. I'm big enough to stop him. I always thought if he ever put a hand on me, I'd fight back, he says. But it's different when you're actually there, in the moment. I raised my hand to hit him... I just couldn't do it. Not because I was afraid, but because I didn't want to hurt my dad, even though he was hurting me. I nod. I know exactly what he means. Has he ever done anything like this? No. He's never hit any of us before. Not me, Bryn, or Mom. Not anyone in the pack. Lysa's shaking, which is why it's so hard to believe now. It just happened. But even after the fact, I'm having trouble believing it's real. I wish I could have been a wolf and not a vampire, I mourn. He would have treated me different, and you wouldn't have gotten hurt. I thought he was different. But now that I look back, 
Not really. The only reason he hurt you is because I'm here. He wasn't abusive until I arrived. No, Lissy. He was just hiding it. That side of him has always been there, Lysa says spitefully. People like him don't just turn violent. He's always been fair and kind to us, but now I realize it was only because we always did whatever he wanted. We followed his orders, so he didn't see a reason to hurt us. Lysa sighs. Now that he's not getting his own way, he'll resort to whatever means he has to do to keep us in line. I'm so sorry, Lysa. You didn't deserve this. It's my own fault. I idolized him too much to see who he really was. Now his true colors have come out. My veins are burning with a liquid fire. An image of Nikolaye appears in my head foolish and evil and powerless against me as I drive my dagger into his heart repeatedly until there's nothing left inside his chest but a bloody mass. I want to make him suffer, make him pay for foolishly believing that he could dare raise a finger against Lysar and get away with it. I want to kill him. I always considered him a good dad, but he's got to have control. Lysar rambles on. I'm barely listening. If he doesn't have power, he loses it. With a groan, Lysar gets off the bed. He hobbles toward the dresser, cradling his arm until he rips open one of the drawers, tossing things into my backpack. Lysar, what are you doing? I ask. Grab what you need. We're leaving. Lysar is limping around the room, throwing things into my backpack. Leaving? Yep, we're running away. Running away? Yes, are you a parrot? Come help me. Bryn and Shioni mentioned this, but I wasn't sure if we were actually going through with it. Everything starts tumbling around my ears. Lysa, we can't go, I say. We can still stay here. There's a chance we could work things out. Are you crazy? Look, we chose to stay last time and look what happened. Lysa says. Dragomir caught us, and we nearly lost each other. I'm not going to let that happen again. He makes a very good point, but I'm not willing to back down now. I'm not going to make you give up your home. And what about me? I just became part of the pack. I belong now, and I... I can't protect you here. Lysa turns, and I'm shocked to see there are tears welling up in his eyes. It doesn't matter that I'm the son of the Alpha. They want your blood on their hands. His desperation and agony is shocking to me. Where is my brave, playful Lysa, full of laughter and cheer, the eternal optimist? The answer is made clear. Nikolai has beaten that out of him. Tonight, the Alpha killed a part of Lysa that I desperately loved. I can't let that happen again, not for any consequence. Lissy, I just want to go away. The tears that he held back so strongly are beginning to fall down his face. I want to be in a place where there aren't any werewolves or any vampires, where there's just you and me and nothing getting between us. We don't have to live like this. We can run away, get the hell out of here. We don't have to stay and do this anymore. It's killing us. I begin wiping the tears from his face. Love is strong enough to power through anything. Yet there are some circumstances in which if love is not allowed to thrive, it will wither away to a slow and painful death. This is one of those situations. If we stay, the pack will eventually kill us or drive us apart. Lysar's right. We have to go to a place where none of these barriers matter where we can be free. Okay. I bend down and start filling the pack. I'll be ready in five minutes. Lysar relaxes. I pack only the essentials and help him dress in heavy, fresh clothes. I think about the weather. Winter is right around the corner. Lysar and I are going to have to head to somewhere warm if we're going to hide in the wilderness, maybe even leave the country. 
When we step outside our room, Shioni is there. The hallway is curiously absent of anyone else. I've cleared a path and used my magic to put some of the wolves to sleep. Bryn and Tomlin are waiting at the den entrance for you to arrive. She informs us quickly. What about you? Lysar grimaces. I'll find you, I promise, Shioni whispers. She puts her hands upon Lysar, and I watch as her white magic works through bone and skin. Everything heals, save for some of the superficial stuff, like the scratches and his black eye. That's all I can do, Shioni gasps. My magic has hit its extent. I've repaired your ribs and the worst injuries. You'll be able to fight if need be. Thanks, Shioni. Lysal gives her a tight hug. I appreciate everything you've done for us. Shioni gives us a sad smile before vanishing in a mist of white smoke. Lysar and I sneak through the mansion. On our way, we find many wolves asleep, caught under Shioni's spell. It'd be a great time to have that invisibility potion, Lysar grumbles. Yeah, I curse whoever took it. We hold our breath when we reach the bottom of the stairs, but no one spots us. Lysar's face appears so haunted. There are so many people he's not able to say goodbye to. Kipcha, his mother. I know it's not my fault that his father is driving us out, but I can't help but feel I caused everything to happen. While traveling to the entrance, my eye catches the stockades. Sergei. I can't leave him. Lysar knows what I need before I even ask. Let's go, but we gotta hurry. We slink around the back of the stockades. There are two guards standing watch, but Lysar takes one and I the other. We knock them both out, dragging them behind the building and stealing the keys. Sergei glances up at the jingling noise when we sprint to the cell. Lysandra, what are you doing? Sergei looks confused and a little frightened. The vampires behind him shiver in the cell. We have to go. Our welcome has worn out, I tell him quietly. I unlock the gate and the other vampires stand. Follow me. Sergei and the other vampires stay close by as we sneak around the outskirts of the village, taking sanctuary in the darkness of the woods around it. We're forced to pause when a few pups run by but they leave quickly. There's the den entrance. We're almost there. I step out into the moonlight, eager to taste that first moment of freedom. Lysar joins me, the other vampires behind him. It's only twenty or so meters away. Yet as we take another step, we are greeted by a terrible sight. My stomach pitfalls as Nikolai emerges from the woods an army of wolves behind him. Sylvia is near, her hot arm bound, weeping soundlessly. Just as I thought. Nikolai's voice carries across the no man's land, echoing throughout the camp. Lysar, you are entirely too predictable. I believed I had taught you better, but it seems I was wrong about many things. Nikolai knew that we'd try to leave if his minions failed to kill me earlier. How stupid could we have been? Nikolai let us through, Lysar says, but the threat carries no weight. He's terrified. This has gone on for too long, son, Nikolai cries. It's time to correct your mistake. He changes into a wolf, and his upper lip raises to expose the long fangs below. Permanently. The entire pack emerges from the village to see what all the commotion is. Whispers run wild as the wolves gather around us in a circle, trapping us in. Sige crouches downward to defend me, but I catch his arm. There are too many werewolves for the old war general to take down, even with our help. There's nowhere to go. We're caught. Chapter 18 The den door behind Nikolai opens quickly. All hope within me seeds as two guards drag in Bryn and Tomlin. 
they didn't even get away. Our friends are going to be killed alongside us all for nothing. Nikolaye, what are you doing? Sylvia asks weakly. Her face has gone paler than before. She clutches the front of her dress like she's going to have a heart attack. Both of our children have betrayed us, Sylvia, Nikolaye says, spreading a hand to Lysar and to Bryn. They have fallen under the allure of blood-sucking spawn. But recently I've come to see that it isn't their fault. They are trapped within a spell they cannot escape. Nikolai rolls his shoulders. They'll come to their senses once these vampires are killed. Nikolai's gaze narrows as he turns in my direction. Let's start with the one who began it all. The black wolf, monstrous and desperate for an imagined vengeance, stalks toward me. His paws pound into the earth, a march that sounds my death. I'm not willing to stand here like a zombie until Nikolai rips my throat out. I only have seconds to calculate if I should grab my pistol or my dagger, but as I'm reaching for both, Lysar knocks me down. He then transforms into his wolf form, rearing on his hind legs. Son, get out of the way! Nikolai bears his fangs, circling back around. I, Prince Lysar Lupuscu, challenge you, Nikolai, to a duel for the title of Alpha. Lysar snarls. Here and now. Do you really want to do this? Nikolai lets out a cruel cackle which causes my bones to shiver. The sound seems like it came from hell itself. I thought you'd be feeling sore. Refusal means you forfeit. Lysar's hackles aren't coming down. What's it gonna be, old man? The insult sends Nikolai reeling over the edge. I accept. I thought I taught you a lesson earlier but it seems I'll have to break more bones. I saw, Sylvia shouts, reaching out her hand. Brother! Bryn screams. The cries of both women are lost to the wind as both of the snarling wolves collide. My saw scratches at his father's face, batting Nikolai's head to the side, but Nikolai makes an easy comeback, pushing Lysar down with brute force and slamming him back to the ground. Lysar wiggles out from underneath, using his back legs to kick his father roughly in the gut. Nikolai roars and launches forward, but Lysar throws dirt into his eyes. The Alpha is temporarily blinded, swinging his head back and forth. Lysar sees his chance and launches himself onto Nikolai's back. He digs his teeth into Nikolai's shoulder, pulling out fur. He gets a few bites in before Nikolai rolls to the side, and there's a loud crunch as Lysar is caught underneath him. The crowd groans and I gasp, but Lysar shakes it off and gets right back in it, ripping a tear in Nikolai's chest and haunches. Nikolai's eyes are wide. They betray a hint of fear. He knows this is entirely different than before. Now that I'm in danger, Lysar is willing to fight back. When Lysar gets a little too close to Nikolai's neck, the Alpha goes into survival mode. He slaps his son upside the head with a large paw, and Lysar stumbles backwards, dazed. While he's stunned, Nikolai looms over him. Nikolai digs his teeth into Lysar's back. He starts shaking him hard until my wolf becomes little more than a blur, yelping in pain. He's going to break his spine. Instinctively, I move forward to protect him, but Sergei grabs my shoulders and holds me back. To stop the fight is to kill him, Lysandra. Sergei whispers, stay back. I bite my lip, wincing as Nikolai slams Lysar onto the ground. Nikolai darts forward and tears into his son, several bites in quick succession. In one horrible long moment, Nikolai places his jaws around Lysar's throat. It's done. Nikolai's going to break his neck. I put my hands over my eyes, unable to watch. There's a loud yelping. 
but it doesn't sound like Lysaw. I unveil my eyes and see with relief that both of the wolves are dueling again, caught in a battle too quick to follow. I didn't see what happened, but somehow Lysaw got the upper hand. Nikolai loses his balance. He stumbles backward, and as he does so, Lysaw sees his chance. He pounces on top of Nikolai's body, holding the Alpha's shoulders down with his paws and pressing his fangs to his father's throat. Time itself ceases in the unimaginable moment. Wolves inch forward to hear what Lysaw has to say. Stand down. Lysar's words are muffled against Nikolai's fur, gasping and ragged. The chests of both wolves heave up and down. No one moves. You won't do a thing, Nikolai gasps. I am the Alpha. I will kill you. Lysar's brown eyes, once so human, don't have any humanity left in them anymore. He is an animal intent on preserving only one thing, the future of his family. Nikolai's eyes dart back and forth nervously. He hesitates, but Lysar pushes his fangs deeper and Nikolai cries, Yes, all right, I relent, I relent. Lysar is the new Alpha now. Lysar finally lets up. He climbs off his father to dead silence. He looks behind him to make sure that Nikolai doesn't try anything before limping back to my side with a hurt paw. He's missing chunks of fur and he's bleeding heavily from several places. He looks nearly as bad as he did before. But this is different. They're the wounds of a warrior not a victim. Take him away and lock him up, Lysa says, for attempted murder on the life of the alpha female. The pack looks to me instead of Sylvia, and the reality hits me like a dead weight. I'm the new alpha female. The reality that I'm now responsible for an entire pack of werewolves already wears heavily on me. I look to Siege and he puts a hand on my shoulder. Without question, a few guards come forward and start dragging Nikolai off to the stockades. He goes without a fight and without any words. The word of the Alpha is law. Let them go, Lysar says, looking at those holding Bryn and Tomlin. Immediately. The guards unhand them. Both Bryn and Tomlin say nothing, only glance around at the still crowd. The tension is unreal. Everyone's poised at attention, as if unsure what happened or what to do next. Somebody say something, I think, anything. Kipcha is the first one brave enough to come forward. He raises a fist in triumph and cries, Hail the new Alpha! Hail the new Alpha! The pack cries in a unifying chant. Lysar changes from wolf to man. With a limp, he steps forward and cries, A wolf is nothing without the pack. The pack is nothing without the wolf. United, we sacrifice so we may live. Divided, we wander until we die. The pack repeats back. All around us in a massive circle, Wolves bow lowly to the ground, their eyes averted. Even some of the vampires are bowing. Astounded, I turn in a circle, unable to believe this is actually happening. Lysar's expression doesn't change, but his shoulders relax. As the wolves rise to their full height, Lysar motions his counsel forward. The group of young adults pad forward. The only one of them who seems confident is Kipcha. The rest look very young and inexperienced compared to the resentful members of Nikolai's old council standing in the crowd. It's time we sorted this all out, Lysar shouts. Someone has been letting a haunted in the den. It's not a vampire, but one of our own. If you come forward now and are honest, I promise as Alpha that I will judge you fairly. 
but if you remain in the shadows and I have to hunt you down, no, there is no suffering you can imagine that will compare to what I have planned for you. For a moment, nobody comes forward, and I think we're getting nowhere. But then, someone does come forward. She shuffles to the front of the circle, looking down in shame. Mother? Lysar gasps. Yes, son. Sylvia gives a defeated sigh. It was me. Chapter 19 You'd expect an uproar at such an admission, but all that emerges from the pack is stunned silence. If anyone is moving, I don't hear it. I don't think anyone even has the sensibility to breathe at the moment. Lysar is pale. He's completely still, his eyes flickering from his mother to the ground. Bryn sags in disbelief in Tomlin's arms. Even my mind is whirling. How could my poor Lysar be betrayed by both of his parents in one night? Lysar steps forward, his mouth thin and taut. Explain. Sylvia holds her hurt arm and says, Some of you remember my brother Vasile. We were extremely close growing up, and he was a friend to many of you, including Nikolai. I'm confused. What does her brother have to do with this? But a light comes into Lysar's eyes. Something has become clear. Sylvia's face darkens. Vasile was an excellent soldier. He went on a secret mission long ago to spy on Dragomir and his soldiers. He didn't return for many months. We told the pack he died, but that wasn't true. What became of him was a fate worse than death. Sylvia's voice is starting to wobble. Even with her confession, I want to reach out to comfort her, but my feet are glued to the ground. While on the mission, Basile became desperately hurt by vampires. Gravely injured, he crawled to a safe place, knowing he was near death. He needed sustenance to preserve his life, but he was too weak to hunt. A human ventured near, unaware that my brother was nearby. Left with no other choice, Vasile took the human's life and consumed his flesh. The human's life force sustained him enough that he could return to the pack. The pack's eyes are on Sylvia as she begins to circle, no, pace madly about the open space. Basile swore if he ever had to take a human life, it would only be the one time. But the curse had already taken effect, and my brother wasn't strong enough to resist the pull. He craved human flesh more and more until eventually he caved and killed another human. By this time, it was too late. Basile eventually began slaughtering entire villages to stop the cravings, and soon the transformation was complete. He transformed into a haunted, something he swore he'd rather die than become. Some of the older pack members are beginning to mutter now, no doubt shocked that the wolf they once knew became a demon. I'm hardly surprised. Evil though we see ourselves above it, has the potential to infect and overtake anyone. When Vasile returned to us, he believed he could join us again, even as a monster. But my husband was disgusted by him. Sylvia's face sours. I begged Nikolai to give Vasile a chance, but he didn't listen. Nikolai fought Vasile and cut a scar across my brother's face, marking him in exile. He chased Vasile beyond the pack boundaries and warned him never to come back. An image sharpens in my head. The wolf with the scar on his eye. That was Vasile. No wonder Sylvia couldn't fight back. Even though he threatened her life, she couldn't bear to hurt her brother. I wanted to give Vasile a second chance. I believed I had one after Princess Lysandra arrived. 
Sylvia gestures to me. I thought, now that Lysar was attempting to make peace with the vampires, that things could change with the haunted, too. She shakes her head. I was wrong. Vasile killed one of our own seconds after I opened the door. I believed the first time was a mistake, so I stole an invisibility potion from Lysandra's room to help him escape. She glances again to me. I'm sorry, my dear. Keep going, Lysar says slowly and gently. What happens next? As I said, I thought the first death was an accident, Sylvia continues. But when I let Vasile in the second time, he killed two others. In the short time we spoke, I discovered that he's been gathering haunted within the woods outside, waiting for the perfect opportunity to lead them in and take over the pack. The pack starts screaming. Yelps, howls, and cries gather collectively into a panicked symphony. Lysar gives the pack a look, and they settle into a nervous silence. This is all my doing. Vasile now lurks just outside the den door, waiting for it to open, or for me to be foolish enough to allow him in again, Sylvia says. Nikolai was right. Vasile's not my brother anymore. I only wish I had realized it years ago. Sylvia looks to her son. I accept whatever punishment you cast upon me, Lysar. Many wolves are dead because of my ignorance. It's my fault for this mess, all of it. There is nothing too harsh for me. Treason! One of the wolves bursts from the side. He's an old one his face marred with rage. She killed our own. Give her death in return. My daughter is dead because of her. She needs to pay for her actions. Another one cries. Execution! The pack begins roaring with insults and jeers for their formerly beloved Alpha Queen. Sylvia doesn't flinch at their hatred, just accepts it as if she deserves it. The young wolves around Lysar seem cowed, unsure of what to do. But there's resilience on Lysar's face. He holds up a hand and the pack goes quiet. My mother is responsible for the murders. She has brought chaos and grief into our pack, he says. She brought a haunted into our home as a result of misguided love it doesn't excuse her actions, but it does show that there was no malicious intent. Lysol continues. I'm not able to pass adequate judgment. Not tonight. My mother will be held prisoner in her own quarters until I am able to decide a fair punishment. He nods to the gods. A few wolves step forward and escort Sylvia away. The fallen queen hangs her head downward as they take her to the castle. Her face has a visage of utter peace, as if she's at least glad it's all over. Bryn's crying. Lysar doesn't look like he's too far from it. Please, Lysar, be strong. I will him. You can't show weakness now. Lysar rubs his face with his hand quickly. Then he straightens up and says, Listen to me. There's a haunted pack nearby the den. Vasile is leading them. I know haunted have never worked together before, but they are now, and we can't allow it. We need to go out there and take them down. I understand we've all been through a lot, but I need every wolf out there. If you can fight, join me at the den entrance at sunset tomorrow. We'll make sure Vasile and his pack never harm our family again. The pack nods giving a jumbled but unanimous agreement. Lysar turns to me and the vampires. General Sergei? Lysar adds. My grandfather raises an eyebrow and Lysar says, If you and your vampires help us eliminate the haunted, you will be granted your freedom. Do I have your word you'll work with us and not against us? Sergei's eyes appraise him from top to bottom. I'm impressed that you risked your own life to save my granddaughter's young Alpha. 
Your battle against Nikolai was unlike any I've ever seen. We will follow you into battle, as long as no harm comes against one of our own from the pack. Do we all agree? Can we get along? Lysar shouts. He spreads his arms wide, and the wolves cheer loudly, their rage hardening into bloodlust and a yearning for justice. Then prepare for battle, Lysar shouts. At sunset tomorrow, we attack. Chapter 20 Lysar's arms are crossed firmly against his bare chest as I slam my dagger down on the bedside table. My hair whirls around my face as I turn around and snap. I'm a better fighter than ten of your wolves combined. You need me out there. I'd be useful in this battle. Why can't I go? Because I said so. Deal with it. Lysar's arms stay crossed, his entire body rigid and immobile. Even though we're fighting, I can't help checking him out. I don't know if this is sexy, sexist, or just plain infuriating. And since when are you the boss of me? I raise my eyebrow. I thought you said you needed everybody out there to fight. Everybody but you. If something happens to me, you're all the pack's got, Lysar insists. Like they'll listen to me, the vampire. I roll my eyes. You're the alpha female now. They'll listen to you, Lysa insists. Look, if I don't come back, someone has to decide what to do with mom. And you're the only one I trust to make a good call. Lysa drops his gaze, and a twinge of hurt emerges within me. Lysa took Sylvia's betrayal so much harder than he took Nikolai's. He's been so sad since. Lysar, I'm so sorry. I put my hands on his arm. I know this is hard. If I don't kill her, I have to exile her, Lysar says. And I don't want to do either. I don't want you to go into this battle without me. I can do this. I know I... Lissy, please don't. He uncrosses his arms and cups my head with his hand. I don't want you getting hurt out there. Now that I've lost mom, I can't lose you too. Just stay behind. He gives me a kiss, hopefully not our last, before changing into a wolf, padding out the door. He turns around at the last minute, points at me with his paw, and says, Stay put, or when I come back, I'll beat your butt. I'm about to make a wisecrack about how that's not really a punishment before he vanishes. No time for jokes right now, I guess. When I see the last of his sandy tail round the corner, I make an irrational and impulsive decision. I'm totally not staying behind. I watch out the window. Sergei and the rest of the vampires are rallying around the door with a collection of wolves. When Lysar arrives, he leads the way out. It takes a really long time for the entire company to leave. When they do, the village looks practically deserted. Lysar ordered those unable to fight to board themselves up inside their homes in case something goes wrong. Well, if he thinks I'm going to hole myself up in here and work on my knitting until he comes back, he's crazy. I ruffle through my bag. Thankfully, my battle uniform was one thing I didn't forget to pack. I slip on the bulletproof leotard and tie on my combat boots, slipping my dagger and pistol into the right compartments before walking out the door. To my great surprise, I encounter a surly, brown-coated she-wolf in the hallway. Bryn, Lysar's making you stay behind too, I say, baffled. He's trying to make me stay behind, but it's not going to work. She wags her tail. I came by to see if you'd like to join me. Great minds think alike. I grin. Are you worried about what your brother will do when he sees us? He can't put his whole family in jail, right? Bryn jokes. She picks up the pace, bouncing on her paws. Let's pick up Tommy on the way. He'll want to go. We're not hanging out. 
We're going to war, I reply. We're killing haunted, which sounds fun to me, she replies cheerily. Bryn is the happiest I've seen since her mother was arrested. I think she wants to take out her pain on something that caused the whole situation in the first place. Unfortunately, I feel like if Bryn wants to do that, she should attack me first. I've got my own guilt surrounding the situation. I know Sylvia let the haunted in, but she wouldn't have considered it an option if I hadn't arrived. My idea that the wolves and vampires could get along spurred her to think the pack could have sympathy for haunted, too. I haven't spoken to Lysar about this, because I know he'll tell me it's not my fault. I'm not sure. It's something I have to work out on my own. Tomlin is in the courtyard when we arrive. He's dressed in his tactical gear like I am, and carries a rifle, an impressive step up from the pistol he usually arms himself with. Hello, girls, he says. I assumed you were coming. Ready to go? Why didn't you go with everyone else? I ask. The Alpha isn't too fond of me, he replies, and I'd much rather stay by Brynwolf's side. The two of them ogle each other fondly. Yuck, I hope that's not what Lysar and I look like when we're together. Bryn opens the entrance, and soon we're in the woods. I can hear the battle. It's not too far away. Come on, I say. The haunted pack is this way. I follow the noise, tracing the path Lysar and I took when we found the haunted pack for the first time. We crawl on top of the hill and look down the embankment below. Wolves are battling intensely with dozens of haunted, pairing up in groups to take the monsters down. Already I can spot the bodies. The battle has barely started, but I can already tell it's costly. Below, I spot Sirge with a horde of his vampires circling a haunted. Sirge charges forward with his saber, slashing the sword outward. The saber pierces the side of the haunted, creating a gash in the side of the creature, intestines peeking out. Grandfather pounces on the haunted's shoulders, wrapping his free arm around the head of the creature and pulling it from the monster's neck, using the saber to slice the muscle free tossing the dismembered head into the bushes. Obviously, he's got it handled. I try to pick out Lysar within the fray, but I don't see him. My heart clenches in worry. Don't worry, Bryn. I won't leave your side, Tomlin promises, drawing near to her. You're better with the rifle, Tommy. Stay up in the trees and take them down as I lure them to you, Bryn informs him. I won't go too far. I'll go down and pick off the ones who are almost dead, I say, pulling my dagger out. I charge down the hill and launch myself at a haunted who a couple of wolves have surrounded. I slash the knife across the throat of the monster, and it goes down quickly, blood spewing from its throat. The wolves around me cheer, but I pay them no mind as I launch myself onto the next haunted, gutting it across the middle like I saw Sirge do, before plunging the dagger into the heart of the next. Both creatures give a painful moan before falling, twitching once or twice, before finally they lay still. Over the gunfire, I hear the loud shouts of Tomlin's rifle blasting. Bryn darts throughout the battle, teasing the haunted and luring them into the right position so Tom can take them down. The haunted pack starts to back against the edge of the clearing. The wolves seem like they're getting excited, but I'm wary. Something about this whole fight is off. Lysar, Bryn, Tomlin and I had trouble taking down one haunted by ourselves, and I've dispatched three in a manner of minutes. It's too easy. It's like the haunted want us to win. With a quick glance around, I notice that Vasile is nowhere to be found. Then, just over my shoulder, I spot someone moving in the bushes. We're being monitored. Curious as to who is behind all of this, I creep up the embankment, keeping myself out of sight of whoever is up there. When I get to the top of the hill, 
the shadow spots me and bolts. I break into a run and dart in and out of the trees as the figure tries to escape. I'm getting close to catching him until a painful yelp catches my ear. I don't even have to look to know it's Lysar. He's caught in the jaws of a haunted. The monster is shaking him back and forth in its mouth while Lysar scrabbles for an escape. If I help him now, I'll lose the chase. But the choice is obvious to me. I abandon the hunt and go to help Lysar, sliding down the hill with an angry yell. I plunge the blade in between the shoulder blades of the monster and rip downward. The haunted howls pitifully, dropping my boyfriend. With an opening, Lysar reaches up and grabs the haunted's throat, tearing it out. I thought I told you to stay behind, Lysar instantly says, blood dripping from his mouth. His voice sounds angry, but his eyes twinkle with a delighted amusement and thankfulness. You're welcome, Lysar. It was no trouble saving your life, I shoot back. Oh, you are gonna get it later, Missy, Lysar says. His hips waggle back and forth as he looks at the battle. But since you're here, care to join me? Of course. Lysar and I launch ourselves back into the fight, but there's really no need, because we've basically already won. It doesn't take long to clear out the rest of the haunted. Eventually, the ones that are still alive give up, and Lysar's council heads after them, chasing them out of pack boundaries. Everyone bring the injured to the infirmary and meet back at the Great Hall, Lysar calls over the fray. We have won this fight. The pack cheers loudly in victory, but I'm not so sure we should be celebrating yet. I open my mouth to tell Lysar what I saw, but Lysar's counsel blocks our path, taking his attention away. The haunted are gone, Alpha. We were able to head them off toward Bucharest, Rosa informs him. The satellite pack there should be able to take care of the rest. But Vasile got away, Georgie says, bummed. It's okay. We ran him off, Lysar says confidently. He knows better than to show up around here again. Lysar, I don't think... My voice trails off when I see Sergei limping our way. Grandfather, what happened? I'm fine, just a little hurt. Sergei grabs his pant leg with his hand and lifts the limb. I can see torn flesh peeking through the ratted fabric. Just give me a bit of blood and it'll be healed by morning. You've upheld your end of the bargain. The vampires are free to leave. Or join us. Lysar says. I'm fine with either. We shall stay with the Grand Duchess as we promised, Sergei vows. He stumbles to the side. I reach out to catch him before he falls. Come, Grandfather. I hook my shoulder underneath his arm and bolster myself under him while Lysar takes his other side. We help him limp up the path to the den. Lysar's jabbering on about the battle and how well it went but I'm not listening. Lysar thinks we've won, but I know the fight has only begun. Someone is out there in the woods, watching. If my instincts are right, they've orchestrated this entire thing, and it won't be long before they make their next move. We're still in danger. This is far from over. Chapter 21 Back in the Grand Hall, the wolves are already partying. Large barrels of ale are rolled out between the tables and uncorked to the joyous howls of the wolves. Free from their imprisonment, vampires huddle along the edge of the wall. They haven't quite joined the party and are keeping to themselves, but some of them are in polite conversation with the wolves. It seems everyone is getting along well. Shioni is working on Sergei. She attempts a spell to knit the flesh together, and when that doesn't work, wraps his leg with a thick white cloth. It's the best I can do for now, Shioni tells him. My magic has been strained lately. It's all right, Sergei says, moving his leg away from her. It'll heal. 
Grandfather has the right to be wary of witches after Valentina's betrayal. I'm grateful to Chioni for all her help, but I don't know her well enough to trust her yet, so I don't judge Grandfather for doing the same. From her cloak, Shioni pulls out a few bottles of blood. Astounded, I slide next to her. Where'd you get that, Shioni? Special order. She smiles and hands Siege the bottles. For if we won tonight. Thank you so much. I curtsy to her, and she nods, sweeping off to join the wolves in a game of whist. Sige drinks the blood, and I sit beside him, uncapping a bottle of my own and setting to drink. Where is your wolf, prince? Sige asks. He's already drained half the bottle. He must need it. I'm not quite sure. Lysar slipped away the moment we got here. I wonder where he ran off to. Kipcha's walking by, two tankards in each hand. I reach out and snag him by the back of his jacket. Kipcha, a word? I ask. Kipcha turns on his heel and saunters towards me. What's going on? During the battle, I saw someone moving in the forest, I tell him. Lysar seems a little distracted. Can you keep an eye out for anything suspicious? He nods. Always. Then he grins. Though Lysar has good reason to be distracted right now. I get that the battle with the haunted is on his mind. That's the last thing he's thinking about. What do you mean? I cock my head to the side. You'll see. Humming a Romanian folk tune, Kipcha prowls away. I shake my head. These mischievous wolves, always up to something. Bryn and Tomlin are bold enough to kiss on top of a table in front of everybody. My lord, they're all over each other, I think. Not me. That's something I'm too cowardly to do. Sige's lip curls at the display of affection, but he opens a second bottle of blood and doesn't say anything. You can tell some of the older wolves and vampires are a little disgusted by it, but nobody shouts or does anything. Obviously, a vampire and a werewolf kissing is still out of place, but it's no longer a cardinal sin. It makes me a little jealous. Lysar and I had to fight like hell to get the pack to accept us. I'm happy for them, but at the same time, I wish it had been that easy for us. I finally spot Lysar at the head of one of the long tables. He's currently chugging a tankard that Kipcha shoved in his hands, though it doesn't look like he's enjoying it. Curious, I lean in, straining to hear over the noise. For courage, man. Kipcha slaps him on the back. Yeah. Lysar gasps, blinking a few times, then says, Wish me luck. I sit back and pretend that I wasn't watching. With one hand in his pocket, Lysar says, Lissy, you want to come with me? Sige raises an eyebrow. I set the bottle down and take Lysar's hand. Um, sure. His grip is warm in mine as he leads us away from the party. I look over my shoulder at Lysar's counsel. They all look like the cat who ate the canary. I decide not to ask him what's going on and play along. He takes me up the stairs and goes to a quiet spot on the upper floor overlooking the grand hall, abandoned by everyone but us. I glance down at the celebration below and find that many people are watching us expectantly. Lissy, he starts, and I bring my attention back to him. He's holding both of my hands tightly, and his own quake with a bit of nervousness. Things are really turning around for us. Now that I'm Alpha and the haunted pack is taken care of, I figure now is the perfect time. Lysa, what do you want to say? I ask slowly. He takes a deep breath. The thing is, I... Screams catch my attention. I look away and see that the grand wooden doors are opening. I try to peek over the ledge to see what's going on, but Lysar pulls on my hands and I'm drawn back. 
Hey, stay with me. He gives an unsure smile. Lissy, I wanted to ask if... Lysar closes his eyes as the yelling increases in intensity. He gives a huff and adds, Couldn't have one moment, could I? Something's going on. I let go of his hands and grab the railing on high alert. I knew this party was too good to be true. Great, guys. Perfect timing. Lysar mutters. He's really agitated. I go to say something, but my concern over Lysar's annoyance rushes away when I see that there's a vampire standing in the center of the grand doors. The face that plagues each of my waking moments shatters through my subconscious and into a horrible reality. It isn't enough to say a chill runs up my spine at that face. No, that face is fear, plunging terror and disbelief into every pore of my body. No, it can't be. Lysa, I have to lean on the railing to hold myself up. It's him. What? Lysa lunges to the railing. He hangs over it, face crumbling into despair. Oh no. My worst nightmare has come true. At the entrance of the Grand Hall is Tsar Dragomir Romanov Dracula, an army of vampires at his back. Chapter 22 Well done, daughter. I could have never done this without you. Dragomir's face is set in a cruel grin. How many nights did I believe I would never again see that monstrous face? Too many. I was a fool. Below, the pack is frozen with shock, utterly confused. Me, I'm stuck on the balcony. This is impossible. How did he find us? I'm not going back. Not now, not ever. He's going to have to kill me. I bunch my hands into fists and walk down the steps, willing my body to show defiance despite great horror. Lysar strides beside me, shoulders hunched, willing to change at a moment's notice. You won't take us easily, I threaten. I stand before Dragomir and his vampire horde, making myself a boundary between the wolves and him. There are too many of us. We are an equal match against your forces. My daughter, if I was intent on attacking the den, I would have done so already and not forsaken the element of surprise, Dragomir says. Don't think me stupid. I swallow. You're right. There's something else you want. A witch, wrapped in a red velvet robe, appears from within Dragomir's masses. Listen to your father, Lysandra. Cast aside the foolish dreams of youth and come to reality. Valentina, I snarl. Choosing words as your weapons, since the potion that takes away the shifter's power shattered out of your clumsy grasp. The witch remains emotionless. Lydia is working on producing another batch as we speak. The potion will be ready soon, and we'll be able to turn it against the wolves once it is. However, I doubt we'll need it after tonight. Your magic can be countered by my own. Another voice raises over the crowd, and I witness Shioni stepping forward. Bryn is beside her along with Tomlin, who looks how I feel. He'd suffer a painful death if it meant saving himself from Dragomir's chains. I mean what I say, Shioni shouts. If you have a potion that causes shifters to be unable to change, I will find a counter curse and let it rain down upon you, after I find the cure to set the shifters free of your dark spell. Valentina surveys Shioni for a second, obviously scrying her, before she gives a cruel laugh. You call yourself a head witch, yet your powers are vastly surpassed by my own. Sit down, little caster, before you hurt yourself. 
she only stands her ground. Dragomir waves his hand and says, Enough of this nonsense among witches. I have a proposition. I am willing to forgive you, Lysandra. You have become a powerful vampire. I believe my absence from you has only made you grow stronger. Come back to Castel de Singe with me, and I'll spare your life and Tomlin's. Perhaps I'll even consider letting your grandfather off the hook after he's received due punishment for his traitorous actions. His dark eyes seek out Siege. And kill Lysa and the rest of the pack as a trade? Never! I hiss. As you wish. Dragomir turns. However, I think you'll want to reconsider. My jaw drops when two wolves emerge from the crowd of vampires. Freed from their imprisonment are Nikolaye and Sylvia, both in their shifter forms. Sylvia looks scared, glancing from this way to that, while Nikolaye's face is determined and raw. The former Alpha takes a stand beside Dragomir, while Sylvia looms at a distance, unsure. What are you doing? Lysa asks, frightened. Nikolaye doesn't answer him. Dragomir straightens and says, The Grand Duchess knew that we were tracking her movements after she fled Castel de Singe. We followed her to the surrounding area, but lost her and her grandfather's forces after they mysteriously disappeared. Obviously, they were brought within the den, but we could not seek it out. As luck would have it, we stumbled upon a haunted who knew the way in, a beast by the name of Vasile. No, I gasp. Lysa grasps my arm, and Sylvia hangs her head. Long tears drip from her eyes to the end of her nose, spilling onto her white pelt. This haunted knew where the den was. He had recently been granted access after his stupid sister thought he could change his monstrous ways, Dragomir continues, getting glee out of Sylvia's pain. Together, we formulated a plan. Vasile would gather the haunted he knew, promising them blood and money in exchange for working with him. When the time was right, Valentina cast her spell upon the haunted's forces to compel them to fight and kill as many wolves as they could, yet still lose the battle in order to lure the pack into a false sense of security. It was you, I whisper. You were the one following us, watching us. Indeed, daughter, and you fell into my trap perfectly. Dragomir's fangs glitter treacherously in the light of the flames, roaring in the grand fireplace. Your forces are weakened, Lysandra. You cannot expect your tired soldiers to fight against my own. And what of the haunted? I insist. Have you cast the ones living aside after you've used them for your own purposes? We've decided to make a temporary peace with the haunted. After all, their enemy is now our own. Dragomir's mocking smile only gets bigger with each statement, as if he knows every word is a blade twisting in my gut. And it is. The haunted have joined our side against you, Lysandra. The world I can offer them is much more than they ever dreamed. During this war, they will be given a feast off the bodies of the dead, able to hunt freely among the human masses. Under my dominion, the world will be reshaped into a new order where vampires will rule over all. We have the power, don't you see? Witches serve us. Humans are weak compared to us. The haunted are willing to ally themselves with us. The only things standing in our way of world domination are the wolves. Dragomir holds out a hand. All you have to do is join me. I stare at his open palm. I then cast my hair over my shoulder, 
look him in the eye, and say in the most snarky, condescending voice possible, I'm not willing to end up like my mother, thanks. She threw herself to the wolves to get away from you. Looks like I made the same decision. Dragomir's grin falls into a poisonous snarl, and I revel in the fact that I have annoyed him. Very well. You have made your choice. Dragomir spreads his arms wide. I have an offer for all the wolves standing here. Nikolai, if you please. Nikolai comes forward, acting as if Lysar and I aren't even there. His eyes plead desperately with the members of his pack as he speaks. Those who defend the vampire princess and the new alpha will be killed, Nikolai shouts. But there is another way. Dragomir is willing to spare those wolves who join them. For the first time, truly, Nikolai's eyes connect with mine, void of anything but pure and vile hate. But in return, we have to kill the new Alpha and his mate, the Grand Duchess. Chapter 23 Kill the Alpha? Are you insane? A wolf asks, shaking his head. We've never gone against the Alpha! A she-wolf bursts, shaking. The Alpha is lord above all! Yes, but maybe we have to, another adds, to preserve our pack while it still has a chance. The pack members are quarreling amongst themselves. They can't decide whether they should turn against Lysa or fight for him. Dragomir looks pleasurably upon it all. This is what he wants, to instill chaos and division within the pack. I curse Nikolai for helping him do it. You're no longer Alpha, Nikolai, Georgie says bravely. We don't have to listen to you. My chest swells with adoration for Georgie's loyalty. Out of all the wolves, Lysar's counsel seems to be the least willing to turn against us. Even Rosa has parked herself behind us, unwilling to move. This is necessary to do. A wolf is nothing without the pack. The pack is nothing without the wolf, Nikolai rants. United, we sacrifice so we may live. Divided, we wander until we die. Nobody repeats it back. Panting raggedly, Nikolai prowls forward and shouts, Listen to me. He's willing to let most of us live if we do as he says. And you believe him? Lysa bursts. He'll dispose of you the minute Lysandra and I are dead. If we don't kill Lysa, he'll kill us all, Nikolai bellows, ignoring his son. But this way, there's still a chance. He still may execute us, but perhaps he'll let us live. The pack can still survive. You're a fool if you believe Dragomir will spare you. I spit at Nikolai. He only spares those whom he still has a purpose for. After weeks of trying to prove myself to him, I've finally had enough of his nonsense. He never would have accepted me. I see that now. All that's left to do is be what I've been suppressing myself from being all along. A vampire who loves his son. The good of the pack must come before all else. Nikolai says. Lysar and his mate have only caused trouble for us since they came. Their relations are unnatural and wrong. They go against everything we stand for, everything we've fought to protect. It is our obligation to do away with them both. And I consider it my obligation to protect Lysar from you. I plant myself in front of Lysar. I will never, ever let you hurt him again. Do I make myself clear? You're not in a position to make threats, Dragomir says. You had your chance to save your own skin, and you foolishly cast it aside. You must accept the consequences. 
You will not harm my granddaughter. Slowly, Sige gets off the bench and limps before us, dragging his hurt leg. He glances at one of his soldiers, who hands my grandfather his sword. My stomach clenches. He's in no shape to fight, but Sige holds his weapon up valiantly besides. Dragomir laughs. You, old vampire, are you sure you can even walk? I will crawl my way into battle against tyranny if I must, Sige insists. His voice is a growl, and his fangs descend, issuing a warning toward Dragomir. The haunted did quite a number on you. Dragomir is still laughing. Yet you still think you can parade into battle like you did eighty years ago. Lysandra is the future of our race, not you, Sege utters, and Dragomir's eyes flash violently. She will usher in a new age, unlike any we've ever seen, while you will fade into the pages of our past, forgotten. I will die to see it happen. Seeing that he's not getting anywhere with Sige, Dragomir casts his attention on Sige's vampires. And what about the rest of you? Dragomir asks. Are you foolish enough to take up this ridiculous crusade? Or has living amongst wolves convinced you to come back to the winning side? Some of Sige's forces give up and walk over to rejoin Dragomir's side, I'm glad to see that most of them stay behind, flanking their old commander. Good to see not all of you are fools, Dragomir mutters. Enough of this! Who is with me? Nikolai barks. Will you help me kill the Alpha and his vampire bitch? I told you, you aren't going to hurt him, I growl. And who are you? Nikolai turns on me, pulling back his lips to expose his sharp fangs. You're not anything. You're just a vampire who tried to become one of us, but never will be. You will never be a wolf, and you will never be part of this family. Everything I've been fighting against suddenly comes to light. You're right. I am a vampire, I proclaim boldly. I'm a vampire. I'm in love with a wolf, and I don't need your acceptance or my father's acceptance or anyone else's to be with him. Lysa and I don't need anyone's permission to be together and be who we are. She's right, Lysa shouts. Lissy never needed to be anything other than who she was in the first place. She is a part of this family, because family isn't who you're related to, but who you can trust the people who are always there for you and who love you no matter what happens. Lysa shakes his head. I thought you were my family, Nikolai, but you're not. This is my family. Lysa spreads his arm to show Bryn, Tomlin, his council, and all the other wolves scattered behind him. Lissy is my family. He puts his arm around me. She's my family more than you ever were. Nikolai growls lowly. I'm glad I'm not your family, because I would be ashamed to have such a pathetic excuse for a son. Nikolai barrels towards us, paws outstretched, jaws wide. Just as Lysa is about to change and I'm to spring out of the way, a white blur tackles Nikolai to the side. There's a hideous, snarling sound, and the white blur kicks Nikolai off sending him hurtling to the other side of the room. Nikolai slams against a wooden carving, knocking it over. He scrabbles to his feet, eyes wide in shock. Another wolf has planted herself between Lysa and Nikolai, hackles raised, pacing the center of the floor. She is a white guardian, a she-wolf determined to defend her pup, whatever the cost. Sylvia. Chapter 24 Get out of the way, Nikolai growls. The wolf stomps his feet firmly on the floor as a message to Sylvia to move, but she doesn't. 
she simply stands her ground. Have some sense. The decision you're making will cost the pack everything, Nikolai insists, prowling toward her. His shoulders have fallen slightly, muscles less tense. He doesn't want to fight her. My mistakes have already cost the pack everything, Sylvia says. I won't allow them to kill my son. This is the only way. I wish there was another, Nikolai insists. Lysar must be dealt with. His choices have led us here. It won't be your fault when it's all over. You won't harm him, Nikolai. Though Nikolai seems willing to barter, Sylvia is not. Be rational. If you defend him, then you will meet the same fate, Nikolai bellows. Then so be it. Before Nikolai can say another word, Sylvia pounces on him. Nikolai falls backward in surprise before Sylvia bites into his shoulder and survival kicks in. The two mates tumble over each other in a fierce war, blood spilling across the hardwood from vicious claw marks and deadly bites. With Sylvia's attack, the entire mansion springs into chaos. Dragomir gives the order, and his horde of vampires attack, charging toward the wolves. Unsure of what to do, the wolves stop battling the vampires by instinct until they realize that they can't win and start turning on each other. Brother fights brother, sister battles sister, parents tear apart their children as the pack dissolves into a bloody mess. Lysar changes and he leaps into the fight with Bryn behind him. Shioni fires white, magical rays of light at the vampires attacking Lysar's council, and they curl away, holding their faces and howling as bloody blisters form on their pale skin. Sirge lets out a cry as he hurtles himself into battle, dragging his hurt leg behind him as he hacks away at the members of his old guard who betrayed him. Ready, Lysandra, Tomlin calls. He throws me a spare dagger. I take my own out of its sheath, wielding two at once. I join Tomlin. Both of us go for the vampires surrounding Dragomir, Tomlin swinging his sword and I lashing out the daggers. His personal guard is tough, but I'm the daughter of the bastard himself, so I'm tougher. It takes me longer than usual, but I'm able to cut a path to Dragomir. I stab one vampire in the stomach while slitting the throat of another, digging both daggers into the hearts of two more before I face my father. Dragomir's got his own sword out, but it's clean. He hasn't even made a move. He prefers to watch. When he sees me, he smirks and says, Finally, it's about to get interesting. I scream loudly, raising one dagger over my head and slashing the other outward. Dragomir sidesteps it easily, as if he expected me to do this, and sweeps his sword at my spine. I duck and lash out for his legs, but he's not there. He's already changed positions and is swinging his sword downward. I roll out of the way just before it connects and tumble to my knees. Aiming carefully, I throw Tomlin's dagger at Dragomir's head. He swerves to the side, and it embeds itself in the wall instead, nearly up to the hilt. I pick up a sword dropped by a dead soldier, holding it aloft and pointing it at Dragomir as I rise to my feet. Dragomir makes the first move, lunging out his blade. I meet it, and am terrified to find I'm barely able to hold back his blow. We're in a fast duel, where Dragomir's blade moves so quickly I'm working to keep up. He acts like he's fencing, or playing a game. Even with all my training and youth on my side, Dragomir is still more powerful. He faints to the side, which diverts my attention. I go to block him, but he raises a fist and punches me across the cheek, sending me spinning to the floor. Before he can bring his blade down, I scamper away on my hands and knees. 
I'm to the other side of the room before I dare to glance behind. He doesn't even attempt to follow. Unlike when I was on trial at Castel de Singe, he doesn't want to claim my life. Not until my usefulness has run out. And just now, like an idiot, I showed all my weak spots to him. I'm no longer his daughter. Now I'm a prize to win, a weapon to bring under his control. It's all close range, so few are killed by gunfire. It almost makes it worse, because everyone is either being hacked to death by a sword or torn apart by fangs. I stumble to my feet, which don't seem to want to work right, before I realize I'm tripping over dead bodies. It's a slaughterhouse. Sylvia and Nikolai are the only two who don't seem phased by the panic and disarray. They're locked in a vicious fight that neither can escape. When one lands a blow, the other delivers an equally hideous injury. Flesh hangs off the both of them. I doubt the end of the world could tear them away from each other now. Dragomir's soldiers take torches down from the walls and throw them onto the tables and chairs. The mansion erupts into flames. The roar of the battle turns to screams, where vampires and wolves both bolt for the doors and windows. Everything is shattered, broken. The den has been destroyed. I look around for Lazar. He, Bryn, and Tomlin are bunched together with Shioni against one of the large doors, fighting wolves and vampires alike. I can't even tell who is on what side, and I doubt they can either. If it attacks, it dies. There's nothing left to save. We'll be lucky if we escape with our lives. Lysar, we gotta go! I cry, lunging for him. Lysar's eyes look to me before he glances to the other side of the room. His eyes fill with terror, and he changes back into a human his mouth opening wide in an anguished yell of grief. His pain makes me freeze with horror. I turn around to see what he's looking at. A black pit opens up and sucks me downward. It feels like I'm losing my mother all over again as I witness the gruesome scene. Sylvia dangles limply from Nikolai's mouth, bleeding severely her neck broken at a strange angle. Her gaze searches for her children, longing to encase them with her light. She gives a final, irreversible gasp as the gleam of her soul slowly fades from her eyes, the pupils going dark, a complete finality. Nikolai won. Chapter 25 Lysar charges toward his mother, tears streaming down his face. At the sight, Nikolai drops Sylvia's lifeless body from his mouth and takes a wide stance, waiting. Lysar's running right into Nikolai's grasp. Hell no, I growl and I break into a sprint. I'm faster than Lysar, so I reach Nikolai first. I swing my dagger upward and plunge it into his neck. The blade slips so it doesn't penetrate his spine like I was hoping, only leaves a nasty cut. Nikolai gives a vicious growl. Distracted, he turns on me. Lysar picks up Sylvia's body, cradling her against his chest and sobbing into her fur. Lysar's grief causes a fury I didn't know I had to rise within me. Unrestricted, I attack, slashing the blade until it becomes a blur, dealing multiple slashes to Nikolai's pelt. Nikolai is gravely wounded and tired from his fight with Sylvia. He doesn't have the stamina to fight back against me. You caused all of this, Nikolai says spitefully, coiling away against the flames which are licking up the sides of the walls. You made me murder my mate. I didn't make you do anything, I snarl. You made your choice. You betrayed your family. The prophecy was right. 
Our world was cursed the day you were born, Nikolai says. You will be the end of our race, of my son. If you truly love him as you say, you'll let him go. I roar with fury. I raise my weapon, but before I can deliver a final blow, there's a crackling sound from above. I raise my eyes upward. One of the flaming pillars in the hall is falling directly upon us. I let Nikolai go and leap backwards into a roll. The pillar crashes to the ground, flinging ashes and sparks everywhere. Nikolai remains on the other side, breathing heavily. I'm blocked. I can't climb over the pillar without setting myself on fire. Nikolai is still staring at me in fear. I grit my teeth and utter one final threat. One day we will kill you, I hiss. But for now, you'd better run. Nikolai takes my advice and darts for the safety of Dragomir's army, coward that he is. Bryn slides next to Lysar, her paws slipping on the bloody hardwood. She bawls uncontrollably with her brother at the sight of her mother's shell. Tomlin's with her looking torn and broken at Bryn's agony. Tom, we have to get them out of here, I say with a ragged cough. The mansion is going up in flames and the smoke is overwhelming. A few more minutes and we won't be able to breathe. Got it. Tomlin bends down and whispers to Bryn, sorry, but we have to. No. Bryn latches onto Sylvia's body with her claws, digging in. She's not going anywhere willingly. Tomlin has to bend down and pick her up, carrying her away. Bryn screams as he does, begging him to let her go. I grab Lysar's limp hand, which doesn't squeeze back. A thrill of fear rushes through me as the flames grow closer and I start pulling. Lysar, come on! I yank on his arm. It's like dragging a boulder. It's no use. She's gone! I'm not leaving her. Lysar tries to wrench himself away from me, but I hold on tight. He might be the Alpha, but I'm the Alpha Queen, and I'll be damned if I let him sit here to burn. If that's the case, we're going up in flames together. I didn't want to leave my mother either. Now there are tears in my eyes. But you have to. She's not coming back. Come on. Using all my strength, I wrench Lysar away from Sylvia, abandoning her corpse. He finally relents and follows me out, clutching me as we dodge falling banisters and burning embers to escape. The screams are even louder outside than they were inside. They've set fire to the village as well. In the chaos, I spot Sirge, who is being supported by Shioni. He's by Tomlin and Bryn, who is still scrabbling to get away. Grandfather! I shout in relief. I pull Lysar, who has become a zombie, behind me as I greet them. Are you all right? For no. Sige gasps and coughs. Apparently he inhaled more smoke than I did. What happened to Valentina? I ask Shioni. She left with Dragomir when the place went up in flames, she informs me. They're waiting at the den entrance with the rest of the soldiers to catch those who try to escape. There's no way out. We're trapped, I moan. There's a back way in case of emergencies, Bryn showed me. It's only for pack royalty and their councils. Nobody else knows where it is, Tomlin says quickly. Maybe they haven't found it yet. It's our only shot. Lead the way, Tom, and hurry, I tell him. We aren't able to move very fast with Sirge hobbling behind us, but thankfully it's not very far and devoid of Dragomir's men who are waiting for us on the other side of the den. There's a small door set against a cluster of stone behind the burning mansion. Kipcha, Rosa and Georgie are gathered there, panicked and bleeding from various injuries. We were hoping you'd come by, Kipcha says with a worried glance at Lysar. My boyfriend doesn't respond whatsoever. Should we wait for the others? Georgie asks. He's holding up a paw which is gushing blood, even though it's loosely wrapped with a makeshift bandage. We can't wait, I say. 
and Kipcha places his hand on the door. It opens, and we follow him through the tunnel, to the forest on the other side, and into a world devoid of happiness, victory, and hope. A realm of darkness. We keep walking until the sun starts to come up, and we have to stop. We take shelter far within a cave, and Shioni casts a spell to give us warning if Dragomir's men, who are surely looking for us, venture nearby. I survey the cave, hugging myself tightly. All that's left are Bryn, Tomlin, Sige, Shioni, and a few members of Lysar's council. Kipcha, Rosa, Georgie. Everyone else is gone. So what do we do now? Georgie asks. Now that we've been forced to stop, the youngest one asks the question we've all been asking. What is there to do now that we've lost everything? First, we have to get supplies, Kipcha says. Winter's setting in. I know we can all survive dangerously low temperatures, but we're not going to last long if we don't have tents and parkas. I'm thankful for Kipcha's level head. I glance over to a dark corner of the cave where my boyfriend and his sister are huddling. Bryn and Lysar haven't spoken since we escaped. As Lysar has bade her, Kipcha has stepped up to take command when Lysar isn't able to give orders. At the same time, I hope he comes around soon. I was unable to function for months after I lost my mother but we're in a survival situation. If we don't get it together, we're going to be joining Sylvia. At the very least, we need food, Rosa subs in. There will be no time to hunt since we're on the run, and we can't afford to leave tracks as to where we're going. Where are we going? Georgie pucks up his ears. There's nowhere to go. Bryn breaks her silence, viciously tossing a rock across the cave. She's back in her human form, and has refused to let Tomlin touch her. I'm honestly scared she's going to hurt herself, or one of us. She's a bomb ready to go off at any moment. Silence rattles within the cave. Until I get an idea. There is somewhere we can go, I muse slowly. There's a vampire base in Siberia. I have friends there. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll take us in. Siberia. Lysar raises his head. For a moment, a spark of hope lights in his eyes. That's just what we need. More friends of Dragomir, Bryn says hatefully. You don't understand. They're outside Dragomir's dominion. They never liked him. I shake my head. He had a bit of trouble with their coven, executed a large number of their vampires after a mission went wrong. Does it matter that he's czar to them? But it's Siberia. That's a long ways from Romania, Bryn argues. How do you want us to get there? We could steal a plane, land at the closest airport. I hug myself tighter. But there's no way to travel there by car. Maybe snowmobile, but I don't see how we'll have enough gas to get there, because there are no stations that far out. We'll probably have to go by foot. Do we know a pilot? Kipcha asks. I know how to fly, Sige informs them. Of course you do. Bryn rolls her eyes. Do vampires know how to do everything? She's acting how she did when I first met Lysar. I really hope she's not backsliding. I think it's a good idea. Lysar steps forward and the group looks to him. When nobody responds, he asks, What? Anybody got a better one? When nobody responds, Lysar says, Great. Siberia it is. He changes into a wolf, circling the spot he's standing in before lying down, closing his eyes, and placing his tail over his nose. You want us to sleep in here? Without a bed? Georgie gasps. The older wolves roll their eyes. Our ancestors slept in caves. Better get used to it, Lysar responds. He's utterly still as he slips off to sleep. He doesn't snore. The rest of the pack takes his lead, 
changing into wolves and curling up into various positions around their alpha. Georgie climbs a broad Rosa, lying on his back and smushing her into the stone. Rosa growls but doesn't do anything to nudge him off. Tomlin lays down close to Bryn, and though her fur bristles, she doesn't snap. Shioni, her eyes drooping, lies on the other side of Bryn and instantly falls asleep. Even after a full day of hiking, I can't sleep right now. There's too much on my mind. I volunteer to take first watch and plant myself at the entrance of the cave, holding my knees as I watch the sun beam over the wild land, birds chirping their exhilaration at seeing the light rise again. It's a magical land that doesn't know how cruel and terrible the world can be. Lysandra, Sige calls out to me and I look to him. May I speak with you? I nod. With a groan, he sits beside me and says, Fleeing to Siberia won't work. We both know this. There is nowhere on earth you can hide to escape Dragomir. Maybe. There's a little blue bird flitting from one branch to another. It reminds me of when Lysar and I were playing in the brush, hunting birds. Seems so long ago. He will stop at nothing to recapture you, Lysandra. Sege says, hiding will do you no good. Eventually, you will have to take care of the problem. I can't beat him, Grandfather. I already tried. You can. You're not ready yet. You need more training. More training? After what happened in Moscow? I ask. I shake my head. I don't know, Grandfather. You're old enough to make the decisions now. Like I said, I will follow you wherever you may go, whatever you decide. But I would advise you to do what needs to be done and not what's comfortable for you to do. Sergei goes to the other side of the cave to leave me alone, or to sleep, or both. Despite Sergei's belief in me, I don't believe in myself. Not because of a lack of confidence, but because of the presentation of fact. My pitiful attempt to take down the Tsar tonight showed me that I will never be strong enough to beat him. The only way to keep us safe is to run. If I can avoid Dragomir forever, that's what I'm going to do. It's surprising how quickly the day passes when you're sitting there just watching it with nothing left to do but listen to the birds sing and sink deeper into a whirlpool of thoughts. I don't wake any of the others to take my place. Just watch as the sun sinks lower and lower and lower. When twilight comes and I hear footsteps behind me, I know it's Lysar. He's up before everyone else is. He's a man again, and he steps before me, taking my hand. Hey, he says. He plays with my fingers. Do you want to go somewhere? I'd like some privacy. We shouldn't leave the cave, I say, glancing behind me at the others. I told Shioni we're leaving for a bit. We won't go far. He pulls me up. Let's go. I follow him around the corner and down a hill. The stars begin to peek out one by one, and the last bit of the pink and purple rays sink below the horizon. Darkness falls in as he sits down on a falling log next to a trickling stream. I sit beside him and we watch the water trickle by slowly before he speaks. Thank you, Lizzie, he starts, for handling things back there when I couldn't. It means a lot. I'm sorry about your mom, I whisper. I didn't mean to be so harsh. You did what you had to. It's okay. He swallows and looks at me. I think Siberia is a good idea. It's far enough away that we can start over. I nod. We need a new beginning. Lysar runs a hand through his hair. Do you think Nikolai joined up with Dragomir? Or do you think the Tsar killed him too? I don't care, I say immediately. I don't care what they're doing. 
I don't give a damn if they tear down the whole world so long as they don't bother us again. That's, I don't care if it's selfish, I say instantly. Look what they've taken from us. Look what they've done. Continuing to fight them is useless. If we keep involving ourselves with this war, we're going to lose everything, and on my life, Lysa, I'm not going to let that happen. We've already lost both our mothers. We can't afford to lose each other, not now. Lysa nods. You're right, Lissy. All this fighting is getting us nowhere. It never has. The best thing to do is take ourselves out of it. I grip his hand tightly. I meant what I said, Lysa. I have to control myself from shaking in rage. If Nikolai ever shows his face around us again, I'm going to kill him. I don't care. I'll do what it takes to protect you. I'm supposed to be protecting you, not the other way around. We look out for each other. That's how it's always been, I say firmly. I made a promise to myself I'd watch over you, and I'll keep it if it kills me. Nobody messes with my family. Unable to control myself, I lean forward, planting my lips on his. When I kiss him then, something magical happens. The barriers and the hurt and the judgments all fall away, replaced by a strong, unbreakable bond. The permission and acceptance doesn't come from anyone but myself, free and released from a wretched approval I never needed in the first place. Lysar pushes himself against me, running his hands through my hair. I press my body to his own, and a raw, unquenchable need rises up from both of us, electrocuting me and radiating so strong off of him that I can feel it. Clothes are lost, and soon we're tumbling in the leaves and the brush, a heated passion keeping us warm against the brisk cold of the world. I love you, I say breathlessly. What? He pauses for a second and whispers the word, a sacred gift as he thrusts inside me. I love you, I repeat. I do, Lysa. I love you more than words can explain. I guess that's why I never actually said it until now. You never had to say it, he hushes. It was obvious in the things you did for me, in what you've done to stay by my side. It was always in your eyes. Moments later, I lie against Lysar's bare chest, looking up at the stars, accepting myself. Despite the world falling apart, things seem better right now. Perfect like we actually have a chance of starting over. A thought crosses my mind. I sit up, brushing my hair off my face. What did you want to ask me earlier? I say. You made it seem like it was pretty important. Oh, that. Lysar sits up and rummages through his pants pocket. I guess now is as good a time as ever. It's the only thing I still have from the den, as it was already on me. Lysa, I say slowly. Lysa's holding a little black box. He kneels before me and opens it, revealing a garnet stone encased in a gold ring. Lissy, he asks breathlessly, will you marry me? The End Lysa and Lysandra unite the coven and the pack in War of Witches, The Shift of Prophecy, Book 3. This has been Den of Wolves, The Shift of Prophecy, Book 2, written by Megan Lenski, narrated by Candace Joyce. Copyright 2017 by Megan Lenski. Audio copyright 2023 by Megan Lenski.